Uh, good morning. We uh, welcome you all to this joint hearing of the Education and Civil and Human Rights Committees on our topic today, segregation in the New York City school system. Uh, I'm Corey Johnson, Speaker of the City Council, and we are here today because the New York City public school system is one of the most segregated school systems in the country. This is unacceptable, particularly in a city like ours that prides itself on its diversity. I want to thank uh, my colleagues, Chairs Traeger and Eugene, for holding today's hearing on this critically important issue, and I want to thank all of the council members who are here today. I want to thank uh, Chancellor Carranza and his staff for joining us here today, and I want to give a special thanks to all of the parents and advocates, and especially the students uh, who have come out today to share their views and to help us work through the very difficult problem of school segregation, an issue that's very important to me, to the council, and to all New Yorkers. The current focus on segregation was sparked by recent statistics regarding admissions at the city's specialized high schools. But the lack of diversity at specialized high schools is also a symptom of the overall problem of segregation throughout the school system. And that is why I outlined a number of steps in an op-ed last month to address the issue of segregation at both the specialized high schools and the school system as a whole. Addressing segregation system-wide will require a dedicated long-term effort that must include input from a variety of experts and stakeholders, including teachers, principals, parents, and students. And this is why we are proposing legislation to make the School Diversity Advisory Group a permanent body that will continue to make formal policy recommendations to the mayor and chancellor related to increasing school diversity. In addition, the committees will hear legislation that will create a school diversity monitor within the New York City Human Rights Commission to increase oversight of this work and help inform principles of equity. Segregation must also be tackled at the local level, which is why we are proposing legislation to establish district diversity working groups in every community school district that will be charged with creating district-wide diversity plans similar to the work that the DOE undertook in District 15 in Brooklyn. Still, we can't ignore the shameful fact that despite efforts to promote diversity in the latest round of admissions to specialized high schools, only seven out of 895 admissions offers to Stuyvesant High Schools, the city's most selective school, went to African-American students. Just over 10% of admission offers to these high schools went to black and Hispanic students combined in a school system where these two groups together comprise more than two-thirds of the total student enrollment. This is totally unacceptable. While a large share of admissions offers went to Asian students, and I want to be clear, their success, the Asian American community's success, is not the problem here, and their voices must be heard in this process. Many of these students come from immigrant families, and many of these students come from families that live below the poverty line. I want to support Asian families who have sacrificed and studied hard under the current system because they see it as a gateway to the American dream. And I also, at the same time, want to support black and Hispanic families who have sacrificed and studied hard, just like Asian families, but have been excluded under the current system. It's important to note that admissions to these eight schools is based solely on a single three-hour test, the SHSAT. In fact, these eight schools are the only public high schools in the country that base admissions entirely on a single test score. Even colleges and universities don't base admissions on test scores alone, but rather on multiple criteria, and there's a good reason for that. There is broad scientific consensus among testing experts, psychologists, and educators that high-stakes decisions that affect students' educational opportunities should not be made on the basis of test scores alone. That's why I came to the conclusion that the specialized high school admissions process must change. But the truth is that the current single test admissions process was enshrined in state law almost 50 years ago as a direct response to integration efforts to increase the number of black and brown students 
in specialized high schools. And legislation that was based on racism must not stand, and I hope to work with our state colleagues to replace the state law with one that better reflects who we are as a city. To address the issue of specialized high school admissions, I'm proposing a bill along with Chair Traeger, Council Members Cornegie, Borelli, and Powers to create a specialized high school task force. And although specialized high school admissions criteria are subject to state law, that doesn't mean that the City Council can't contribute to the conversation about what it should look like moving forward. By convening a task force comprised of experts and stakeholders and charging them with conducting a process to solicit public input, we hope to see recommendations to ensure a more equitable admissions process, to expand opportunities to more students without seeing a reduction in slots for any single community. The Council will continue to advocate for the creation of additional city-designated elite or advanced high schools in which the DOE could pilot new admissions criteria. We also need to create pathways for students to excel, and one way to do that is to work with the DOE and communities in revamping and restoring full gifted and talented programs in every school district. Currently, not all districts have full GNT programs that start in kindergarten. And to that end, the committee will consider a resolution today to restore full gifted and talented programs in every school district and revamp admissions to ensure equitable access to those GNT programs. Release of the specialized high school admissions data in mid-March has generated a lot of reaction, much of it heated, but precious little dialogue on the underlying issues. Diversifying the test-based specialized high schools will not weaken those schools in any way. In fact, diversity strengthens our schools. Research shows that more racially, culturally, and economically diverse classrooms enhance problem solving and critical thinking skills, increase academic achievement, improve cross-racial understanding, reduce racial prejudice, and better prepare students to work in a global economy. And this is why we need to push for greater diversity in all of our schools. Today's hearing is just a start of what we hope will be a more productive dialogue on the issues of diversity, equity, access, and ongoing efforts to eliminate segregation in the New York City school system. For that to happen, we all have to commit to listening to one another and to working collaboratively together. We'll be doing a great service to our children if we take advantage of this critical opportunity, lead by example, and work together in order to accomplish greater diversity in our public school system. I want to thank you all for being here. I look forward to hearing from the Chancellor and his team. I'm very excited for the students who are going to testify. And with that, I turn it over to our great education chair, Chair Traeger. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker Johnson, uh, for your leadership, uh, more ways than one. I truly, truly appreciate it for, for being here. And good morning to all. I'd like to welcome everyone here at City Hall for this important hearing probably one of the most important and consequential this committee will have. My name is Mark Traeger, and I am chair for the Committee on Education. I'd like to give a very warm welcome, as mentioned, to the Speaker of the Council, Corey Johnson, and thank him for being here today and for standing up and speaking out on the issue of diversity inside our city's classrooms. I'd like to also acknowledge my colleague and chair of the Committee on Civil and Human Rights, Council Member Eugene. I'd like to acknowledge and welcome Richard Carranza, our Chancellor of the Department of Education, and thank him for being here in person for a topic that I know is critically important to him and a challenge he has taken on from day one on the job. I want to acknowledge and welcome here today all the students, families, educators, administrators, community leaders, and other stakeholders. You are all impacted by the issue of segregation in our schools none more directly than our students. The committees look forward to hearing from students here today. Too often we say uh, we put students first, but usually do not. Today we are putting students first, literally. We, we have a panel of four students who will be testifying first. I have met with some of them already. They are passionate, articulate, and have a concrete set of proposals they have developed uh, to address the problems at hand. I am grateful uh, to the Chancellor for coming to hear directly from these students before testifying himself. 
While this conversation was initially driven by the admissions offer results at the city's uh, eight uh, test-based specialized high schools, we are pulling back and taking a look at the larger issues plaguing our schools as we, we begin the long road to tackle inequities within this system, the largest in the nation, serving 1.1 million students. We as a council do not have all the answers here today to solve this problem. We are convened today to hear from those directly affected and from a range of experts on ways that we can address segregation in our schools. The package of bills that the committees will hear today reflect that. The Specialized High School Task Force, sponsored by the speaker, and the codification of the School Diversity Advisory Group, sponsored by the public advocate, are not legislating a fix. They are legislating a process that will allow stakeholders' voices to be heard and for all ideas to be considered in developing recommendations to be made to the state and DOE on how we can move the needle and provide the type of education our 1.1 million students deserve. No one should expect an easy fix. Immediate and effective change will not happen simply overnight. Decades of failed policies cannot be reversed overnight. That is the reason why this council is looking to codify into law the School Diversity Advisory Group. The work ahead of us as a city will be long and hard, but it must be done. There have been countless articles, letters to the editor, op-eds, editorials, and listservs with a diverse range of opinion, some of it well-reasoned, and some of it outright outlandish and uninformed. This is not a zero-sum game. To those who say integration will hurt the quality of schools, I dismiss that argument. That statement is both outrageous and racist. As a former teacher, I ask all of us to listen more. Listen. Listening is sometimes a lost skill these days. We must not allow voices on the extremes to pit different communities against one another. The conversation we begin today and the legislation we will hear is a process that examines the whole system. We cannot lose sight of the bigger issue and focus only on eight schools in a system with more than 1,000 schools. We cannot lose sight of the system as a whole and focus on eight schools educating approximately 15,500 students out of 329,600 high school students. All schools should have the resources, staff, and educational programs to let our students thrive. All parents should be secure in the knowledge that the neighborhood school their child attends will set them up for success. All students should be secure in the knowledge that the school they attend will arm them with the skills and tools necessary to compete in this global economy. Some people argue, just expand gifted and talented programs and we are all set. I certainly agree that G&T programs should be in every single school district, but we must ensure they all begin in kindergarten. I also believe that G&T must be revamped and reimagined. Simply expanding it in its current form will just mirror the problems we see at the specialized high schools. The current admissions process for G&T changed for the worse under the Bloomberg administration. Up until 2008, the 32 community school districts each used uh, various community-driven measures to choose kids for G&T classes. Former Mayor Bloomberg decided to centralize G&T admissions and require a minimum 90th percentile score on national standardized tests. Bloomberg's policy change resulted in the City Department of Education closing down 60 G&T programs, mostly in black and brown communities from 2009 to 2013. So while we must expand G&T or expand some form of enrichment, we must also reform G&T. That is under our control in the city of New York. It is time for this administration to tackle this issue. Let us not have a conversation driven by misinformation. Let us not form opinions based on fear. This hearing is an opportunity for all voices to be heard, to help shape the laws and policies that will transform our city school districts, the third most segregated in the nation, into one of a true integration, where our classrooms are diverse across ethnicities, socioeconomic status, academic ability, and disability status, among others. I hope the conversation our committees start here today will lead to others on housing, 
infrastructure, transportation, and other facets of New York City policy that contribute to and have exacerbated the segregation that we see in our schools. But that shall not stop us from moving forward with respect to our schools. Moreover, I'd like to say that I am proud to sponsor legislation that we will be hearing today that will require DOE to report on the demographic makeup of our staff of over 1,800 schools. Our administrators, teachers, and school staff should reflect who we are as a city. Students should be able to see themselves in those people. I look forward to the reports contributing to the conversation around school uh, integration, not only of our students, but also of our Department of Education. Um, I want to just also just very briefly share with, with, with the public about the high school that I went to. Uh, I went to Murrow High School, a non-specialized high school, and I am so proud to be a Murrow High School graduate, class of 2000. I know I've dated myself. But in Murrow, we were, we were and I, we, we still are, Murrow High School still is an incredibly diverse school. Diverse not just in terms of student body, but also diverse in enrichment opportunities, diverse in terms of curriculum. In Murrow, I was a stronger history student but not always the strongest math student. So in history, I had opportunities for enrichment courses or advanced placement, but in math, I was more in the general class that needed more time and more support. So enrichment was not based on one measure, it was based on students' abilities and strength areas, and I had always opportunities to excel in different subject matters. Murrow also had a very diverse and rich curriculum that taught me that there is a rich, deep culture out there beyond just Western literature. We didn't just read about Macbeth Shakespeare. One of my favorite books that I, that I learned about that impacted my teaching career was the book titled Things Fall Apart, written by a Nigerian author that helped shape my views of the world. I got that from Murrow High School, and Murrow High School was, uh, their, its admissions policy was shaped by something called EDOP, Educational Opportunity, where 50% of the students at Murrow at the, uh, during these times were at grade level, 25% above and 25% under. There was academic integration, which I think also sometimes gets lost in today's conversation as well. So when some folks say that they would like to see all schools like Brooklyn Tech or Stuyvesant, I'll happily say that I like to see more schools like Murrow. I enjoyed Murrow High School. I got a great education from Murrow High School. Uh, so I just wanted, I felt I wanted to share that and to kind of shape and frame this discussion that we have some outstanding schools beyond just the ones that some folks uh, speak about. Uh, I want to just also just thank really the outstanding city council staff that have worked so hard to prepare for today's hearing and other hearings that have been happening. Um, and I want to thank uh, Malcolm Butterhorn, the committee council, Jan Atwell, policy analyst, Kalima Johnson, policy analyst, Caitlin O'Hagan, fiscal analyst, and Chelsea uh, Bedemore, financial analyst. I want to thank my chief of staff, Anna Scaife, and Vanessa Ogle, my policy director. And I will now turn to my colleague, Chair Eugene, for his opening remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Traeger. Good morning. I'm Matthew Eugene, and the chair of the Civil and Human Rights Committee. Today, our committee is joining with uh, the Education Committee to examine the important issue of segregation in New York City school. Before I begin, I'd like to extend my thank to Chair Traeger for initiating this important hearing and to acknowledge the support and the leadership of Speaker Johnson as shown on this issue. As a nation, we have moved on from explicit segregationist policies as Jim Crow. However, the legacy of such policy have lingered, and unfortunately, our city school system remains highly unequal and segregated environment. As one of the most diverse cities in this country, it is vital that all New York, New York City students have fair and equal access to quality education. 
A solid education is a cornerstone for further academic pursuit, and it is essential to providing the fundamental skill for successful life. As you know, education is a passport to the future, and that future should be available to all city students, regardless of their racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic background. Being exposed to different people in educational environment help to instill empathy, compassion, and understanding of difference. And also, for instance, research shows that Hispanic and African-American students receive higher grades on exam in integrated school, while the gap in SAT scores between white and black students is wider in segregated district. Dismantling area of systemic inequality has been a major goal of this city council. Just last year, this committee helped pass legislation to increase the diversity with, within the city public workforce so that it too was more reflective of the city's population. The legislation we are hearing today aims to achieve the same goal in our education system. For the opportunities for growth and personal achievement to be as widely available as possible and for access to quality school to not be hindered by race or class. Why this legislation will not completely remedy the inequalities that exist in the city or fully redress the other important factor that impact school segregation, we believe that this bill make an important, very important first step. Today, we'll be hearing testimony from the administration, expert, teachers and parents, but we will also be hearing directly from students. The committee welcomed the feedback and inside that student, as those directly impacted by education policy, will be able to provide, and we greatly appreciate their participation today. I would like now to acknowledge the members of the committee. We have been joined by Council Member Lender. And uh, lastly, I would like also to thank the wonderful staff who have been working, members who have been working hard to make this uh, uh, hearing possible. Belki Mirang, Senior Counsel to the uh, Senior Counsel to the Committee, Leah Skuchpik, Policy Analyst, as well as my staff, David Swice. Now I wanted to, to, to turn it over back to Chair Schrager. Actually, turn it back to the speaker. Uh, I want to thank the chairs. I believe now we're going to call up the students who are going to testify in the first panel. So I believe the the four students that are here are Sonajara. Uh, I, I apologize for not being able to pronounce your last name. Indige, who is a, a junior, is attending a school in District 36, representing Teens Take Charge. If you're here, please come up. We're, oh, great to have you. And the second student is Julissa Perez, a graduate who attended school in District 22 and is representing Integrate NYC. And the third student is Jace Valentine, a senior attending school in District 20, also representing Integrate NYC. And the fourth student is Bonnie Tang, a graduate who attended school in District 22 representing the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families. So I want to welcome you. You may begin in whatever order uh, you'd like. Maybe we can start with Sonajara. Uh, and just make sure the red light on your mic is on. You push that button. And if you could just ensure, ensure to uh, announce yourself and your name for us. So you may begin. Thank you for being here this morning. Welcome. Hello. 
my name is Jalissa Perez. Um, good morning. My name is Jalissa Perez, and I am the Executive College Director at Integrate NYC. Integrate NYC is a student-led organization that stands for integration and equity in New York City public schools. I got the opportunity to get involved with Integrate NYC during my junior year of high school. I had only gone to predominantly white schools all of my life, so finding a safe place that made me feel comfortable to truly be myself in was not always easy. My Spanish teacher and Latinx club advisor, Ms. Arseniegas, was someone I felt I could confide in and had my best interests in mind. She created a safe place for myself and my other Latinx classmates. It was because of her that I got involved with Hispanos Unidos and she introduced me to Respect for All, a coalition of cultural clubs as well as the LGBTQ plus club. It was through this club that we had a school exchange with students from a school in the Bronx. This, this exchange shifted the way I saw public schools forever. It was with this exchange that I got the chance to see the disparity of resources, lack of relationships across group identities, unfair enrollment processes, lack of representation in school faculty, and lack of restorative practices present in our schools. From then on, I knew I had to advocate for students in all boroughs that face these inequities. Integrate NYC represents one of many youth organizations in the city. Our framework brings together a range of issues around segregation that's based on what students have vocalized from our monthly youth council meetings, which brings over 100 students from every borough. Together, we designed the five R's for real integration. We the students want recent enrollment, equitable enrollment policies, relationships, culturally responsive education to have access to social justice courses, restorative justice to disrupt the school to prison pipeline with restorative practices, resources, all schools to be equitably funded, and representation, a more diverse teaching workforce. We believe students Student voice is essential in the process of creating policy that is affecting them. The students of Integrate NYC urge you to join us to retire segregation because 65 years is enough and it's time for transformative policies to honor the dignity of all of our students. We invite council members to meet with us to further discuss the proposed legislation. Good morning. Joseph, I want to thank you for that amazing uh, opening remark. I really appreciate it. Good morning. My name is Jemiah Jace Valentine, and I am 17 years old. I am the retired segregation campaign leader at Integrate NYC. It's been 65 years since Brown vs. Board of Education. 65 years is enough. It's time to retire segregation. I'm a senior in high school, and being a student of the NYC DOE public schools have been my second home and I want my second home to be equitable. Integrate NYC has a, plan, has a plan of real integration for the 1.1 million students who lack resources, who don't have supportive relationships in their school, whose classrooms do not reflect the true diversity of New York City, for whose teachers do not reflect them, and who are pushed into the school to prison pipeline. Every student should have teachers, not a teacher, teachers they can identify with. For me, I have only had one. He came from Africa, still had his accent, spoke fluent Russian, and was a doctor in math. But the best thing was that he understood me and my religion, and understood my worldview as a black student. Imagine if every student could have that same feeling, not just one in the 11th year in the school system at 16 years old like I did. Our demands for the retired segregation campaign center around the five, the five R's of real integration. Our plan demands the DOE build on in Integrate NYC's algorithmic prototype for high school admissions and release a comprehensive plan that will rad racially, socioeconomically, and academically integrate public school high schools so that they will truly affect, reflect New York City. We need the DOE to commit to create a public equity report as outlined by Integrate NYC and N NYC ASID documenting resources available to students across New York City. We expect, 
We expect the city release money for schools to design curriculum for ethnic studies, elective in, high, in all high schools, and pay teachers to do that work. We ask the city council approve a budget that, in, that invests in restorative justice and counselors by stripping, a, by stripping away po policing and metal detectors. And we call on the DOE to name a group of educators, policy makers, and advo advocates like NYC Men Teach and students to build, to design a blueprint for teaching fellowship and provide scholarships for NYC students to become educators who, des who serve New York City public schools because we are the ones who are affected. May 17th will mark the, 65, the 65th anniversary of Brown versus Board of Ed and we will be hosting a retired segregation party. We, will, we ask each of you to join us there to commit to, our, to our, your part to, rejoin, to retire segregation. It has been 65 years, but not enough has changed, and it's up to you to help us. Thank you. Jace, I wanna thank you for that really wonderful, wonderful opening remarks. I really appreciate it. Thank you for being here. My name is Bonnie and I went to public school here in New York City from pre-K to 12. I'm currently a college student studying at Stony Brook University. When people think of New York City, the idea of diversity, inclusion, and equity comes to mind. However, this isn't the reality we live in right now in our public schools. New York City does have a very segregated public school system and access to different resources aren't at equal reach for everyone. Our schools aren't integrated and our students deserve better. Asian Americans have historically been used as a wedge by society to initiate conflicts within communities of color and to create a distraction from the real issues of equity and inclusion. Asian Americans face systemic injustices just like other communities of color. Stereotypes may say otherwise, but we are not your wedge. We are in the fight for equity and integration in public schools as well. The model minority myth was created with the intention of initiating intergroup fighting within communities of color. This doesn't benefit Asian Americans. In fact, the myth hurts us by telling our Asian youth that we are, if we're unable to attain wealth, then they're not Asian. There have been some conversations on making our curriculums more inclusive and reflective of minorities. We are a minority too, so where is our history that isn't about the Silk Road? Almost all of my peers throughout high school didn't even know that Chinese Americans weren't allowed to become citizens until 1943 and that people from Asia were also restricted from immigrating here to the US for decades. Does this sound like the word of model minority to you? Within our public schools, we have guidance counselors, but how many of them are Asian? Representation is another area where we lack in. If there were greater resources available in regards to mental health in our public schools, then our youth will know more about the model minority ahead of time, so like, no one's perfect and they should know that too. Being put under the mental stress of everyone being perfect isn't healthy for one's upbringing. Asian Americans have the highest poverty rate in New York City, so why don't we talk about that? We're not the model minority, and there's no truth to the myth. Just like other communities of color, we have been oppressed throughout history. Integrating our schools will reduce racial bias and counter stereotypes. If students are racially isolated from one another, then it's easier to develop a perception another group that they have not been in contact with or been in the same classroom with. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me to speak at this hearing and for allowing us students to speak before the DOE. At the last hearing in December of 2017, all of the DOE leaders left before we had the chance to testify. So I'm going to address my remarks directly to them. My name is Sohna Jad and Jai. I am a junior at Brooklyn College Academy and a leader at Teens Take Charge. Right now, I am missing my English class, a class filled exclusively with students of color to come speak about a crime that has gone on for too long. Before I continue, I need you to know that I will not be the only student testifying today, and I'll be very disappointed if anyone from the DOE leaves before we have the chance to speak to you. At a hearing on the same issue in 2017, you said, we do believe that segregation is an issue that needs to be addressed. Needs to be addressed is a passive voice. Addressed by who? Let me put my skills from English class to use. We, the DOE, do believe that segregation in New York City is an urgent issue that we, the DOE, need to address. 
I am in front of you 65 years after the Supreme Court decided segregation had to go, 62 years after New York City approved a comprehensive integration plan that was never implemented, 55 years after 460,000 students boycotted school against segregation, five years after Mayor de Blasio took office, Five years after New York City was called out as having the most segregated school system in America. Five years after the city council demanded that the DOE integrate our school system. Five years after I graduated sixth grade. Five more years I have spent in the segregated school system. You, the DOE, speak a lot about needing to look at more data. But why you continue to look at data? A student is traveling an hour and a half to get to school because the school that is a block away from her house does not have enough resources. One student is playing ultimate frisbee. Bye, One student is playing ultimate frisbee at a school that offers dozens of sports while another student is going home because his school does not offer him enough resources or any sports at all. So what are you going to say to me today? You need more time to study the issue? You want another task force or diversity group. You need some data, more reports. You want community forums. Let us address segregation today. Let us address the fact that after 65 years of Brown versus Board of Education, we are still struggling with the idea of separate but equal. Let us address the fact that we are the most diverse city in the world, and yet we have one of the most segregated school systems in the country. That is shameful. That's a student coming to you talking about that. I should be in class learning about commas. As you know, Teens Take Charge is hosting a meeting here in this building on May 17th, the 65th anniversary of Brown versus Board of Education. We look forward to speaking to you directly and presenting to you our enrollment equity plan that we have proposed to integrate an equitable school system. I'll close with this, because I think I've spoken enough. We don't want you to stop. I've heard a lot of adults say how much they love hearing from student voice, how much they value us. I agree, I agree, student voice is great. But you know what I prefer? Adult action. So until you start backing up your words, I don't wanna hear your compliments. Thank you. Thank you, Sanajara, for being here today and for those very powerful words and remarks, we really appreciate it. I'm sorry you're missing school, but I'm glad that you're here. I hope it's uh, worth it. Thank you. Uh, are there any members of the committee that have uh, questions for uh, any of the amazing uh, young people that are here today? Okay. I want to thank you all, but before you leave, uh, I, would, I know Councilmember Lander wanted to make uh, some very brief remarks. So I've said on a lot of occasions that the uh, students of Integrate NYC and Teen State Charge are the most inspiring thing happening in New York City. Um, and I don't want to blow smoke. I think your point that we haven't taken action that would show that we've been listening is really important. Um, but I think it's important to hear, too. Um, and it's not just that you're demanding that we like end our denial and take action on segregation. It's that you're modeling the city we could have if we took it seriously. Uh, so it's not only tokenizing your voice, it's like genuinely listening to the demands you make, taking them really seriously. And I would urge people both on the five R's of real integration and the high school integration plan that Teens Take Charge has developed had dig down into the details because we're going to hear from the chancellor, we're going to ask a lot of questions, we're going to hear from a lot of people. But both of these groups, you have not just elevated student voice, you've put really specific demands out and the work around like the metrics of the five R's, the work around the high schools, and like we're gonna hear a lot later about eight of the about 400 high schools, but Teens Take Charge and Integrate NYC have put out a plan that will look at integrating the other 392, uh, and I really appreciate it. So I just wanna say thank you guys for coming. You know, we had a first hearing on school segregation about five years ago, as a couple of you referenced, and at that point, 
we were really just in denial, I'll be honest. You know, we did not hear the word segregation or integration from the Department of Education. We did not embark at that time on a serious plan to do something about it. And while we still have a long way to go, we are in a different place today where we have not yet taken serious action at the scale needed, that is for certain. But I think maybe we're past the denial phase. And if we are, it is because young people working with activists and teachers and administrators have made it impossible for us to ignore or deny any further. And I really think it's on both sides of calling out the harm and putting in bright relief what systemic racism and segregation do and also offering us a glimpse of what would be possible if we could have a city led by and educating in a profound and integrated way students like you. So I just want to say thank you, not just for being here today, but for the serious organizing work you're doing and for the fact that I know it's not going to end when you go back to class, that we're counting on you to hold us accountable and keep pushing all of us together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Thank you all for being here. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. So uh, next up, we are going to hear from uh, the uh, Department of Education. We're going to hear from Chancellor Richard Carranza, who's here, uh, Deputy Chancellor Josh Wallach, and Deputy Chancellor LaShawn Robinson. And then after the administration, DOE, we're going to hear from Assemblymember Charles Barron, former Councilmember Charles Barron, who's with us today. He will speak after the administration. Uh, this is the way we set it up. We didn't know you were coming. I'm sorry, Charles. I hope that doesn't need to happen. So we're going to hear from the chancellor. Charles, your, the council member staff just told us it was okay if you spoke after the administration. That's what they just told us. So uh, we have to swear them in if the committee council could swear them in. If you could just raise your right hands, please. Do you swear to or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the council and to answer council member questions honestly? So good morning. Um, I want to start my remarks by saying that as an educator, I could not be more proud of the students that just spoke. Um, and I would disagree that while it may be important to be in class learning about commas, uh, this kind of civic engagement is a whole lesson in and of itself. So bravo to our students. Uh, and if you need a, a pass for school, I'll be happy to write you one. Uh, so I want to say good morning, Speaker Johnson, Chairs Traeger and Eugene, and all of the members of the Education Committee. Uh, and the Committee on Civil Rights that are here today. Uh, I also want to recognize Assemblymember Barron, who is here, uh, and I want to thank him for his uh, unflinching voice in the conversations that we're going to have here today. I know you'll be able to hear from him in a little bit. Uh, I am joined this morning by Deputy Chancellor Josh Wallach, who is Deputy Chancellor for the Division of Student Enrollment and Early Childhood Education, and Deputy Chancellor LaShawn Robinson, Deputy Chancellor for the Division of School Climate and wellness. Thank you for hosting this important hearing, and I would also like to thank Speaker Johnson, Chair Traeger, and Council Members Lander and Torres, and the City Council for your partnership, leadership, and advocacy on behalf of our 1.1 million students. Now I know, just as Mayor de Blasio knows that, and just as everyone else in this chamber knows, that public education is an investment in the future. From my own experience as a student, a teacher, a principal, and now chancellor of the largest school system in the nation, I can tell you that beyond a shadow of a doubt, a public school education can change a life. Unfortunately, school segregation robs many students and those living in poverty of a high quality education they deserve. So, as our students asked, let's have some real talk. This month marks 65 years since the Supreme Court issued the landmark decision in Brown versus Board of Education, 65 years. Of course, in that decision, Chief Justice Earl Warren wrote, I quote, in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place and segregated schools are inherently unequal, unquote. 65 years later, I humbly, with great respect, say to you, 
we have not fulfilled the mandate of the Supreme Court in Brown versus Board of Education. For too long, we've been afraid to confront this reality. We closed our eyes and hoped that the problem would fix itself or simply go away. No more. We can no longer allow such a system to persist just because the problem is hard to fix or people will say unkind things. The bottom line, a public, and I underline the word public, school system should re represent the entire city it serves. Therefore, today it is my honor to share the New York City Department of Education's efforts to end segregation and integrate our public schools. I started by talking about equality, which is very important. But my overarching goal as chancellor is to advance equity as well. More precisely, to advance equity, not maybe sometime in the future, not maybe when we're ready to hear the hard truth, not maybe when everybody acquiesce and say, okay, we love the message, but to advance equity now. Why? Because advancing equity is the only way to disrupt the entrenched systems that throughout our history have kept underserved students from achieving their potential. Consider, please, that 70% of New York City's public school students are black or Latino. 70% of 1.1 million students. Yet, if you are a black or Latino student, you are statistically less likely to be in an accelerated program or are specialized high schools compared to your peers. You have less access to advanced placement courses and a lower likelihood of graduating and of graduating college ready. Only an equity approach can right these wrongs. In New York City, equity means that we have the same high expectations for all of our students, whatever their race, ethnicity, zip code. Equity means that we acknowledge that some students need more support than others, and we give them the resources they need to succeed. Equity means that we accelerate our work to reverse historic injustices, empower communities, and intervene throughout a child's journey through our system. Equity means that all of our students are on a path to high school graduation, to college if that's where they want to go, and meaningful employment. Integration advances equity because it allows our children to learn from one another's diverse perspectives, backgrounds, and experience. Significant research demonstrates that integrated classrooms lead to improved academic test scores, improved critical thinking and problem solving skills, lower dropout rates, re reduction of racial bias, enhanced leadership skills, and better, better preparedness for success in the global economy. Integration doesn't lower academic achievement for any student. It improves it. Yet I can't tell you how many times I hear in this discussion where there's an equation to diversity and a lowering of academic students. I will call that racist every time I hear it and I will say it. So if you don't want me to call you on it, don't say it. We have no illusions. Meaningful integration of a system of 1,800 schools is tough work. And we know it will not happen overnight. What is more, integration means different things to different communities. It is not just about the movement of bodies or giving black and Latino students access to certain schools. It's much more than that. Achieving meaningful integration is far more complicated and far more important. Segregation, on the other hand, does shrink opportunity. So we are confronting this problem head on. With all that said, we have taken real steps to improve integration in schools in some of our most diverse but segregated school districts. After a community-driven process, districts one and three in Manhattan and district 15 in Brooklyn are implementing plans to increase school diversity. These districts have prioritized underrepresented students for admission into schools district-wide. In each of these districts, the majority of schools have met or made progress towards their diversity goals. I would like to thank council members Ayala, Chin, Rosenthal, Lander, and Menchaca for their leadership on this issue in their respective communities. They've taken hits, they've taken body blows, but they've remained true to the goal. I want to take a moment to discuss the work in Brooklyn, Brooklyn's District 15. This is a beautifully diverse district that represents New York City in many, many ways. Unfortunately, due in part to long-standing academic screens for admissions, many District 15 middle schools have long served very low numbers of low-income black and Latino students. Others basically served only low-income black and Latino students. 
The District 15 diversity planning process brought everyone to the table, community members, parents, students, advocates, and school staff across the district, and they had very tough but necessary conversations. Conversations grounded in data and occurring in different languages. The District 15 Working Group looked at a huge amount of data and research, including middle school enrollment demographics, patterns of racial housing segregation, and academic outcomes. They looked at a variety of potential solutions, and then they put forward a comprehensive plan to change the middle school admissions process. Mayor de Blasio and I were proud to approve their plan. Now, the academic screens are gone, replaced by a lottery where students are matched to the schools they want to attend. District 15 middle schools prioritize about half of their seats for students from low-income families, multilingual learners, and students in temporary housing. We released middle school offers earlier this, this month, and I'm proud to say that almost all of the middle schools in District 15 met their diversity targets right out of the gate. This is real action. This isn't just speaking. With real buy-in, with real ownership of this plan and its success, it's not just in District 15. You see, 87 schools across our city now have a diversity in admissions plan in place. That's up from just seven schools when diversity in admissions program started three years ago. Based upon our efforts to integrate District 15, we have launched a $2 million grant program to support school districts to develop locally driven diversity plans in communities across New York City. In fact, yesterday I testified before Congress to advocate for additional funding to expand that even further. We're currently reviewing applications and five recipients will be selected before the end of this school year. Slowly but surely, we are disrupting the status quo and we are advancing equity now. Most of this work has come from the grassroots bottom up, so to speak. These plans are owned by principals and superintendents, by PTAs and parent-led community education councils. They are ready to put in the elbow grease to make them successful. And at the same time, we can't punt integration to individual schools and communities. We must pair grassroots bottom-up approaches with top-down vision, resources, and action. And New York City is supporting school desegregation like never before. In 2017, we established the School Diversity Advisory Group, SDAC, to make formal policy recommendations to ensure that New York City schools become integrated and equitable. The SDAG includes over 40 members, including local and national experts on school diversity, parents, teachers, advocates, students, and other community leaders. We have supported the SDAG in creating multiple large-scale public engagement opportunities where communities in each borough can come together and share their perspectives on school diversity and integration. In fact, I will be speaking at one of these events tonight. The SDAG has released an initial report which Mayor de Blasio and I have been reviewing, and very excitedly, I am anticipating that we will be responding in the weeks ahead. In addition, SDAG will release a second set of recommendations by the end of the summer, which I'm looking forward to reviewing. We are appreciative of SDAG's hard work, and I look forward to meeting with them and Mayor de Blasio later this month. You see, we agree on much of the substance and recommendations, in fact, consistent with SDAG's recommendations. We have recently hired a director of student voice through a hiring process that included youth input. This individual, this colleague, is charged with establishing, sustaining, and centering student voice throughout our agency. We want to reduce the barriers and increase access for students at the decision-making table, not just hear from students, but to know that their voices will be used as part of the policy development process. Additionally, I deeply agree with the importance of investing in culturally relevant education and practices. We are actively considering the best way to implement some of the SDAG's recommendations that are specifically related to this work. We are also taking a hard look at more of our citywide enrollment practices from 3K through 12th grade. In fact, our recently released Birth to Five Early Childhood Care Education RFP aims to make early education classrooms more socioeconomically and racially integrated by bringing together programs that have traditionally served low-income families with our universal 3K and pre-K programs. As you know, we are continuing our efforts to eliminate the specialized high school admissions test. No other city in the country uses a single test for admissions. Let me repeat that. 
No other city or system in the country uses a single test for admissions to their specialized schools. What outcomes has a single test led to in New York City? This year, black and Latino students received only 10% of the admissions offers to our eight specialized schools in a school system that is nearly, as I've mentioned, 70% black or Latino. This is a despite significant expansion in after-school test prep offering the SHSAT during the school day at 50 schools and outreach to increase the number of students taking the SHSAT, a dramatic expansion of these programs that are not changing the status quo and would not be a good use of resources. Simply put, the single admissions test is unfair and the status quo is unacceptable. If we are to advance equity now, we must eliminate the single test for specialized high schools now. I want to turn to a broader discussion of integration, which, as I discussed before, goes beyond admissions and enrollment. Meaningful integration is about giving all students equitable access, opportunity, and the chance to succeed. It's also about priming school communities for this change by creating classroom cultures that respect and celebrate diversity, the beautiful diversity of our city. So let me share another way we are coming at this problem. It involves the 125,000 people who are employed by the Department of Education. Starting this school year, we've made a historic investment in anti-bias training for each of these individuals who work with our children. Now this term may be abstract to some, but let me assure you it's not an abstract term. When we examine our implicit biases, we understand why we may have different expectations for different students. We understand why certain strategies or practices may affect different students in different ways. Implicit bias training is foundational to everything we do. It allows us to raise expectations for all students and build more inclusive school environments. It's central to advancing equity now. <clears throat> we are also expanding culturally responsive education through the teaching materials that are culturally relevant and include a diverse range of communities and topics. This includes the Passport to Social Studies curriculum, which has lesson plans about African, Latino, Asian, Middle Eastern, Native heritage people, as well as about gender, LGBTQ, and religious history. Across our vast system, we are working to show our students through the literature we read, in the language we use, and in the way we invest our resources, that we are deeply connected, a deeply connected society made up of different voices and perspectives. Like anti-bias, this is not an abstract concept. It is central to creating schools that engage and motivate students and advancing equity now. I cannot thank enough this council for its advocacy on culturally responsive education. Gracias. All of our work to increase diversity and dismantle the status quo goes hand in hand with our equity and excellence for all initiatives which are increasing opportunity for every student through historic investments in all of our schools. 3K, Pre-K for All, Universal Literacy, Computer Science for All, and College Access for All are game changers for our students, especially in those districts that have been historically underserved and starved of these types of programs for far too long. The basic premise is this, whether our students attend a school with mostly white peers or mostly black and brown peers, they all deserve excellence. Every student deserves it and we are going to work to ensure it. We must believe that every student can achieve it and we must have the same high expectations for every one of our students. When we invest in our students and tell them they'll achieve greatness, you will see amazing results. And as we talk about equity here today, I urge you all to keep one other question in mind. How do we best reach and serve our communities? We must truly empower parents and students, not just pay lip service to parent and student engagement. For example, do parents know about their child's, what their child should be able to take, uh, do for algebra in the eighth grade or college prep courses in high school? Do students and parents, do parents know what their children should know at the completion of the second grade or the third grade or the fourth grade? You see, knowledge is power and with this in mind, I have established a new division at the Department of Education for Community Empowerment Partnerships and Communication that specifically focuses on how to communicate with our parents and communities. We are creating the infrastructure for our parents to be the empowered and active parents that they are, especially in historically underserved communities. Now, I will turn to the proposed legislation. 
These bills would create a task force to issue recommendations for new admissions criteria for the specialized schools, codify a citywide school diversity advisory group, create district level diversity working groups, expand reporting on demographics and create school diversity monitor within the New York City uh, Human Rights Commission. The goals underlying these bills are consistent with our goals. We are committed to soliciting input from a wide range of stakeholders throughout the city on increasing diversity in our schools. We are excited about the ESDAG's work and our next steps with them. We will continue to support district level groups as they develop locally driven diversity plans that are responsive to the needs in their communities. We believe in transparency and the importance of reviewing data for trends. In fact, my transparency has not rubbed everybody the right way, but that's okay because the data is the data. We are committed to urgent reform on the specialized high school admissions process as our existing proposal demonstrates. We welcome the support of the council in, in, in achieving these goals and look forward to further discussions on these bills. The goal of our diversity agenda is to build a future that is not bound by history, not bound by demography or by income. That is what equity and excellence is all about. We believe we can create a school system that truly reflects the best of our diverse, inspiring, and innovative city. We believe that we can unleash our students' innate brilliance, unlock their creativity, and put them on a path to their dreams. We believe we can disrupt the status quo and achieve meaningful integration. We believe we must advance equity now, and we are grateful for the City Council's continued partnership and support in this necessary hard work. I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for your dedication to this topic. And I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, uh, Chancellor Kronza. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for being here. I'm going to start off with a few questions and then turn it over to the chairs. So you spoke, uh, of course, at length about some of the plans and programs and vision that you have uh, for the DOE and trying to address segregation. But what is the department's overarching plan, overarching plan to ad address segregation in a, mean in a meaningful, systematic, and sustained way? So I've talked a little bit about uh, the role of the School Diversity Advisory Committee. Uh, and I think this is an important committee that we are working with. These are individuals that have given of their time uh, for a number of years to study the problem, to look at the problem, and dive deeply into the problem. As I've also mentioned, we're going to get a second set of recommendations, which I understand will include recommendation on screens. Uh, we don't want to get ahead of that, student, that advisory group uh, out of respect for the hard work they're doing. That being said, it has been my experience that the only way you can tackle issues of segregation and integration and diversity is by looking at the systems and structures that underlie the very systems and structures that give you the kinds of results that you get. And by that, you have to look at the data. And once you look at the data, you have to examine what those policies are. The results are really clear, Mr. Speaker. When you have students that only 10% of students in a specialized school environment are made offers to that specialized school environment, and the very process, the very structure by which students get that opportunity is unlike any process anywhere else in the country, is it any wonder then that you get such a skewed result? So we are looking at systems, we're looking at structures. And from a community-based perspective, our community organizations and our community school districts are taking on this issue through a grassroots organization process as well. District 15, District 1, District 3, as I've mentioned, have all made significant proposals. It's a both grassroots and top-down approach. But let me be very clear, the overall strategy is to continue to lay a vision for integration of our schools, to continue to focus on systems and structures that perpetuate the unacceptable status quo, and to really seed, support, and, and help the local organizing that has happened, including our students, that, whose voices are becoming more and more significant around lifting the issues that keep the current status quo in place. We hope to act upon the, the recommendation of SDAG and our various input uh, groups uh, as we go forward, and that's the immediate plan. So SDAG, the School Diversity Advisory Group, which you mentioned um, in your testimony 
uh, is made up of, I believe, about 40, 40 individuals. Yes. And, and you've mentioned here today, Chancellor, and I think you've shown in your time as Chancellor a real willingness to uh, have a partnership with the City Council. There isn't a single appointee of that group that the Council had any say in, though our bill would say that the City Council does have appointees to the SDA, SDAG. Would you support the Council having some role in deciding who some of the appointees of the advisory group should be? Well, I think the, the group has been working now for quite a while. So it is a working group. It's chaired by two very capable chairs. Um, again, I would like to learn more about what that would look like. I know under the current proposal, it would be uh, another group that would be appointed that would have more direct uh, representation by the city council. Uh, I don't think that we're far apart here. I think that when you look at who is part of that SDAG group, um, the city council would be very impressed with, in fact, would probably name some of the same people uh, on that group. Uh, but again, I'd like to learn more about what that would actually look like in terms of an implementation. So the, the districts that you mentioned, you mentioned District 15 and you mentioned 87 schools across the city that now have diversity admissions plan in place. What about school districts that wouldn't want to participate in looking at how to desegregate? What, what would your uh, vision or approach be in those instances? So I, I'll share some comments, and, and I also wanted to mention for the council that I have two very capable deputy uh, chancellors that may just chime in as well. Uh, so I want to give them free reign to be able to do that. Um, I think it's critically important that as I've spoken from a top-down and a bottom-up approach, this is where the rubber meets the road. You have a coalition of the willing. So you will have um, communities and community districts that are willing to take this on, want to have this uh, organizing uh, initiative, uh, and we're going to support them. Uh, and there will be some ideas that will be generated from the local community. I think that's really, really important. But to your point, there are going to be communities that will say, we don't want, we don't have an interest, we don't see this as a need. That's where it's critically important that from the top-down perspective where we're looking at policies, we're looking at practices, we're looking at uh, regulations, that we are taking a look through an equity lens with the support, obviously, of our elected officials. But we are looking at, are there policies, protocols, regulations that are not equitable and changing them when we need to. Um, and again, part of this very difficult but very important conversation is lifting those tough conversations so that when those policies are identified and there is movement on them, people at least have been heard about what either their support or their opposition to those could be. But, but Chancellor, and before Josh, before you go, you, you highlighted a few school districts which I think we are really proud of and yep. the work that they've done and they deserve tremendous accolades and I think they're a model for other school districts across the city. But that's a very small handful of school districts. That's a handful out of 32 school districts. It's a very small number. So if we're going to make meaningful, systemic change, letting an individual school district opt in and receive a couple of million dollars to work on a plan, that doesn't seem like a way to make rapid systemic change. Yeah, so and what would you say in response to that? Yeah, so Mr. Speaker, that's not the plan. So it's both a bottom up with the coalition of the willing, but it's also a top down where we're pushing um, the engagement process, we're pushing changes in enrollment processes. Uh, again, looking forward to the final recommendations from the School Diversity Advisory Committee, taking those recommendations which are ground, grounded in a process years long uh, and actually implementing some of those things. So it's, it's not just one or the other, and I think it's really important that where there is a conversation and uh, we have some lessons learned, uh, that we take those lessons learned and actually help share with other community education districts. You know, the irony of, of the question, though, is it, it's a good question, but I recently spent countless hours in conversation with folks about the issue of mayoral uh, accountability, mayoral control, if you will. And there was this great pushback about the fact that, well, you don't listen to parents, you don't listen to communities, what about community education districts? Uh, and as I talked to parents and the community education councils and parent leaders, I said to them, we're listening to you. We're not gonna come and shove something down your throat. You're gonna be part of the conversation. 
This is exactly what we're talking about. There has to be that kind of engagement. There has to be this kind of a conversation. But make no mistake, advancing equity now means that there will be some changes and that perhaps not everyone's going to like those changes, but in the spirit of the urgency of what is happening to our children, uh, we want to make sure that people are ha having an opportunity to engage in those things, but we want to do the right thing. I, that's very helpful. That's a very helpful level of context to understand that, that even outside of an individual school district or community education council uh, not wanting to participate in something like uh, District 15 did, there will still be support given to individual schools and support given uh, or, or policies changed that would still help integration efforts in a significant way even outside of a process that a local school district be resistant to is that an accurate way to say it that is very accurate way okay to say, sir. Uh, josh yeah <clears throat> thank you i would just add that i think we've seen a, uh, in, an encouraging way across the city in uh, districts and you know across all five boroughs schools and groups of schools stepping forward to be part of our diverse, diversity and admissions programs um, and just in the next um, month or two, we will be announcing awards from that first tranche of funds for planning um, with five districts stepping forward to um, replicate great. that community planning process with five more behind it um, soon. Great. And then I, on the top down end, I would just say as an example of that, one move that we made over the last year under this mayor and chancellor's leadership is transitioning away from a high school admissions method where you had to know about a tour or open house in order to compete for the seats to one where, um, just as, as Chair Traeger described, the educational option or opportunity model. And 132 programs across the city made the transition just in the last uh, two years to that model, which fosters much more academic diversity. And that just happened from uh, the top-down method, if you will, across the city as a citywide policy. So we are taking both of those approaches as we go forward. Okay. I, I want to get to a few other questions quickly and then turn it over to my colleagues. According to the Center for New York City Affairs at the new school, students are opting out of their zone schools at higher rates now than they did 10 years ago, while Asian and white students are less likely to opt out of their neighborhood zone schools than their black and Hispanic peers are. Research shows that an increasing number of students are opting out. Almost 60% of black students opted out of their neighborhood zone school, up from 38% a decade ago, and in 2016 and 17. 39% of Hispanic students opt out of their zone school. Uh, I want to understand why are so many students opting out of their neighborhood schools, and what is the DOE doing to address this issue? So. Again, we, I'd like to dive in a little deeper into that, and I'm going to ask Deputy Chancellor Wallach to, to opine as well. Um, I think what's important is that when you look at the indicators of schools in New York City, uh, the, the data is pretty clear that schools are getting better. Graduation rates are up, dropout rates are lower, academic achievement is improving. Um, so the schools are getting more robust. But I also think that it's critically important that if parents are going to have a choice, you have to give them a school that's worth choosing. Mm -hmm. And that is the crux of our work, improving schools across the city in every neighborhood. Um, I think it's also important that, and I'm not sure how that data is cut, so how many of those students are choosing to enroll in a charter school? How many students are choosing to go to a private school? Uh, we know that in the last 10 years, the options that students and families have in New York City are much greater and much more robust than they've ever been. So there's more options for students. So that's when I say I want to cut that data a little bit finer. Um, that's part of what I'm talking about. But let's, let's be very, very clear. The equity and excellence agenda is focused on doing just that, creating equitable and excellent options for parents and students in every community of our city. I think part of that is making sure that we know where they are, we know what they are, and that it makes sense from a cohesive perspective in terms of what options parents and students have. I would just add on to that to say that we do have a, 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 we have choices for families as part of our enrollment system for kindergarten. And part of what you're seeing in that data is families exercising that choice. But as this administration and this chancellor's equity and excellence for all agenda kicks in, and we have 
more 3K in our city, more pre-K for more pre-K in our city, um, the integration of early education programs, the successful universal literacy initiative, which is improving early literacy instruction through all our early elementary grades, computer science for all throughout all our elementary schools, and as those um, as the performance and the experience in those schools improves. Um, more and more families are excited about the elementary schools um, and staying in the schools in their neighborhoods um, or finding excellent options um, elsewhere. And, uh, and we're seeing that success, as the chancellor says, uh, year in and year out as we go through our school improvement agenda. So Josh, we've been trying to get data from you all on universal literacy and DOE has not given us that data. Why is that? Um, I, I'm not sure what data you've been asking for, but if, you, if we can talk about it and we can try to get you the data you're looking for. We're, we're proud of that program and happy to share. Okay. Um, so, uh, Chancellor, the School Diversity Advisory Group, as you mentioned earlier this year, released their first set of recommendations with respect to integration efforts in our school system. Does the administration have a plan to adopt, to adopt any of the specific proposed recommendations that were outlined that you could uh, outline today? So I can't outline it today because we want to do. We do want to circle back. I mentioned in my testimony we're going to be meeting with uh, the School Diversity Advisory uh, Council, and we want to share with them. Uh, but we, there are a number of recommendations that we are prepared to adopt, uh, and I want to congratulate them. They did some great work. Have timeframes been established for those recommendations that the department plans to adopt? Again, there is a second tranche of recommendations coming later this summer. It will be shortly after the summer where we'll have a more comprehensive conversation about which ones. Will the DOE publicly release its response to the report? Uh, yeah, all of, all of our responses are public. We absolutely will. And will the DOE simultaneously brief the City Council on what uh, recommendations they plan to adopt? Well, I think just from my perspective, out of respect for the City Council, I think you will get a briefing right before we do a public release, so you know first. Uh, the DOE operates a diversity admissions pilot program, as you talked about, which gives priority in the admissions process to students who qualify for free or reduced price lunch, English language learners, and those in the child welfare system or who are impacted by incarceration. According to DOE's website, uh, currently there are more than 75 schools and programs participating in this pilot, and it just started out at just seven schools in 2015, so that is huge progress. Does the DOE plan an open opening up this program to even more schools above the 75 schools? So the answer is yes, but Josh, you want to add a little color to that? Absolutely. Um, and and we, we welcome innovative proposals um, uh, from all over the city. We're, our goal is to increase that as quickly as we can and include community-based organizations in early education as well, because we have five of them participating for the first time this year. How is DOE tracking and evaluating the success of schools participating in this program? Well, I think you look at the numbers. So are they moving the number in terms of diversity? Uh, we're, we also um, are in deep conversations with the leaders in those schools. And by the way, happy National Principal Appreciation Day to all of our principals. Uh, but principals play a critical role in, in that work. Um, it will not happen if principals don't own it. So we are in regular conversation with principals about what's working well. And then uh, under our the leadership of our Deputy Chancellor Wallach and his team, we are gathering best practices. What, what can we learn that schools are doing, and then how do we share that with other schools that want to engage in a similar process? So I want to go to the charts on the screen as shown on these charts. Black and Hispanic students represent nearly 70% of the New York City student population, but only 4% and 6% respectively of the specialized high school population. DOE operates both the DREAM program, an academic program that prepares students for the SHSAT, and the Discovery program, which offers admissions to students from high-need families who just missed the exam cutoff and who attend a summer program. Additionally, DOE expanded SHSAT School Day, which offers SHSAT during the day at 50 middle schools. And despite these efforts, Specialized high schools still fail to represent DOE's overall student population. Why, why are DOE's current interventions of increasing test preparation and access not working? You just articulated beautifully through data the crux of the issue. And the crux of the issue is despite all of those efforts, you have a flawed 
system where you have a single test that's not aligned to state standards, that is a single determiner of an opportunity for students to attend a specialized school. Now, there is not one university, not one university in the country that uses such a methodology. Mm -hmm. There is not one other specialized school in the country that uses such a methodology. So the, 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 the issue here is very clear, and, and pardon me for my passion on this issue, but either we believe, based on that data, Either we believe that black and Latino students can, are biologically, physiologically, genealogically incapable of being admitted to a specialized school, or it is the method and the methodology that is shutting out a vast majority of our students in New York City. I think it's the methodology. In fact, I know it's the methodology. There's not one psychometrician that has come forward to say that test is the best way to identify specialized schools. Uh, students for a specialized school, not one. There is no evidence that shows that is the best way to do it, yet we talk about this thing as if it was, it was printed on a stone brought down from a mountain. But what if the state doesn't change Hector Calandra? Well, then I think I, in your testimony, Mr. Speaker, and I want to give you tremendous credit, the origin of that law is not based in an enlightened perspective on enrolling students. That's right. It was specifically when Chancellor Schribner and the Board of Education at the time were looking to diversify the three specialized schools. And that law, by the way, with very little to no public input of the communities affected, was put into place to stop integration. And that is the status quo, and yet we have people that are defending that law as if it's a birthright. It's not a birthright. So either we believe that students should have a shot and what do we do to students to get a shot? We tell our middle school students, go to school every day. Do well in your English class, in your math class, in your social studies class, in your science class. Do well. Do your homework. Get good grades. Play a sport. Play an instrument. Get involved in a club. Become part of the debate team. Don't get suspended. Don't get into trouble. Yet none of that matters if they want to go to a specialized school, because all they have to do is take a test that is not aligned to the state standards, which is what they're studying all day long, and they have to get a certain score on that test. Do you think that the plan that the mayor uh, rolled out was rolled out in a way that brought people together? I think process is Looking back important. on it, if you needed yeah. to self-scrutinize and say what could have done, been, done, been done better, We've seen what's happened in the aftermath of that. Would there would have been a way to have less of that if we had engaged um, communities ahead of time? I don't know what the answer is. I want to know what you think. Yeah, we could always do process better. And we should have, we should have, we could have. I mean, we'll spend all day on that. I think it's always better when you have more conversation, where you have more process. I can tell you that the proposal would not have been a different proposal. Uh, and I could tell you that Every conversation that I've ever been involved in in my 30 years as an educator has always started with a proposal. We have a proposal and we have a conversation. What I do appreciate about the council weighing in, and Mr. Speaker, I thank you for your personal involvement in this particular issue, is that the conversation has become corrupted by different kinds of attributions, if you will, of the motive of what this whole proposal is about. That is what this proposal is all about, the unacceptable status quo. And when you have a city as diverse as New York City that is getting those kinds of outcomes in some of its schools, we have to have a public conversation about that. So yes, coulda, woulda, shoulda, always could do better. But I think that the proposal that is here on the table now is what we should be engaging in. And, and what does the data say? What do the experts say? What does the research say? And what do we ultimately want as a city as diverse as New York City to be the protocol and the process for giving opportunities to all students in the system? Should we create additional schools to create more seats and more opportunity? The Bloomberg administration did just that. When Heck Calandra was in effect, there were three specialized schools. They added five, didn't change the methodology, and look what we got. What if we did it outside the specialized schools and called them something else and piloted this admissions criteria that you all announced or other admissions criteria so you could still have additional schools but not with the same admissions criteria? I appreciate 
the sentiment, with all due respect, I'm not interested in making an imperfect system a little less imperfect. The issue is still that the current system that we have in place is not effective. But what if the state legislature does not change? We're going to hear from an assemblyman next. What if it doesn't happen? I would only say this. You know, I was a teacher for over a decade. I taught American government. I'm a big believer in the democratic process. And I know that there are no elected officials that are appointed. They're elected. So I think that it's important that the communities involved in this conversation, because this is, make no mistake, a civil rights issue. Uh, so I think that we should be talking about it in those terms. Now, directly to your question, um, again, I think we need to have, there is, by the way, and I've done my investigation as well, there's no other state in the United States that has a state law that mandates an enrollment process for a local school district. Nowhere else. So I think that's important as well that we should have that conversation. I don't think that we move this conversation. Our students were so beautiful. We've talked about it a lot. We need to stop talking and start acting. And I think we start acting by not skirting the issue of the state law, but taking that on directly and taking on the, the notion of what it is that we want for our kids. And okay, I want to end with this. Um, Chancellor, I, we, we uh, just went through the preliminary budget process. The uh, mayor announced his executive budget uh, last week. We're starting our executive budget hearings next week. The lack of detail that we have received from the Department of Education on the budget is totally unacceptable. I want you to know that from me, it's unacceptable. Cuts, pegs, over $100 million, with no new investment in fair student funding, with no new investment on all of the issues that we know work and that have mattered to this council, is disrespectful from this administration in the budget process. And I am saying that here today because we're about to start the budget process on Monday with OMB. And I want you to know, because you run one of the most important agencies in the entire city of New York, that what we saw in the preliminary budget and what we saw in the executive budget is wholly and totally unacceptable. So if we want to work together on this plan that we're talking about today, if we want to talk about diversity, if we want to talk about what works, if we want to talk about investments, that budget does not reflect what you're saying here today, from my perspective. So, no, 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 please. So, cutting back extended learning time, cutting back breakfast in the classroom, not investing in fair student funding, not investing in all of the things that the city council spent weeks on putting in a document in a thoughtful way and not getting a response from it, I find to be wholly disrespectful and in contradiction to the testimony here today. So I, please, so I want, I want you to know that I look forward, hopefully, you won't be here, but the OMB director will be here on Monday. And I look forward to hopefully DOE working with your counterparts and colleagues at uh, OMB on getting us answers on why certain pegs are being made in the system that affects students on a day-to-day -day basis and why new investments, when the budget has grown by $2 billion in revenue, have not been made for the school children of New York City. I need to know the answer to that. I don't need to know it today, but I, since I have you here today, and since I really appreciate your responses, your thoughtfulness, your testimony, your willingness to work together, I don't know who from DOE came up with the ideas for the budget. I don't know who from OMB worked with DOE on it, but it is in total contradiction to your testimony here today. And our budget, our budget is a document of our priorities and our values. And I do not see it in either the preliminary budget or the executive budget that was released last week. So I look forward to having that conversation with you over the next few weeks. I'll hopefully some of this will be solved and resolved by Monday when the budget hearings start. And I wanted to let you know that personally, out of a sign of respect, I'm not, I don't know who did it from DOE, but I'm, 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 I was really taken aback to see what was proposed by DOE in the budget. So you don't have to respond, you can if you want. And then with that, I wanna turn it back to Chair Traeger.
Yeah. I, I better not get started on the budget right now. Don't get me started on the budget. <laughs> yeah. Um, so thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, again, I thank uh, the Chancellor and everyone here for, uh, for being here. And I just want you to know I, I've done a lot of preparation and reading and a lot of meetings in advance of this hearing, um, including meeting with, uh, I think, one of our nation's top public school champions, Diane Ravitch, who is, I think, an extraordinary resource uh, for educators and for everyone involved in the fight to protect and strengthen our public schools. Um, and I guess, Mr. Chancellor, the, the old teacher in me also uh, had to create a graphic organizer for myself about what is within uh, the state's control versus what is within our control. Um, and so I want to just begin some of my, uh, my questions. Um, I agree wholeheartedly, Mr. Chancellor, and I agree with wholeheartedly with those who say that one single uh, exam or one single measure does not fully capture a student's ability. Uh, as a former teacher, I, I would be contradicting myself and, about what I believe deeply in our kids if I, if I believe that one test can capture a student's full ability. But I also want to say, Mr. Chancellor, I also believe that simply focusing on one exam also diminishes the, severe, the severity of the issues we face in our system. We have issues far deeper than just this one test to eight schools. And, uh, and on the topic of the specialized schools comes, a, a, I think, a deeper conversation about enrichment in our public school system. What does that look like currently? What should it look like? And I agree, Mr. Chancellor, as, as, as we just uh, uh, discussed, that one measure should not determine uh, a student's entryway. Um, but let's look at the admissions process for the current gifted and talented program. Currently, kindergartners, four-year-olds, are tested on only one measure. So when we hear, I hear a lot today about one measure determining your fate. But it is within the city's control right now as we speak to do away with this single measure entrance way, which I think at four years old does not really test ability or intellectual capacity, it just tests privilege. It re or, or it tests whether a four-year-old is having a good or bad day. And so, Mr. Chancellor, that is within your control, within the mayor's control. Do you believe it is developmentally appropriate to be conducting high-stakes testing for four-year-olds? No. <laughs> Great answer. Uh, <laughs> and I've been absolutely clear on that from the minute I stepped foot in the DOE. That. And what are we doing to change that as we speak? Part of what's happening is the Diversity Advisory Committee is going to be making recommendations about gifted and talented programming, so we want to hear their voice. Uh, within our Chief Academic Officers Department, they are also working on an analysis of what are a more enlightened process for gifted and talented education. Um, and quite frankly, we're looking at what are other school systems doing across the country that is much more inclusive in terms of gifted and talented program. But let's be really clear, the research is also very clear that gifted and talented programs tend to segregate students as well. Agreed. So what I am not interested in doing is promulgating further segregation in our schools. Agreed. And I have seen it played out. I've lived and worked now in five states, in five major school systems, Every single one, when you talk about gifted and talented as a panacea, you're talking about further segregating children. I am not interested in doing that. I do think there is a role to play for creating enriched environments for students in every school. Every school. Because every school has students on the spectrum of learning that need more and different. That's the kind of work that I think we should be talking about. So I, I agree with you, and my answer is so brief, no, because I agree with you 100%. But let's start talking about gifted and talented as if it's the solution to everything. It's not. 
And, 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 and the fact that, again, we have enshrined gifted and talented as the solution, just add water. Just add a gifted and talented program. Not you, right. but in the, Bali, in, in the public discourse, uh, is very problematic and is a symptom of not having an informed conversation, which I'm really glad about this hearing so that we can have that kind of an informed conversation. And to add to that, Chair Traeger, I appreciated your framing earlier about your experience at Murrow. Um, a culturally responsive practice is to believe that all children bring gifts and talents to the school community. And how do we celebrate young people for their gifts and talents that they bring and allow them to learn in, in environments that have high expectations and high levels of support. So I appreciated your framing earlier and along with our chief academic officer, those are the models that we're looking at as a system. No, I, I definitely appreciate that. I, I, just, I just note that I think in this conversation about you know, specialized schools, I, I, what, what gets lost, I think, is our current approach to enrichment currently in the school system. Mm -hmm. And it's problematic to me that four-year-olds are tested on sim simply one measure to determine entryway into this gifted and talented. And I actually have a, I have a problem with the name gifted and talented as well. I think we need to look at, I, I mentioned before about Murrow High School, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We have done this before. Uh, Murrow had an approach that was based on subject area. There are students who might be you know, strong in history or the humanities, might need some more support in math, and that's okay. Uh, I, I had e e excellent classes in, in, both, in both subject areas where students who are stronger than, than me in math helped me. Mm -hmm. And so academic integration strengthened outcomes, I think, for all. And it's, it's, it sometimes gets lost, lost in this conversation. Um, in fair student funding formula, uh, DOE uses poverty levels as a proxy for educational achievement for early grades before standardized testing scores are available. Do you believe that gifted and talented tests accurately measures the ability of four-year-olds and other young children, and to what degree are test results correlated with economic status? And, and the context of this question is that the fair student funding formula is again within the city's control. The city adopted this, now granted it was adopted under the Bloomberg administration, which I have a lot of problems with, but this is within our control right now, where test scores are, where poverty levels are, are, are used as a proxy for educational achievement. If you can comment on that, Mr. Chancellor. Yeah, so the answer is no, I don't believe that they, they correlate. Uh, and as I've publicly stated on numerous occasions, everything is on the, on the table. We're looking at all systems and structures. This is also one of them. Right, uh, I, I, I appreciate that. And, and again, I'm just gonna read off some quick things about what else is within the city's control. Um, most recommendations outlined, as we heard by the School Diversity Advisory Group, initiating diversity working group discussions in all school districts to come up with district level integration plans where geographically possible. Uh, another thing that's within the city's control, as we just discussed, revamping and expanding enrichment programs uh, and eliminating the sole measure to testing four-year-olds. We heard before about the specialized high school exam not being aligned with the state curriculum. Uh, I agree the heck law is problematic, but the heck law does not mandate that the city use this test. The city actually pays Pearson to create this test. We can cancel that contract right now and have, have measures that are actually aligned with, with curriculum. We should also, the city also has the power uh, to reimagine the, the, the screen school's admissions process. The city also has the power to use metric goals outlined by student advocate groups for socioeconomic, academic, and racial integration and other factors such as students with IEPs and English language learners. We could also, within our power, make integration count via school and district accountability measures. So for example, when an executive superintendent visits a school district, or one of the questions, what are we doing to integrate our districts? Is that, is that, is that, a, is that a question on their you know, performance checklist. I'm not sure if they still use performance checklists these days, but that's what I know back in my days of teaching. Um, we can adopt, I heard Deputy Chancellor talk about this, adopt the Murrow High School ed op approach to admissions and have carefully thought out comprehensive enrichment opportunities based on student strengths. We can increase fair student funding as the, as the speaker just talked about. Mr. Chancellor, it is outrageous that in this budget that we've just saw, that not one dime, not one dime was added to increase school budgets in New York City. Pathetic. But yet, the mayor and some of his folks 
campaigns are on the theme of schools, not jails. In the budget, there's billions for jails and not one dime to increase our school budgets. That is outrageous. So we, can, we have the power within our city to increase fair student funding uh, to schools in marginalized communities and help fight back the perception of failing schools in those communities with resources and aggressive and effective community outreach. Uh, so these are just a, a number of things that, that we have the power to do, Mr. Chancellor. And I, I also just want to, I, I know that the, the speaker touched upon this, the recommendations of the diversity advisory group. I want to just go through some of them very, uh, very carefully. Mr. Chairman, I don't want to interrupt you, but Please. I, I do want to correct for the record one issue. Heck, Calandria required us to have a single test. Right. But you could change what that test is. Right. To what? Mr. Chancellor. To, to what? And, and I'm, not, I'm not trying to be argumentative right. with you, but it is a false narrative to say, just change the test. Okay, so what? We've talked to many companies that do test prep, and quite frankly, we don't have the staff to develop a test every day. It, this is what happens. The minute you have a test that becomes the high stakes admissions test, there are, uh, true story, there are, um, processes in place where students that have taken the specialized high school admissions test uh, are asked to memorize two or three questions. And post that test, there is a test party. And then students come, lots of students, there's food, it's fun, and everybody writes down the question they were asked to memorize. Guess what now? That becomes now an exact copy, or pretty close to an exact copy, of the test they took this year, and that starts getting used to prep students for the test next year. So when you have a company that does this kind of a test, they have to change the test, change the questions. It's psychometrics. That costs money, and there's not many companies that will do that. So I just want to be clear. I agree with you. It's problematic. Could we change? Sure, we could change. You're still going to get the same outcome because you're still using a test for a single purpose, and people will find a way to game it. They'll find a way to super prep for it. It's the same issue. And I just want to be really clear about this, that we are on the same page, but this, it's, it's a little disingenuous to just say, you can just change the test. No, no, Mr. Chair. I, I appreciate that uh, response. It's just what I'm saying is that absent state action, and the state, of course, should act on a number of fronts, including on CFE, too, quite frankly. Yes. Very disappointing the state of New York did not actually fulfill that obligation. But um, what I'm saying is that when I hear city officials, including folks in the DOE, complain that the test is not, is not aligned to state curriculum, respectfully, the city of New York pays Pearson to create the test. So the city actually is responsible for a test that's not aligned to state curriculum. That could, that could quickly be changed immediately, in, in addition to pursuing state corrective action. But that's within the city's control. What, what, what I'm reading in my research is the city renews Pearson's contracts and keeps paying them millions of dollars to come up with the same test. And the only thing they changed in recent years was removing questions on what's called scrambled paragraphs. That was the big change. No, we can do a lot more in addition to state to state action. It would be wonderful if the state law didn't require us to have a single test. And I, again, what I'm going to say is it's a false, it's a false premise to say that you can just remove the test. There is not a whole industry out there dying to do this test. There isn't. Now, if there are recommendations about a company or a corporation that can do it better, I'm all ears. But until then, we have a flawed system based on a flawed law that require us, requires us to use a test. Right. And we can talk about how we could change that test, and it's under our purview. The problem is the deeper problem. The law is the problem. But, Mr. Chancellor, the recommendations the mayor put forth in absence of the test also relies on tests. Because if you're saying that we have to rely on the 7% top students in middle schools, how do you reach the top percentages? Yes, there are different measures, but mostly on exams. And if you're going to use simply seventh grade math and ELA test scores, Mr. Chancellor, there are significant disparities there. Sure. We have a serious achievement gap in the city of New York. And there's a focus on, and, and quite frankly, integration should not just begin at the ninth grade in eight schools in New York City. Absolutely. And it's not. As we've testified, there's a lot of work that's happening yes. in many areas yes. of the DOE. I agree with you, but at least yeah. that top 7% is studying the state standards in their classrooms every day. 
right. at least. Right. And students and parents aren't told they have to go to a certain middle school because they have a better percentage of students going to specialized schools. This is one topic of a much broader right. agenda, and I agree with you. I'm not right. quibbling with that. Right. But let's be precise in what we're talking about here because right. I think we're on the same page. Right. So I, I want to read off very quickly and then I'll be mindful of my time because uh, other colleagues have questions and, and my co-chair. A couple of the key recommendations that were uh, put for forth by the School Diversity Advisory Group report, I really encourage folks in the public to read this report. I want to credit the stakeholders that worked really, really hard, and some of their recommendations here are really outstanding, I think make dramatic uh, change. But I just, for the sake of being on the record, Mr. Chancellor, I just want to ask you, uh, for example, some of their, uh, their key recommendations. Um, do you commit to uh, one of the short-term goals? Elementary and middle schools should be measured against their district's racial, economic, multilingual learner, and students with disabilities percentages. D do you commit to implementing that goal? I think that's a great idea. As I've testified, we are going to meet with the School Diversity Advisory Committee and let them know exactly which ones we'll implement. But I think it's a good idea. Do you commit to creating a chief integration officer? I am the chief integration officer. And let me give you an example of why that's important. Because in every system that I've worked in, the minute you create the chief academic officer or the chief integration officer or the chief whatever officer, it lets the system off the hook. Because integration is now not my responsibility. It belongs to the chief integration officer. Let them worry about integration. I don't want anybody to be off the hook. Integration is everybody's job. And I, as a chancellor, am responsible I am the chief integration officer. So, Mr. Chancellor, respectfully, and I appreciate that response, but respectfully, yesterday I sat through the DOE, another hearing with the DOE about hearing from your, from your folks that everyone in the DOE should be aware of Title IX, um, or everyone should be, you know, trained and skilled. We had students testify yesterday that not one of them knew that there should be or that there is distributed Title IX brochures or Title IX posters or that there even is a Title IX coordinator in the school system. So when I hear folks say we all should do this, Mr. Chancellor, yes, in an ideal world, yes, but you do need someone who is, uh, who ha who is empowered and c hold folks accountable and with the, with the skills qualification and the time and capacity beyond just overseeing. You have, a, you have an enormous job, Mr. Chancellor. Uh, you know, I was a teacher, but I wasn't a social worker. Does that mean schools don't need social workers? We desperately need more social workers in our school system. I agree. Um, and so I, I'm careful about titles and, and, and capacity. We need folks uh, geared in these roles. Uh, do you commit to adding metrics to school quality report related to diversity and integration? As I've testified, we are going to meet with the School Diversity Advisory Committee and have a conversation with them. I think it's a good idea. Uh, do you require, uh, do you commit to requiring all nine school districts uh, with sufficient demographic diversity of population to develop diversity and integration plans? And, and notably, there are districts 1, 2, 3, 13, 15, 22, 27, 28, 31. As I've testified, we're going to meet with the School Diversity Advisory Committee, and we will have that conversation with them directly, but I think it's a good idea. Do you commit to ensuring that all family welcome center staff should be trained to support students with disabilities and should be prepared to help students consider all school options within their community? Yes. Do you commit to ensuring that school staff should be trained to welcome and accommodate students and family members with disabilities as well as immigrant families who need interpreters at school fairs and tours? Yes. Uh, do you, uh, in terms of resources, uh, in September 2018, DOE announced a $2 million school diversity grant program for district to develop community-driven diversity plans. Uh, do you commit to expanding this funding um, if, it, you know, should you receive additional more applications? And quite frankly, is $2 million enough to have a citywide conversation about how to diversify our school districts? If we get the resources, we will allocate those resources. Well, Mr. Chancellor, we will fight for those resources. Thank you. We just have to make sure that the mayor and OMB works with you and works with us to get those resources into, into DOE budget. Um, another key item for us, do you commit to investing in program offerings to ensure that high poverty schools have the same curricular, extracurricular, and after-school opportunities as schools in more affluent communities? 
We will meet with the School Diversity Advisory Committee and have the specific conversation with them. I think that is a phenomenal idea. Let me just interject here. Uh, Chancellor, I say with respect, uh, I mean, I, I understand you're answering that question in a certain way. The School Diversity Advisory Group is not a separate branch of government with oversight over this administration. The City Council is. So when we ask questions at an oversight hearing, it's not, I will go to a group that was handpicked by the administration and give them answers and give you a briefing just ahead of time. We expect answers. So if you have the answer and you know what the answer is, give the answer and don't say you're gonna wait to inform a group of people who are not democratically elected and each represent 170,000 people and who have a constant, who have a charter mandated responsibility to have oversight over your agency and this administration. Mr. Speaker, thank you. But with all I mean, it's respect disrespectful to keep answering questions like that to the separate branch of government that our job is to hold oversight over I'm you. I'm familiar with the. So please don't answer the questions that way. Well, it's not a way to work together. Mr. Speaker, if I may, it is also disrespectful to that committee that has dedicated two years and put together a list of recommendations, who is going to come back to us in June with the second set of recommendations for me to, in a public meeting without giving them the respect of their time and effort, incredible time and effort, to come out ahead of them without having the courtesy of meeting with them first. So it's a matter of how I have been so transparent today and every time I come to the city, city council because I respect the role of the city council. In fact, some of our greatest advocates for the positions and the initiatives are sitting here in the city council. So I have tremendous respect, but I am not gonna disrespect that hardworking committee and the work that they've done. So we can choose to look at this as being disrespectful, I would respectfully ask that you don't look at it that way. And I am going to say, do I commit? I'm going to give you the exact same answer because I'm going to speak to that committee and then I'm going to let everybody know, including the city council, where it is that we stand. But I'm going to respect their work first. Okay, but I, 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 Chancellor, I understand that, but let's be clear. That committee, of course, deserves a huge amount of praise and kudos and accolades and respect for the work that they did. Yes. They do not supplant the charter mandated responsibility and authority that we have as a municipal legislature. So our spot ranks far above a great group of people who we respect because we are the ones who approve your budget annually. Mm -hmm. We are the ones who have subpoena power over your agency. We are the ones who can pass laws that have to do with data collection at DOE. So I understand what you're saying, but there is not an equation here on we're on the same ground. The city council is the municipal legislature. We hold a different spot than an appointed group of people who have done great work, and it's important for me to establish that as leader of this body. Noted, sir, thank you. And, and just for the record, uh, the diversity advisory group is not a new creation. This was born out in 2017, mm -hmm. and their report came out in February of 2019. Uh, it's now, uh, May. Um, I, we have been reading their recommendations that the DOE asked them to put together. So when hearing that the DOE needs to go back to meet with them again to discuss things that they asked them to recommend in the first place years ago is a circular argument, Mr. Chancellor. I think we, we have the capacity to process their recommendations and begin implementing them right now. And, and that is why I'm asking just for the sake of being on the record about some of their key recommendations, which I think are really outstanding. And I'm just gonna continue because I have a couple more and then I'll turn to, to, to my, to my co-chair. Um, does the DOE commit to investing in, in, in growing and strengthening high-performing schools, again, with the understanding that we revamp enrichment and not use the Bloomberg-style enrichment approach to schools outside of Manhattan? It's a good idea. Uh, do you commit to ensuring that every school have the resources for a high quality student council? I think that's very important for every school. Uh, 
do you commit to a general assembly that should be created with representatives from every high school to develop a citywide student agenda and vote on key issues? Student voice is critically important, um, and I think that's a good path. Do you commit to creating a standing committee of students on high school admissions to advise the chancellor? Another good idea. Do you commit to uh, uh, also make, well actually th this is an issue that I think you and I have discussed quite a bit working together to provide culturally responsive pedagogical practices at all schools and for all students. Uh, this is an issue I think you and I have quite, have seen quite a bit, a bit, a bit of alignment. And one budget, final no note, Mr. Chancellor, in your testimony, you talked about making sure that, uh, that this conversation is deeper than just admissions policy, making sure that our schools respect all, appreciate all. That's why I was also deeply disappointed that the, the exact budget eliminated $1.3 million in restorative justice programs for our schools. That, again, is contradictory to some of the things that we're hearing, hearing today. Um, we need to incorporate the discussions about how we uh, view and uh, what we're seeing in terms of school, school climate practices. We're still waiting respectfully for an MOU that has not been, we've been told for quite some time where the NYPD needs to release their stranglehold over, the over our school system. It's a school system, not a police system. So, so there is quite a bit of things that we're still wa waiting for. Um, and so I would like to uh, now just turn, if you want to respond and turn to my co-chair who's been very patient. Thank you, Chair Traeger. Um, I just want to correct the record. Um, we are actually ramping up restorative practices across school communities. Um, and this year we went from one restorative district to four and we are increasing the impact on restorative practices next year. And I welcome an opportunity to meet with you and council to talk more about that work and how we're leveraging internal resources to do that. Thank you, thank you very much. And I'll now turn to my uh, co-chair, Ch Chair Eugene. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Traeger. Uh, Chancellor, uh, first let me thank you for your dedication and, and all the effort that you and your staff you are doing to address the segregation in our school. And thank you for your testimony. But in your testimony, you mentioned that this month marks 65 years since the Supreme Court issued the landmark decision in Brown versus Board of Education. And you mentioned also we have not fulfilled the mandate of the Supreme Court. And I'm going to continue. You say that school systems should represent the entire city it serves. And uh, as a chancellor, my goal is to advance equity. Those are very important and beautiful statements. But uh, the young, the student uh, who was speaking recently, and it seemed that she was tired of rhetoric, of you know, ideas and data. But I think that if she was here, she would ask Chancellor what you will do differently with your staff, with the Board of the Education, to make sure we really address the segregation in school. What it will take to do that, because we have been trying or waiting for 65 years, what you would do differently? So uh, the student was incredibly poignant with her words and what she said. Um, I think what's different is I, I would ask you just to think about a couple of things. Um, name a chancellor in the last 30 years that has spoken so bluntly about segregation in the schools. Um, I think it's important that this conversation be had in not flowery diplomatic terms, but in the real talk that I hear when I visit schools and I hear from students in the community. I think that's important. I think it's also important, as our Deputy Chancellor has mentioned, that we are investing in building capacity for the adults that work with our children uh, to do that in a much more enlightened way. So the work around implicit bias training that we're doing, the work around creating restorative practices in all of our schools, the work that we're doing to invest in social emotional learning conditions so that the conditions are better. Uh, to Chairman Traeger's point, there is an MOU that is going to look very different in terms of the roles of law enforcement in our schools. 
the work that uh, Deputy Chancellor Wallach has talked about in terms of the organizing and the seating organizing uh, that is happening in local community education uh, councils and districts across the city. All of this points to real work that is happening right now with real investments. Um, but we also have to recognize that the conditions that exist are decades in the making, years and years and years and years. Uh, so it also is important to recognize that this will require the kind of conversation that we're having here today. When we talk about uh, segregation in school, we are talking about the student. And those students, they come from different communities. They come from the community. What are you going to do to engage those communities where they come from, just to ensure that you address properly the issues that they're facing and the issues that are part of the segregation in our school? Thank you so much for your question. And I just wanted to build upon um, what the chancellor previously shared, I think it's important for us to just kind of like take a moment to really think through what has happened over the course of this administration. In a few short years, we released the Equity and Excellence Agenda and citywide implemented two additional grade levels, pre-K for all. That happened nowhere else in this country. So let's think about that for one second, the work that we've done with pre-K. I personally had the honor of leading um, a body of work called Advanced Placement for All, where we implemented advanced placement courses in schools that did not previously have them. And the largest payoff has been for students of color, young girls in STEM, and also for low-income students. That's a huge task. This year we hit and exceeded the first target and ensuring that 75% of our high school students have access to five or more advanced courses. So when we talk about equity and excellence for all, that's the kind of work that we're talking about. And we're not just talking about going to places where those courses were not. We went to schools with robust AP courses where you find that while you may have a diverse school community, when you take a look at advanced classes, those classes are not diverse. The AP for All agenda did not call for us doing that body of work, but we did it anyway, because that was the right work to do. Let's reflect on 65 years ago. Where were you 65 years ago? And let's imagine if you weren't physically here, where would you have been 65 years ago? What were you doing? What would your legacy be? What would you say about this time and this moment? When I think about that work, I'm proud of the gains that we've made so far, and I'm looking to build with council and everyone assembled here today to take the next steps. This is a Department of Education agenda, but it's on all of us, all of us collectively to do the work on behalf of our young people. I can go on and talking about what we've done with universal literacy, college access for all middle school and high school, and other initiatives. I don't want that to be lost in this space. I also want to add, as we talk about integration, the implicit bias work is an important part of that conversation. That's about changing mindsets. That's about self-reflection. That work is about awareness. The men, NYC Men Teach, that's starting the work about ensuring that our school communities are reflective of the young people that we serve. So let's not miss the forest for the trees. Let's take a moment to think about what we've accomplished and then all of the work that's left to do. That's on all of us collectively as a city to realize our vision for the New York City graduate. Uh, you know, I love uh, uh, talking about that and we all know that this is uh, the reality of New York City. New York City is home to so many people coming from so many places probably first, second, third generation. But immigrant people, when they come over here, they contribute to the greatness of New York City. They bring with them the culture, and also they are facing so many challenges. For them or for their students to succeed, even when we will uh, do a better job in uh, addressing segregation in school, they will need also a lot of support to navigate through the system 
and to make sure that their children, you know, uh, uh, get access to the desegregation school that we're going to create. But what do you have in mind? What is your plan to help those people who don't speak English properly? And English is not their first language. Those people who are facing language barrier, cultural barrier, what is in your plan to ensure that their children also, they are part of this the segregated school that we are all working together to create. So again, we, we, we are very committed when we talk about advancing equity now in those particular issues. Um, I will tell you that language access is critically important. When I reconfigured the Department of Education within months of arriving, one of the departments that we created was our Department of Family Empowerment and, and Communications because there was a a real need to make sure that we were as an organization focusing on providing those supports to families. Now, have we gotten where we need to be? Absolutely not, but there is a new focus and orientation around making sure we're serving our immigrant families, our immigrant students, and we're providing the language supports that families need. I would also say that it's important to realize and why this conversation is so important is that schools are microcosms of the greater society. So, uh, you know, it's been mentioned here, when students come to us and those students are in temporary housing, when students come to us and there's issues of intergenerational poverty, issues of intergenerational incarceration, inter food insecurity, schools in and of themselves can't solve those issues. But what we can do is working in unison and synergy with other agencies in the city connect those students and families with the appropriate resources to help them uh, with those challenges as well. And obviously within the Department of Education as well, having an orientation so that we're serving those students and have resources available to serve those students as well. That's what we're doing, sir, and, and, and that's part of the greater plan that our Deputy Chancellor Robinson was just referring to as well. Thank you very much, Chancellor, but there's a very important part that I want to mention also. And I want to ask a question about that. Because you know that some of those children, they came from different countries, they speak several languages. But what, are you, what is the effort that the Board of Education uh, is doing to recruit teachers who speak different languages, who have the culture of those students, in order to facilitate the, the, the transition, to make the bridge because let me tell you, I used to be a teacher too myself in my country. And I used to teach uh, French literature and Latin. I don't know if they're still teaching Latin. But the children, when you create, when you offer them the good environment that address their issues, they, they will succeed. And let me say that also, I had the privilege to study in many countries and several languages also. But it was possible because of the environment of the school. And Rousseau said that, Rousseau, a philosopher, a thinker, a French philosopher said that human being is the product of the environment. So my question to you, what are you doing to recruit teachers who speak the language of those children who come from different ethnicity just to ensure that they can start very good and they can navigate and you know, be integrated in the system and to enjoy the desegregation school that we are trying to create. So again, very insightful question. That is the single greatest challenge of any school system anywhere I've ever worked, is to have a diverse teacher workforce, a diverse administrative workforce. Uh, we are partnering very strongly with uh, uh, CUNY, and the new chancellor and I have already had conversations about how are we recruiting people into the teacher pipeline that are a diverse uh, group of individuals. Uh, we've had some modicum of success in this as we've grown our dual language programs. Obviously, in a dual language program, you have to have a teacher that can speak the targeted language. Uh, this year, uh, this past year, we, we started the nation's first Albanian dual language program. Obviously, we had to have a teacher that could speak the language. So we have some modicum of success, but it's very small in comparison to the big picture, the big overall school system. 
but it is a focus for us, sir, and it's working with not only community organizations, it's working with our institutions of higher learning, it's working with our advocacy com community to identify who are those language uh, people in the community that want to become teachers, and then connecting those candidates with a teacher preparation program. Again, lots of work to do, but it is one of our human capital areas of focus, because we believe as you do, it's important to create those conditions in schools. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chancellor. I know that there are many other colleagues who want to ask questions. I'm going to stop here. But before I stop, I, I want to say that we are talking about segregation school. But as long as we are talking about good school and bad school, it's going to be very, very difficult to eliminate segregation in school. Because it is not acceptable that in New York City, a great city like New York City, we are talking about good school and bad school. And I think as we think as we think about resolving the segregation in school, we should think about doing the effort to make sure that all of school they are good school. And the children, the students, wherever they live, whatever community they come from, they don't have to struggle to try to go to the best school. Because I believe also the parents, they want the best education for the children. And it is our obligation as city, as government, as leaders, to ensure that all the children, all the students, they got the same access to the best education possible. Chancellor, thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. With that, I turn it over to Coach Traeger. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, just before we turn now to our colleagues for questions, just note in the interest of time and also the interest of letting sure that we hear from the public as well, uh, we'll put the clock up uh, at two minutes uh, for, for questions here. Um, and we will begin uh, with Council Member Koo. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Traeger and Eugene Matthew. And thank you, Chancellor, for coming to testify. Uh, Chancellor, with all due respect, I disagree with you with your stance of abol abol abolishing the SHSAT test. I think in this modern world, in, uh, we need to know, we need to identify talents early. So if you abolish the test, how will we uh, identify pe uh, students with talent, especially now? Uh, I think you're not a fan, you're not a quick fan of uh, GNT programs too. So how do we identify students with talents? Because we are all born equal, but we all born with different talents. We and you are short, we don't pay basketball, right? We don't pay MBA. Well, you become chancellor, I become council member. We have different talents. So a lot of students, they have talents in math, in science, in analytic, they, especially the kids, there's a big difference. When you test 100 kids, 10 kids will stand out. Out of the 10 kids, maybe five will stand out more. So we have to have a system to identify kids that are smart, that, that they, can, they can achieve academically. So, uh, so my, my way to diversify high school, uh, high school, special high school is to encourage all the families to uh, send the children to GNT programs in the district. You, know, you have to increase GNT programs in, in Bronx, especially in Bronx, because in, my, in Queens, in my district, we have, uh, uh, I have how many, how many? I have eight GNT programs. No, uh, but in Bronx, the whole Bronx only have eight and team programs. So my question is to you, uh, how do we do this? I mean, you have to have GNT programs, and you have to have uh, uh, the test. Otherwise, there's no benchmark to differentiate what you know, uh, what you don't know. So, so can you answer that first? Yeah. Sure, so I, I will attempt to, uh, Councilman Koo. So um, I think the, the, if you talk to teachers, if we believe that teachers um, have uh, a professional knowledge about student development, which I absolutely agree they do, 
and teachers spend uh, the amount of time they do with their students. As you talk to teachers, teachers will be able to tell you who of their students have certain talents in what areas. Apropos to what uh, Co-Chair Traeger testified earlier in his own personal experience, not all students have uh, academic um, gifts in all areas. Some students are better in certain things and other things. I think what happens with the GNT testing first and foremost is that GNT testing at the early ages, uh, I agree completely with what Chairman Traeger has said. It, it, it's more of a measure of privilege in the home than it is truly uh, the gifted and talentedness of the student. We also know that that's based on a test as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we've read newspaper stories about families paying $600 an hour to tutor their four-year-olds for that test. Uh, that's not a true indication of what gifted uh, skills that that student may have. So I think there are a number of, um, I would say, protocols and processes from across the country that school districts, and we're compiling those, are using to truly rely on what's happening in a classroom along with the information coming from the home to be able to truly identify students that have extraordinary gifts. That being said, at the same time, the, the focus of the conversation, which, which is, I understand why it's being focused that way, but we need to diversify the conversation about creating uplifting and enriching classrooms in every school. Uh, so that the classroom is able to really meet the needs of students with diverse learning needs, including the very gifted students as well. Uh, instead of saying gifted students are going to be in a very specific program for just gifted students, because all students have different kinds of abilities. So it's broadening the conversation, but it's also being very specific about having a teacher voice in identifying which students have um, extraordinary academic skills. Done? Okay. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Raku. Um, and next, Council Member Lander. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for this hearing. Chancellor uh, and team, it's really good to see you here. Five years ago, when we had the first City Council hearing on school integration in decades, the Department of Education staff would not say the word integration or segregation out loud. It was uh, like a profound act of denial, despite the fact that the UCLA report had made clear we had some of the most segregated schools in the country. We as a city and the DOE as, a, as an agency was in a state of denial. And to hear you come today and give this testimony uh, that reflects clarity about the problem and a commitment moving to the solution is a credit to the organizing that's taken place, those students before and the partners that have been organizing, um, and it's a credit to your leadership and your team. Uh, and I also want to shout out uh, Deputy Chancellor Wallace uh, and Robinson and Sadie Campo Amor and Emmy Liss and Andy McClintock and a team of people that have been working to do it um, in partnership with students and activists and organizing. Um, and the D15 process, as you point out, has been really inspiring, not just in its outcome, but in its process. Um, I want to give props to WXY Studio for their role in helping make that happen and the D15 working group that really led the way. And I do want to offer maybe a, a slightly different metaphor than top down and bottom up as we think about where we're going, because it seems to me what we really need is like a North Star. We must desegregate our schools along the, in the ways that you've talked about. And then we need an inclusive process that doesn't compromise on the North Star, but works with people to bring them along through it. Because we can't decide some places and not others. Uh, all of the districts that have sufficient diversity for a middle school integration process need to go through it, whether they applied or didn't apply to the $2 million grant. Um, uh, do you agree with that? Yes, sir. Absolutely. I like that North Star. And, you know, and I think on the specialized high school process, it would have been better to set the North Star, make clear we were going to make change, and have a more inclusive process of conversation that was not going to compromise on the goal, but did involve people in a process to get there. Um, and you did that very well in, district, in the District 15 process. You came to an early meeting of the working group and said, here are some principles I have. As long as you meet those principles, we'll be able to support the outcome. So I think that might be a, a, a good way of navigating this tension between we have to do it together 
and we have to involve and include and have hard conversations along the way. Um, the question I want to ask you is about uh, elementary schools. Um, and I appreciate your point of view that the only thing we've really said so far about elementary schools is this conversation about gifted and talented programs. And the idea of doing more to segregate our four and five year olds by whether they're good on high stakes tests is like just excruciating. Like the idea that that could be anybody's solution to what New York City needs is like, let's segregate more of our four and five year olds off from their peers and put the high stakes test taker four and five year olds over here and all the rest of them over here. We know it would segregate racially and economically, but it is about the most depressing thing I've heard about the idea of what the human spirit is and what we want for our city. So I appreciate your clarity on that and I really hope that is not the direction that we go. But I guess I do want to ask about how you're thinking about the opportunities to start doing more at the elementary school level in thinking about school integration. That is hard because our city is residentially segregated. Now we saw that lots of our students go, don't go to their zone schools, so there's room for creativity and we've done a little of this, but so far it's mostly through the diversity and admissions program and if a school's already non-zoned, they can use some new criteria. We need a lot more creativity, whether that's school pairing, whether that's new ways of thinking about how we plan for new schools that open. Um, there's a lot of examples around the country and some like what happened in District 1. So there wasn't a lot about that in the School Diversity Advisory Group Report 1. Maybe there'll be more in Report 2, but I, I wanna hear a little bit what we can look to see in terms of starting to really push some, uh, some new ideas, some experimentation, some pilots, and some plans in our elementary schools. So thank you for the question, uh, Councilman Lander. I think uh, I, I wanna publicly also thank you because you were out there taking hits uh, during the process and were steadfast about putting out the North Star. So I wanna thank you for, for your commitment to the process. Look, I think these are all interrelated and then I'll try to be as succinct as possible. So there is an ideation that we have baked into the, per, the, the mindset in New York City that says, if you want to go to a specialized school, then you have to go to certain middle schools because they have a preponderance of admissions to the specialized school. They send kids to the specialized schools, if you will. So in parents' minds that may have that ideation, they'll say then, okay, of the 600 middle schools, I only can go to 21 or 22 of them. Those are the only ones I'm gonna look at because that'll get me to a specialized school. And then what we do is we say, if you wanna go to one of those 21 middle schools that have over 50% of the seats they send to the specialized schools, then you only have to look at a certain portfolio of elementary schools because they send kids to these middle schools that are screened. So it becomes this self-fulfilling prophecy that says you have to go to certain elementary schools to go to certain middle schools that will get you to a certain specialized school. Now, we know that there are many more students that go to many more schools other than just specialized schools, but the ideation is in a very real way baked into what people think about in terms of public schools in New York City. And what's important about that is that when you triangu triangulate that ideation over the data, which shows that parents are and students are choosing schools outside of their neighborhoods, then you can understand why I said that if you're going to have choice, you have to give parents and students schools that are worthy of being chosen. And one of the things that I think we don't talk a lot about, but I think is really important, is that there are some schools, because we in the, in the D Department of Education don't control for housing patterns. We don't control for decades of redlining in terms of where parents and students live. And there is this notion that if you have a school that is overwhelmingly African American or overwhelmingly Latino, that there is also this idea when we talk about integration that, well, if you add white students or Asian students, the schools will get better, not in and of themselves. The, the issue of integration is about America. That's who we are. We're an integrated, or let's just put it this way, we are a diverse nation. Integration is good because we learn from each other, we learn about each other, we get to have students learn in an environment that they're gonna live in when they leave school, and they, especially if they live in New York City. But this idea that we have to make good schools and good school choices this good and bad, I wanna say robust school choices in every single neighborhood. What does that look like? 
There are some communities that I have spoken with where parents, and these are black parents, have said, you know what? Stop talking about integration. We want our school to have these kinds of programs and opportunities for our kids. And we know that we're going to, because of all of these other issues, we're going to be a mostly black school. But we're OK with that because we know that the academics, the opportunities, the enrichment is such that our kids are going to get a really good experience. That's OK, too. But it has to do with programming. It has to do with the kinds of resources that you invest to create an equitable opportunity for those students. It, it has to do with how we create the conditions that parents are empowered to advocate for their children. Um, it's all interrelated. Uh, but the goal should be, from my very humble perspective, always, to, your, to use your term, the North Star should be, the better we integrate our schools, the better we reflect New York City, and the better we will prepare our students to be successful in a post 3K12 uh, environment. So my, my time's uh, yes. well passed up, yes, but I just yes. would push a little bit on this, which is to say, and I won't ask another question, sure. we Councilman should not sure. let segregated residential geographic right. history be a dictate to educational destiny, and we don't have to. We assign all the kids to all the schools as a matter of public policy. And if we believe that integrated education is important, surely we would believe it most at the elementary school level. And I'd like to see us, as much as we're already doing and as bold and as you've been, uh, there's work to do in thinking more seriously about what we can do at the elementary school level if that's our North Star. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chair. Th thank you very much. And next, again, members, we, we, we're trying to be respectful of time because we want to hear from the public as well. Uh, next, Council, Council Member Powers. Thank you. Thank you. I have to go back and chair here next door, but thank you for that. And thank you to this chair for having a, what's going to be a very long day ahead of him, but for, for being a, a great chair and sticking through it. I just have two questions, and I'm going to go back. One is, um, I don't know if this has been discussed yet, but can you discuss gender representation in the specialized high schools and where we are in terms of being representative of, of, of gender relative to the general population? Uh, yes, I can, I can talk to that. Um, so uh, if you look at fall 2019 admissions, um, you see that um, although uh, 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 females were 51% of the students who tested, they make up only 46% of the offers, um, whereas male students were 49% of the students who tested, but 54% of the offers. So they tend to do better on the specialized exam uh, than, than, than girls and women do. Okay, thank you for that. Um, is there any, and I actually have two more questions on One is, is there any evidence in, once you get into ninth grade or 10th grade that that, that, that grade performance um, holds to that pattern? No, there's no evidence that that, that that holds through performance in school. Great, thank you. And my last question is, um, just to talk about the scoring a little bit of the exam. Um, I was reading a study from, from MIT um, I'll just use one example, but there's a few in here, so I'll just, I'm just picking one. Um, scoring 90% or 94, I'll just, uh, let's say, scoring in the 90 or 94th percentile in one dimension, one dimension being there's two parts of the test, there's a verbal and a math section, I don't they're properly title that, but there's two, two sections here, 95 questions. Um, you, uh, if you score 90th in the 90th percentile, let's say on verbal, but you, you're only required to get 50 or 60 percent in the other section in order to achieve admissions into, this, in this case, it's Brooklyn Tech. Those numbers shift as you go into different schools. Um, by contrast, a student scoring in the 80th percentile in both would have just missed getting in. Essentially saying if you do, like, if you get like 80 and 80, 85 and 85 on both, you don't get admitted into like a Brooklyn Tech in this example. Uh, if you get 94 and then or, uh, 60 percentile, you do do. It, a, can you confirm that that is the matrix or maybe talk more about the scoring and how that is affecting admissions into the schools? I can talk a little bit about it. I can't confirm those specific numbers. I don't have them in front of me. But I, what I will say, as the chancellor's alluded to, is that this single test is designed to do, the, you know, is designed um, to perform a certain function, and that function is to rank order students for admission into the specialized high school, and to just produce that 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 ranking. Um, but there is no evidence that shows that it's the best way to select students for those schools. In any event, what the test does is by weighting certain questions more than others, 
it produces that rank order that is required by the heck Calandra law. And so I think what you're alluding to are features of the, the, the scoring is set in a way to produce that rank order. Um, but I think as the chancellor and as the mayor has alluded to, you know, we, we believe that there are better and fairer ways of making those choices of which students um, should be in those schools. Okay, thank you to the chair. And I, the reason I ask is there's a resolution here around the scoring and creating clarity on the scoring because of a concern around that it's heavily weighted uh, and then potentially looking at, uh, and also the chair has mentioned, maybe there should be other subjects, science, for instance, that should be included in any evaluation of a student. Um, but, but anyway, to, to give clarity to that, so in, as we have a task force to discuss next steps. Thank you to the chair. Thank you very much, Council Member. Uh, next, we'll hear from Council Member King. Good morning, thank you, Mr. Chancellor, and your great team. Um, uh, I'm going to come from a perspective talking on both sides of the coin here. Um, and understanding the historic pers perspective of the Department of Education, how it was laid out, and understand American society as it is. And I would like to ask you, as you continue to resurrect the system, that having a conversation with everyone who works for the DOE and everybody's advocating that it was a system that's doing what it's designed to do. People say it's flawed. No, it's, it, it was built to be discriminatory towards people in the United States of America. It's, it's, it's a discriminatory system. So it's doing exactly what it, but until we have that real, put it out there like this, it's built to be discriminatory and now I'm gonna change it. It's not gonna be discriminatory anymore for that means to all the educators that are in the room and someone wants to have a conversation about diversity or um, changing it, that they don't get punished. Because I, I hear from educators in the room that when they try to do something differently to be more inclusive into a conversation Conversation of history, they get punished by being able to have that conversation. So I'm asking you on that end to tell your principals, the superintendent, if you have a strong teacher there who's trying to help students be better, it's not for them to shut it down because it doesn't go in line with the new agenda, but it goes in line with the old agenda. And I think if we can get that way, we can start changing the mindsets. And when you talk about implicit bias, those educators that are in the room have to free themselves of some of the old ways that are on the books. Also, I want to add, um, when we start talking about testing, we are a society that's full of tests. Now, I'm not saying that getting rid of the test is the best way to do it. I'm not saying keeping the test is the best way. But we do test everything. And it's a way to assess the minds. You hear Councilman McCool talk about, hey, he can never play basketball. But you know what? I can be an engineer because my brain puts me there. There are some students who are going to be physics. They're going to be a scientist. But their brains at whatever age doesn't lead them on that path. But I do recall the days when I was in school that we used to have these SP classes, and it was a feeder system to the specialized high school. We've, we've, we've shook that up, put everybody in the same pot, so that smart kid kind of gets lost with behavior problems because he's not getting stimulated because his brain is not being fed the way it used to be fed. So I have four quick questions for you. The first one is, how does ending the test fix the problem of early education? Because at 14 years old, you just don't know how to read at 14. So someone failed you when you were in the second grade or third grade. So how does ending the test fix that kind of early system? Secondly, um, where will this will lead? I will see children of color. When you say about inclusion and diversity, how does that help them? Because if the adult system is still discriminatory, how does me being diverse in this early education stage when I can't get into the boys club when I become 35? So how does that do in this system now? How do we change that as well? My last one. Um, and my third question is, you have the professional learning community. You have three phases. The first, the first is when you put together this district representatives. So I want to know who are those district representatives who are going to have these early conversations to be able to qualify for phase two and phase three. So I'm going to stop there because I want to hear your answers because I don't really think the testing is so much of the issue as opposed to teaching our kids greater and better and improving your education system from K all the way up to they graduate from high school, so I thank you. Um, so three quick answers. So yes, so um, ending the test. Uh, there are multiple examples from across the country, not only in the K-12 system, uh, but also in higher education of uh, much better processes for identifying st uh, students for enrollment in educational pr uh, programs. So ending the test would not equate to uh, diluting the academic prowess of the students being admitted. It would not equate to changing the schools in terms of how they're looked at. Uh, you know, I, I had this question at a town hall where our university is gonna look less upon the diploma from one of these specialized schools because you've changed the admit. No, 
the, the academic program remains the academic program. Uh, the second one, or the, yeah, the, the, the children of color, um, and, and again, to the point of testing, I agree. You know, to become a teacher, we had to take a certification test. To become a, a, a chancellor, I had to take a certification test. Uh, to become a lawyer, you have to take a certification test. But to get a high quality education should not require you to have to take a test. It should be the right. Education should be the birthright of every New Yorker in the public education system. Just because they're breathing in and out in New York City, they should have an opportunity to access all of the incredible opportunities in New York City. And if we have a very specialized way or a specialized environment for students, then there should be a process that honors that enriches, that aligns with our ideals about how fair play happens for all of our students. The issue around uh, the question that you asked about the school, divisory, is school diversity advisory group, I'm gonna ask Deputy Chancellor Wallach to answer that. Yeah, sorry, just remind me the specific question about the advisory group. In phase one, it says that there's gonna be district representatives who are gonna to come, to come together ah. to have a conversation. So I yes. wonder, who are district representatives? Yes, so, um, so uh, the, the School Diversity Advisory Group, who's gonna testify later today, so you can uh, um, ask members that, that question as well, they went to each borough and held town halls, so people were welcome to come, and we invited um, members of, of many community groups and the, the CECs. Um, and they're continuing those conversations in town halls around the city. So um, I think they're I know that they're engaging community-based organizations, advocacy organizations, parent groups, student groups, um, and school-based groups to attend those discussions. So if you have particular groups that want to participate in that process, we can help make the connection for you to the School Diversity Advisory Group, but also many members are here today and I'm sure would love to talk to you about it. Okay, and I end with this. The sister who was speaking earlier about the hour and a half travel, um, while we're fighting, you know, that segregation is wrong and integration is better, I would ask us to make sure that all our schools are great. Because I know at times I don't even want to travel an hour, an hour and a half to come to work. What are we going to tell a 14 year old to travel an hour and a half because the school in the neighborhood is not as great as the school down the street? And I, in real talk, how many of us who have not gotten past our own biases will say, I'm going to travel from this neighborhood to go to that neighborhood because the city changed the policy? There's still be some parents who are here going to say, I'm not sending my kid over because I don't want to send them to that neighborhood just because of the white and black experience. So that's a real another conversation we've got to have when we start trying to force people to move to diff shift them all the way around the city because we want to do what are we protecting the system or are we actually helping the student to learn that's the overall goal is help our children be better students and that means every school got to be a grade 8 school thank you we absolutely agree with you and this work is not about moving black bodies into other spaces that's not how we see this work at all. When I posed a question earlier about where were you 65 years ago, it's not because I think you were somewhere 65 years ago, but wherever you can imagine having have been there, where are you now in this moment? How do we elevate the schools and our communities that are doing well? How do we support the schools that need to move to the next level? That's our work. But it's collective work. It takes all of us. Hearing you talk about your school, Murrow, I wonder how many people are listening and how many people will now include that school as part of the high school application process, which is a great school. I elevate my elementary school, PS305, in Bedford Stuyvesant, in Brooklyn, everywhere I go, because I believe in that school and I believe in that community. So how do we engage in this conversation? And how do we take, when I imagine where I would have been, I would have been participating in marches. I would have been in the streets. I would have been pushing my elected officials. I would have been pushing the DOE. That's the fight that we need to take on. If there's anything worth fighting for, it's ensuring that all of our young people have access to a high quality education. In this capacity, I do it as part of the equity and excellence agenda. And I can talk about that and I can talk about real gains for young people and our school system. We should all have a legacy in this space. What will you say you did in this moment? Because there will be 65 years ago, 65 years coming, where someone will look at this moment and say, what we did in this space, what will your legacy be? Thank you for the shout out from Murrow High School again. <laughs> <laughs> and kudos to your elementary school as well, Bed-Stuy. Uh, next, we'll hear from Council Member Cornegie. Good afternoon, Chancellor. Good afternoon. And good afternoon, team. Thank you, uh, Chair. I want to start by, on behalf of all of the PSAL athletes, 
saying that it is not mutually exclusive to play basketball and have some level of intelligence. <laughs> um, I want to focus my attention and an intention on uh, G&T. Um, I never proposed that it be a panacea, uh, like you mentioned. However, there are pipelines and pipeline schools in Brooklyn in particular that are, the predominant, that are sending the predominant numbers of students to uh, specialized high schools. Um, I also want to give a little historical context. In the 80s, uh, I was an SP student, and I went from being an SP to having my father pass away and being in special ed in the same year. And that was primarily because we didn't have guidance counselors and or therapists in the office to identify, in the school, to identify that I was going through a trauma at that particular period. Uh, so there is a need for that, especially in minority schools uh, who are always, uh, their students are facing PTSD, quite frankly. Um, but what I want to talk about is uh, the fact that in the 80s, in Brooklyn Tech, 59% of those students were of color, primarily black. When Bloomberg decided to decentralize uh, or centralize the GNT and took the, the ability to judge those students or have those students give a criteria that met um, the community level uh, criteria, it, it changed dramatically. So now we're down to below 1% of students in three decades, which is, which is phenomenal to me to think about that change. So I know that there are pathways. There are in, in Brooklyn, District 21 has about 10 gifted and talented programs and the predominant seats in Brooklyn Tech come from that district. This is, it's an easy correlation to make. In my district, as of 2014, we were, we were able to reinstitute gifted and talented programs in CEC 16. We have one gifted and talented program in third grade, one in seventh grade. So I'm still losing parents. I'm hemorrhaging parents daily who are choosing to go to other districts because one, there are so many, there's so little seats for gifted and talented in the district, and two, those are very uh, under-resourced. So my question is, prior to 2008, each community school district set their own criteria for gifted and talented classes, and all districts had GNT programs. In 2008, former Mayor Bloomberg decided to centralize GNT admissions and based admissions on national standardized tests and required that students had to score in the 90th national percentile to qualify for any GNT class. That policy change resulted in DOE closing 60 GNT programs, mostly in black and brown communities. Um, I also want to point out that those seven zip codes where those GNT programs were closed are also the seven zip codes that populate the upstate prison system, ironically. Will the DOE consider allowing districts to go back to using uh, local measures for GNT? If not, what steps will DOE take to ensure equitable access to GNT programs in every district? Thank you for the question. So, uh, the, the the use of local measures, and we've been di I've been diving into what exactly was that. I think that collectively is the genesis of what we're actually trying to do. Um, so I want to be really clear about this. Uh, using a single test to identify students for a gifted and talented program yeah, it may be very efficient, but it's not efficacious for students. Uh, but having multiple measures, and we have historically uh, a portfolio of what those multiple measures are, if we could create the protocol that allows us writ large as a system to ensure that there are multiple measures used to identify where students have additional talents, that is a good way to go down this path. And, and that's actually part of the information gathering that's happening with, with uh, the, the chief academic officer's office. The second thing I think is really important is that uh, when you look at who are the students that are identified for gifted and talented, you see a disproportionality there as well. Uh, and that's not by accident either. We know that uh, correlation and causation are not the same thing. However, it's very interesting to see how those numbers correlate, which you've pointed out. Uh, so we're also looking at uh, if we're going to determine and, and establish enriched programs, can you imagine how powerful it would be in every elementary school? It was resourced, it was staffed, 
and it was in place in every elementary school an enriched programming for students that truly needed that enriched programming. Then parents, apropos to the, to the comment that I made about, you know, you, if, you, if you're gonna have parent choice, you have to give schools worthy of being chosen. Parents wouldn't have to choose to travel. They could have that programming right there in their neighborhood. That's what we're talking about. Uh, and what does that model look like? And in an ideal world, we'd be able to come to you and say, this is what that model will look like, this is what it's based on, and for the low, low price of, this is how we're gonna be able to resource that. I think that's the kind of conversation you've been pushing for since we first met, and I really appreciate. But that's really the vision for us, to create that kind of programming, not so that some schools have it and others don't, because we know that's not equitable already, but that every school has that in place. Um, I, I want to thank you, and I just want to say that um, waiting this long to ask a question makes you ask it pretty curtly. That's not generally my personality, so I don't want to come off as somebody like that, but when you wait this long to be able to ask your question, you want to be concise, and sometimes that sounds a little curt, so excuse me. No, no, I, I appreciate it, sir. You are a gentleman and a scholar, and I appreciate it, and I just want for the record to note that I might not be tall, but I can shoot the ball. So uh, um, that sounds like a challenge between <laughs> DOE and city council. Uh, we'll talk about that offline. Uh, I, I, I appreciate that, that exchange. Uh, I, it's also just evident uh, when I went to Morrow High School, we didn't really have sports teams. Uh, that's, yeah. I was not really gifted in that area, Mr. Chancellor, but, but that's, <laughs> I was on the debate team and all that. But, um, <laughs> I uh, just want to note also, we hear about choice. Uh, there was a very powerful article recently, I, I believe it was uh, in the Times that talked about San Francisco just solely relying on choice. If you don't provide a framework for equity and integration, uh, without, without that, you, you will still see that types of, of segregation that gets exacerbated, and if we s solely focus on s the expansion of the current GNT model, that will also exacerbate uh, problems. So we, we need to really revamp, reimagine th this whole approach systemically. I want to turn next uh, to Councilmember Levine. Not paying attention in class. Sorry. Um, hello, Mr. Chancellor, always great to see you. I have the pleasure of representing part of uh, Community School District 3, which together with um, 15 has done some really innovative and important work to diversify middle schools, to integrate middle schools, a plan that they also took a lot of hits for. It's a little different, as you know, from the plan in 15, but uh, it's not too soon to say it's already succeeding. Based on offers, um, we see that schools where challenging uh, students who have struggled have been underrepresented now have seen that population grow and schools where uh, students were struggling had been overly concentrated uh, now appear to have a more even distribution and some of the dire predictions that were made about chaos in the in the application process or parents leaving uh, through a mass exodus haven't happened and so real uh, I really want to congratulate the parent leadership there for moving forward on this um, I think one thing that we've heard a lot today, we all agree on, is we can't forget the 95% of high school students who are not in the specialized schools. And the truth is that um, if you look at the, the, um, the key STEM AP courses, they are in uh, biochemistry, physics, and then there's two levels of calculus. Um, there are on, only 5% of the high schools offer at least four of those um, STEM AP level offerings. And that, that is putting students in the remaining schools at a disadvantage um, in, in preparing to apply to college and to move ahead in STEM careers. So um, why have we not given every student the opportunity for that kind of uh, intense level STEM coursework? So again, thank you for, for broadening the conversation. 
Um, so actually, yeah, that's an area that we are very concerned about as well. Our AP for All initiative really aims to do that, to bring AP level coursework to all of the schools. I looked at the data when we started AP for All um, a few years ago, the, the absolute disparate numbers of classes. There were some school, high schools in New York City that didn't even offer AP coursework. Um, so again, our goal is to make sure that, that all schools have AP coursework. That being said, um, we are also doing some innovative things in partnership with the UFT. So as part of our contract, we agreed to do a remote uh, teaching initiative so that we're not waiting to develop. You know, one of the biggest things, and, and Chairman Traeger will know this, uh, one of the biggest components of having an AP course uh, established is having a trained AP teacher in that course. So in schools to really jumpstart this, we all know that there are some AP teachers that are absolute superstars. So part of this pilot is being able to remotely have that superstar AP teacher teach AP classes in four or five different high schools uh, using technology so students are getting the benefit of that instruction. But, but, so does the goal of AP for All, which I strongly support, Yep. Uh, has it given you an explicit target of disseminating the STEM AP classes? It, it or is does. it more vague than that? No, it, it does give us a specific goal, and we, I'd be happy to come back with specifics on where we are with those goals, but your question is right on point and, and is in line with what uh, the AP for All initiative is all about. Okay, and, and very quickly, I really want to applaud uh, Chairman Traeger for his bill that would require publication of demographic data on the teaching force. Um, we need to hear student leaders, some of whom spoke this morning, who have told us repeatedly that um, diversifying the teacher force so that it reflects the diversity of the student body is a top priority in every school in the city. Um, I can't believe that uh, given the articulated priority that the administration has repeatedly spoken about publicly of, of this goal of expanding the number of teachers of color uh, and, and men of color and the teaching force that you're not already collecting and tabulating data on on this and I wonder why it would require legislation uh, if, it's, if it's a goal that you have uh, already laid out for your department. So w we can get back to you with, with uh, more specifics. My understanding is we're, we're, we're gathering this data uh, because we do have goals that we're working towards. So, so what, what is the progress then over the last five years? Uh, I'll get back to you with specifics on the data, but this is a goal that from day one that I've been here has been very clearly articulated. Okay, two, two very quick points uh, and then I'll pass it back to the chair. Um, we also heard from students about, uh, and we've heard it repeatedly from student leaders, about uh, their desire for more resources in their classrooms and in their school buildings. So when, when Speaker Johnson spoke about our frustrations in the budget, that was not superfluous to the debate around uh, racial justice in our school system because resource questions are at the heart of that. We don't have enough guidance counselors or art teachers or librarians. Uh, we, we need more resources to reduce class size. And, and so budget questions are at the heart of the agenda that, that students and also uh, uh, your own advisor group on diversity have laid out. Um, and lastly, I just want to make a point that you might not be surprised to hear me raise because we've, we've spoken about it before, about uh, of an incredibly successful integration strategy which is sitting right under our noses, uh, which is not getting the attention that it deserves, in my opinion, which is dual language programs, which as you know, are uh, dual language programs are a, an immersion model where students spend half the day in English and half the day in another language, but they happen to naturally bring together phenomenally diverse student body. Uh, and this is happening um, organically throughout the system now in hundreds of schools. Um, my sense is that, that, that DOE sees these primarily as a tool for English language learners, which they are, but that, that you haven't seen them as part of, um, well, first and foremost, a strategy to disseminate multilingualism, but but relevant to today's discussion as a strategy to bring together diverse classrooms. And uh, I, generally these are expanding when parents take the initiative. And um, something I've heard you articulate today is you don't want to leave integration such an important priority 
uh, to the initiative of parents, as important as that is. You want to drive this centrally. So why aren't we doing that for dual language programs as well? I would just add quickly that um, uh, we, we do um, prioritize those and see them as an uh, integral part of the equity and excellence for all agenda and this uh, school integration agenda. And that's why I think in the 2018-19 school year, we added 32 dual language programs. And so now we're up to 270 across the city. We are pushing to expand those. And if you do have um, ideas about where we, there would be good opportunity to expand, we're wide open. And our chief academic officer, Linda Chen, works hard at that. And we're, we're going really fast. That, that, that's great. And I'm over time. I think that those programs collectively, as wonderful as they are, reach maybe 3%, 4% of students. Uh, and that they were largely initiated by parents who came to DOE. Uh, I don't believe that was the result of central planning. I could be wrong about that, but every program that I know emerged out of activist parents who found great partners among the principals, and that's resulted in an uneven distribution of where these programs were located in. That, that, that's actually part of the protocol for interest in a dual language program. Uh, to have a dual language program, as you know, you have to have a teacher that can teach, but you also have to have a pipeline, a, a level of interest, if you will, so that you can populate the program uh, and that it will succeed more than just a year or two years. So there's actually a protocol much of which is based on is there interest in the community, is there interest uh, with uh, the school community, including the principal and the leadership. We're happy to get you the details of that, um, but you and I have talked about this, and I appreciate you mentioning it again, Councilman. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you, Council Member. Next, we'll hear from Council Member Barron. Uh, oh, boy. Thank you to the chairs. Thank you to the panel for coming. And for full disclosure, uh, LaShawn Robinson is my cousin, of whom I'm very proud, so just so that everybody knows. Uh, the February 19th uh, the, uh, ed edition of the Chronicle said, perhaps the greatest charge levied against standardized testing is that it routinely disqualifies otherwise capable disadvantaged students from the admission process. So I'm here certainly in favor of Resolution 196, which I have introduced, which talks about eliminating the test, not tomorrow, not next week, but over a period of three years, eliminating that test and using the student population of all of our middle schools to talk about offering slots to the specialized high schools. The American Psychological Association, the American Education Research Association, and the National Council of Measurement in Education have concluded that, quote, a high stakes decision with a major impact on a student's educational opportunities, such as admissions to a specialized or gifted and talented program, should not turn on the results of a single test. And let us be very mindful that historically, tests have been found to be racially biased. And this is a test which has not been aligned with any of the standards or the curriculum, but it's a test which, when students have been prepped for, has given them an advantage for admission to the specialized high schools. Uh, Mr. Chancellor, I know that you support that. And I know that you, I think, agree with the fact that as an educator, we know that it is the mission of public education to be able to provide formats where all of our students will have an opportunity to display their talents. But my question to you is, how, what is the ethnicity of the staff at these specialized high schools, particularly the top three so-called elite? What's the ethnicity of the teachers? Councilmember Barron, that's a great question. I don't have that at my fingertips where I can get that to you. Um, I can just tell you based on my school visits, um, I wouldn't consider uh, the ethnicities of the staff that I've observed to reflect the ethnicity of the students in the system. But I, we will get you specific numbers. Okay, and that I'm sure is also a reflection of the fact that there's been a steady decline in the number of black and Latino uh, staff, teachers that have been hired over the years, but we certainly want to make sure that 
as students are in these elite environments and specialized environments, that they have an opportunity to benefit from the talent and the intellect of black and Latino faculty, and that they have an opportunity to see themselves in the future as reflected in the staff that's there uh, teaching them. And finally, I just wanted to say that um, the other measures that we're talking about are grade point average, yes, t test scores, but tests that have been given by teachers during the curriculum year, during the course of the year. And we tell our students, go to school, do your homework, get good grades, but then at the end, when they want to get into a specialized high school, it all turns on one test, and that's really not fair. Um, I want to thank you for that. And I also want to say, as you spoke about parents in predominantly black schools saying they're not so much concerned about uh, changing the composition of the students, but that they are concerned about equity. I think that that's an important piece to, to consider, and we make sure that we get the resources to those who are not in those other kinds of environments with different kinds of proportions of ethnicities where students can see themselves getting access to the same equipment, resources, and opportunities that exist in other counterparts across the city. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Barron. And just to note, I, I have one of the bills we're hearing today is my bill that would uh, require DOE to report on staff demographics in all of our schools. And so we look forward to getting the DOE support on that. Thank you, Councilman Barron, again. Uh, next, we'll hear from Councilmember Rivera. Thank you so much. Um, I'll try to speak quickly. So I know you mentioned in your testimony that things are getting better. Um, I, I do well, you know, have to note that recent outcomes that we've all seen in the press and even just our own anecdotal data as council members and the conversations that we have with parents and, and, and families, it, it proves differently. And not a, every person sees education through that same kind of social justice intersectional lens that I think is exhibited in some of your comments. And, you know, in my district, I had a conversation with a parent who told me, I can't have my child go to this one school. I want her to be an engineer. And I was appalled, first and foremost, and I was completely heartbroken because she wanted her child to instead go to a school one block away. So just in my district alone, it is so segregated, it is so problematic in terms of how people see the wealth of resources, how they're shared, that I have to give a lot of credit to my community education councils who have been doing tremendous work around this issue of diversity and admissions and doing it with little to no resources and as volunteers, people like Lisa Donlin and Naomi Pena and Shino Tanakawa, who have been giving hours and hours and years of their life to this. And so when you say recommendations by an advisory group are important, I totally agree with you. And, and my bill is trying to build on some of the outstanding work that has been done by my local C CECs, but also to include every level of educator, elementary and middle school, principals, students of which you said how students' voices are so critically important. And so, this would be, I think, a working group that is very diverse and would hopefully build again on all of the achievements. So while I'm not expecting you to endorse my bill over any of the incredibly um, important bills that are in this package, I do want to ask what have you learned from the work that has already been done in school districts 1 and 2 and 3 and 15, and how are you hoping to, to really build on that? So, so thank you, uh, Councilman Rivera. I just want to say that your story about that parent breaks my heart, too. And that's what keeps me up at night, um, that any parent would not feel they can send their child to the school right around the corner. That's the crux of the work that we, we will do together. I also want to thank you for mentioning the incredible leaders that you just mentioned. I, I agree with you. I get to meet with parent leaders regularly, and the names you've mentioned are people that have taught me a lot about the work that's happened here in New York City. So lessons learned are, are, are this. Um, uh, one of the council members mentioned that uh, in the schools where teachers want to teach in a very different way and do things that are uplifting to students, that they are told they can't do that because we don't talk about that in this school. Uh, 
part of why I think I've been so outspoken and hopefully clearly spoken about this issue is that I want to empower teachers and paraprofessionals and principals and secretaries and student nutrition workers, the people in the schools to understand that this is the agenda, that you should be talking about this and looking at the work in a very different way. But number two, the other lesson that I've learned is that uh, we haven't in the past listened and given an appropriate place at the decision-making table to the very kinds of parent leaders that you've just talked about. Um, and what we've really been trying to do, and, and I'll let them either you know, verify or, or, or counter, what we've been trying to do, and, and I'm gonna make it very personal, what I've been trying to do is make them understand um, through my actions that their voices are being accounted for, their voices are at the table, that their perspectives are influencing policy. And you know, in the in the toughest of the days, in this in this kind of a conversation, um, all I have to do is to think about those parent leaders, and quite frankly, think about the student leaders that have sat with me and shared with me very difficult stories about what their experiences have been, to really prop up this notion that this is a conversation New York City is ready to have. Um, Quite frankly, the, the reason that I've been so um, strident here before the, the City Council today about really honoring the work of the School Diversity Advisory Committee uh, is, I look, I, I fully understand um, the, the, the hierarchy and, and the official capacity of the City Council. It's no disrespect to the City Council. But here we have residents that have given their time that deserve the respect of a conversation uh, because what I've heard from those parent leaders in the past is we will talk about something, we will work on something, and then all of a sudden we'll hear somewhere else that decisions have been made without the respect of having us as part of the conversation. So what we're really trying to do here is to honor those voices, but I will tell you there's a lot of work that's been done and we're trying to gather that work and those good practices to really create the kind of system that you're describing, that a parent doesn't feel they have to go somewhere else to get the kind of education they want for their child. I, I agree that they, they have done a lot of work. I stress that in, in my opening statement. But you know the, the parents, the educators, the advocates, this would enable them to also choose a not-for-profit that can help them implement some of their ideas that they will flesh out ultimately. And I think that they know the not-for-profits that are also doing the real work around segregation in our school system. And, and in terms of visiting my district, absolutely. We have amazing schools there, PS34, PS15. They're all great schools. I'd love to visit one with you one day just humbly born and raised in the district so I could probably show you a thing or two so I hope to see you there you have my commitment let's do it thank you councilmember and next we'll hear from councilmember Rosenthal thank you um, thank you so much thanks chairs thank you chancellor always great to see you appreciate your work on diversity um, and actually, so I have three questions, and my first one is about the, an amazing uh, rezone integration plan that we were able to achieve in 2015. One of the lessons I learned is resources, 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 that when you are successful in integrating the schools, that they may need, and certainly in our case, we did need, additional resources to guarantee success. And let me give you one example, a full-time social worker. And that was something, and it goes to the speaker's point about the desperate need for a full-time social worker at every school. And because the DOE did not do it, every year it comes out of the puny amount of money that I'm allowed to allocate in my district. Uh, I, I need to pay for a full-time social worker at a school, and that's a problem. And yet, the principal tells me that it's because of that social worker that they have had the success that they've had. So, one thing to keep in mind. The second question has to do with what are we doing about increasing diversity and integration as it has to do with people with disabilities. Um, they are 19% of the students in the system and they, I believe, should always be included in every conversation about diversity and inclusion and integration. 
And by the way, as Councilmember Barron raised the point about diversity in, in the teaching staff and in administration, we must include people with disabilities uh, as a category as well. And lastly, I'd like to ask you about a specific um, high school CTE program, which should be, I believe, one of the treasured screen schools in New York City, which is Food and Finance High School. Um, everyone says this, love that school, but they're asking for one thing and one thing only besides to fix their kitchens and their ovens and stoves. But in addition to that, that they be screened in the following way. Why are you interested in a school that's called food and finance? That's it. Because many students come to the school because they like to eat food. I do too, but I, it wouldn't have been the right school for me. Um, they have an amazing program. They want to keep their 16% IEP students. They want to keep their 55% black students, 48% uh, 43% Latinx students. They want to keep all of that. Um, they have an 86% graduation rate. Many of their students go on to college. They want to keep all of that. They want to be able to ask one question. And at that juncture, I would ask that you list them as one of your prize specialized high schools because they are a prize in my mind's eye, what they do with students is delicious. <laughs> so let's start with the integration stuff. So thank you, Councilman Rosenthal. So um, if you don't mind, a little friendly amendment, I'd like to start with food and finance. That's a great school. I had a great visit there. Um, I know that we are working with, as part of our master uh, facilities plan around some mitigation of some of the issues there. The students were fantastic. Um, and I've been quoted as saying that screens are the antithesis of a public school system. But what often doesn't get quoted is what I also said, the caveat was, unless it's for a very specific reason and it's a good reason. Asking why do you want to come to a school called Food and Finance High School is probably a really good question. Um, so that would fall into that category of a good reason. Uh, so I just want to say that a big shout out to them. They're a really good school. Now, the issue of disabilities. Uh, you are absolutely right. One of the things that I think doesn't get talked about often is what is the number, what is the percentage of students that are attending the specialized schools? What is their disability, student disability percentage? Um, I will tell you, we have that, that data. It's very, very low. So, uh, you know, we, we talk about race and ethnicity and we talk about the gender issue, but this is another critical issue in that particular conversation. That and I'm just going to double down on that. Sure. Can you imagine kids going to school with kids in wheelchairs or who have hearing loss or are blind in their classroom? So as they become working adults, those individuals, 11% of our population, are hired, mm -hmm. which is really the key to it all. I, I couldn't agree with you more, and even more so, they do the hiring. Can you imagine that? Um, so what we have done is this year we instituted a priority for students with disabilities. Uh, unfortunately, I like to say that in New York City of our 1,800 schools, uh, we have uh, a portfolio of buildings that is very historic. It's another way of saying they're not all accessible. And, and that's an issue. We have old buildings. Um, but of the buildings that are accessible, we have prioritized in the five-year capital plan $750 million to address those issues of accessibility. In addition, we created a priority this year for students with disabilities for any school that is fully accessible. They get a priority to go to those schools because of the accessibility. We want to make sure that they go there. Do families know that? Yes, we've been doing a robust information campaign to families, uh, and we're going to continue to do that. Um, but again, this is also that notion of when you include a student, it's more than just having them go to the same school. 
you have to include them in the very fabric of the classroom and the classroom activities and make it a, you know, I heard a story when I first got here of a student that uh, was uh, functionally or physically disabled and couldn't go on a field trip because they couldn't get the appropriate transportation that could transport the wheelchair. I mean, we were on that right away, but those are examples of when you're gonna include, you have to fully include, we're with you on that. Manhattan School for Children, no playground, no accessible playground. And again, the council member at the end of the day is going to have to fund making that playground accessible, which was my first question, which has to do with resources. So resources, again, are the lifeblood. Um, it's interesting. I don't have a printing press. I don't get to print my own money. Um, I don't get to sell things and increase the price so I can increase the revenue I collect. We are funded in the DOE based on the allocations that were provided. So the conversations around budget are very appropriate. I want to thank the City Council for advocating for those things that are important to us collectively around uh, our students and what students should have. Um, but there is also another conversation that we, are, we should have as part of how we view um, schools in the future, and that is this notion of a weighted student formula that we currently have in New York City where the money theoretically follows the student, and if you have uh, fluctuations in student enrollment, you have fluctuations in the allocation of resources, uh, and we should have a conversation about what are the essential positions that every school should have. Uh, and I will tell you that in school systems that I have led across the country, when we've had that conversation, the pushback becomes, well, you're centralizing the allocation of resources. I say you should be talking about what are things that are important to you, and if they're important to you, they should be funded. So if we say that social workers are important, then it shouldn't be based on the funding. Certain schools get them, other schools don't. If that's an important, essential position, there is a school of thought that says then it should be funded as a position. Uh, same thing with counselors, same thing, you, you can name a bunch of essential librarians. Um, so I think that's the next iteration of conversation that we should have. Again, it comes with a price tag. And, and I don't say that as an excuse, I only say that as to frame the conversation about uh, what is it that schools should look like we need to have a very, very nuanced but clear conversation, which I think you've already started to have. I appreciate Thank that. You. I Council mean, Rosa, you could, oh, the last point, because then, because Councilor Rodriguez is very patient. Of course, last point, sure. of course. And thank you for your time. And Chair Traeger, you're a rock star. By the way, food and finance, uh, more than 90% go on to college or further education, and some go to non-degree culinary training. Most go to college, and they're under-enrolled. And if you had one guiding question, uh, why are you interested in food and finance, you will get more students at that school. Thank you. Full disclosure, Councilmember Rosenthal, I invited the principal of John Dewey High School to visit food and finance with me a while back ago, and that visit inspired a $3 million plus investment to build a state-of-the-art culinary kitchen at John Dewey High School that will be opening very soon. So Chancellor, you're invited to that as well. And one way to raise revenue is the students. That's right. They do some fine cooking and baking. That's right, they do, they do. Our kids, our kids are already gifted and talented, all of them, that's right. Uh, next, we'll hear from Councilmember Rodriguez. Thank you, Chair. I believe that there's a lot of people responsible in the city of New York for building a system that has been based on racism and discrimination. And today we're paying the consequences. I believe that, you know, we have a guy in D.C. that we, ha we can call her who he is. But here in the city of New York, when we try to make changes, so if you touch my privilege, then we get in trouble. And I feel that unless we recognize that we are investing 21, more than $20 billion to educate 1.1 million students, and for decades, students have not been reading, writing, math, science at their level, and that's why we got here today. If we are not able to do it in this administration, I don't think that we don't have a guarantee because we can have agree, disagree on many things, but there's 
This is a more progressive administration that we have. There's a lot of people that we have in Twist. They've been working there for Giuliani, Bloomberg, following order. They execute some of this policy. They just follow order. They just follow leadership. So for me, the problem is not a specialized high school. For me, I think that we should lobby together to double the specialized high school. And I really mean it. For me, this is about the pipeline. As a former teacher for 13 years, as a co-founder of two schools, one of them a progressive education built on the Chancellor Fernandez, I believe what the city has been lacking in this administration, new chancellor, the mayor, new team, you're doing the best you can to build that pipeline. So we can spend months and years. You know, starting for a test for a test in the Chinese community come from the Confucian time. There's a specific value that is given to preparing to the test. I believe that what we need to do is, one, to learn from the Asian community. We should start preparing the kid since third grade. And we should be sure that we have a pipeline that from third grade to sixth grade, we already know what choices the student will have. And again, I believe I support reforms. I support bringing changing in formula, but I don't think that the target should be, yes, the specialized high school. Because most of the students who go to specialized high school, their parents, they are working class. They are not the wealthy one. And I think that we need to bring them up together because every single child should deserve to know that when they apply to high school, they will be prepared with choices. So as a father of two daughters, I just want every children of New York City to be prepared to have choices. So in summary, my question is, how much more can you do to continue expanding the pipeline from kindergarten to high to middle school so that a student will have real choices? So th thank you for your question, Councilman Rodriguez. Uh, we, we agree and I agree completely with you. It's a pipeline issue. Um, part of what's happened is in this administration, the pre-K for all has been a game changer for uh, students in this, in, in this city. Uh, the ability to start earlier, we know through research, changes outcomes for students. The addition of even 3K is even more of a doubling down on that initiative. So that's one of the first things that this city has done, and it's been with the support of the city council and this mayor. It's a game changer for us. That being said, as we look from an equity perspective in terms of where do we have programs across the city, and many of them have been mentioned here, dual language programs, STEM programs, where do we have AP programs, where do we have IB programs, where do we have different kinds of specialized areas of study. Um, as we look at where in the geographical distribution of our city those programs reside, there are some glaring, glaring inequities. So when we talk about, uh, from an equity perspective, where are we investing in historically underserved communities, that's exactly what I'm talking about. When you look at opportunities for students even marrying the issue of academics with sports, for example, we know there are some gross inequities in terms of opportunities for students to have that experience as well. All of that we're taking on. And as we become more and more uh, focused and you see more and more of those initiatives that come forward, it's gonna require some funding, but it's also gonna require the political will. You talked about privilege. I wanna thank you for saying that word in public. Uh, you talked about when you are moving um, what is perceived as privilege from one, from one item to another, there's going to be a robust conversation and pushback. I think that's what we're seeing right now. But I do think that uh, to the chair and to the speakers, um, great, great credit. We have to be able to have this conversation in very unvarnished terms, but in a respectful way that is the North Star. What are we trying to get to is exactly what you just talked about. Great opportunities for students in every one of our neighborhoods. Second, one thing that on the Bloomberg was stopped, it was some change, I know it's about dollars, about budget, was 
a number of CBOs in the local community, they were able, they were down committed to run program in the schools. And DOE used to give a waiver so that they didn't have to pay for the cost. It was a change that happened in the last four years of Bloomberg when then the CBO, they were charged per square feet. I hope that if you can look at that with your team and look at the possibility that provide a waiver for local CBOs that are interested in provide free program in the schools that, they, that can complement, I think that it also can help. We will absolutely look into that. Thank Thanks. you. Uh, thank you very much. And just want to note, uh, council members Ku, King, and Barron have w one and only one more additional follow-up question. One. Uh, so, because in the interest of hearing from the public, we just want to make sure that we. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Um, is there an opportunity for a bio break? Uh, I, I've been here I, since ten, and I've been trying I, to hold it. <laughs> I, I think, I, th I think that is. That is very fair, Mr. Chancellor. Uh, you, you, you get a bathroom pass, absolutely. Uh, five, okay. five minute uh, recess. Yeah. Strict five minute recess. Thank you very, very much. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Oh, I'm five minutes now. <laughs>
folks, if we could all please grab our seats so we can begin shortly. Can we please all grab our seats so we can begin shortly? Okay, I think we are uh, ready to begin again. And just a, a note, run to my colleagues, just one question because we, we try to be mindful. I want to, I want to hear public testimony as well. Uh, we'll first, we hear from Council Member Koo. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Chancellor, thank you for your first session. I know you're tired. And, uh, so um, you spoke about expanding time. You spoke about expanding 3K, right? But this year's expansion doesn't include 3K in any community that's largely Asian American. Not Chinatown, not Flushing, not Amherst, Sunset Park. Can you explain why? So I'm gonna ask uh, our Deputy Chancellor uh, Wallach to talk a little bit about that. Um, yes, uh, so a, a couple of things. Um, one is that we're very proud that now that we're bringing the early care and education programs together in this administration, we will be able to offer 
um, early education to low-income families in every district of New York City um, as we bring those programs together. And second, I would say that the way that this administration set priorities for the initial 3K for all districts um, was by uh, looking at the 10 districts with the most economically challenged families, the lowest income districts in New York City, and then all five boroughs of New York City. Um, that being said, our aspiration, as you know, is to bring 3K for all to every district in New York City, uh, and we are working hard to try to secure the funding for that, um, and we look forward to working and partnering with you to accomplish that so that every child can experience high quality early education at the age of three. But, but you, you might have a part, there Council are a lot member. of poor families. Final question, please. Yeah. Yeah, there are a lot of poor families. In, we, in we, agree. Yeah. we agree that, it, yeah. that we should have 3K for all in every district of New York City, and we want to work with you to accomplish that. That's all how right. we chose the initial ones. I, I look forward to that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Next, we'll hear from Council Member King. Thank you again. I um, hope everybody is cool from their bio break. Um, <laughs> but my question to you is that there was a chart up there um, identifying the breakdown of ethnicity of, of blacks, whites, Hispanics, Asians in the public school system. But the number of blacks who are high in being part of the system but low part of going to specialized high school. My question to you is, I see in 2019 over 20, 27,000 children took the test. Um, five over, almost 6,000 said come on in. And out of that, 4% were black. Um, 51% is uh, Asian and 6% Hispanic. So my question is, who made that decision out of all those numbers? Who goes into a specialized school? After taking the test and passing the test, who made, those, who, who made the decision to say, we're gonna take this, that large amount, that, that, that gets a small amount, who made that decision? Who made the decision of who takes the test? Sorry, I- No, after they've taken the test yep. and children have passed the test, yep. who made the decision to say, we're gonna take this amount, that amount, that amount. Who I made see. that decision? So yes, yeah, so the, the, as the program functions right now, as the, as the system functions right now, it's just literally picking kids according to their score on the test, starting with the top score and going down the list. And I think what the chancellor and the mayor have pointed out is that when you rely on a single exam like that and that one score to make that decision, you wind up with outcomes that don't reflect the diversity of New York City. Um, and so what you're seeing is there's nobody making, there's no person making choices, it's just a, a an, um, computer? The, the order of the test scores. Is that a computer? I'm sorry, I don't mean to no follow up. I'm trying no, to- No, it's I, fine. I, I, we, basically just, we, I, I, there is a computer involved, but basically we're just oh, wow. looking at a list of all the test scores that students got and taking the top scorers and they get the first offer to those, to those seats. Well, maybe we need to put the human component back into this and then we're really, we can alleviate a lot of dis discrimination. It would Thank be you the very same, much. It would be the same result unless we change the system itself, as the Chancellor said. Thank you, thanks very much, and Council Member- Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just want to address what is perhaps a subtle undertone of um, talking about cultural differences and in a negative way, casting aspersions, particularly on the African American community. And I just want to remind people that historically, we know that mankind began in Africa, and we know that the Greeks and the Romans went to African nations to study. They went to the universities of Timbuktu and Sankare to study. And we know that once Africans were kidnapped from Africa and brought here to this country, that they were denied an education and that they suffered perhaps death if they tried to learn to read. But nonetheless, they always pursued the dream of being educated and pursuing higher levels of education. So for those people who are making innuendos that, well, if it were really important, perhaps we'd be able to find a way to pay for the training that other communities pay for, I think that that's not based in fact. And I just wanted to ask the chancellor to talk about the fact that even though we know that tests may not be designed to be prejudicial, when the results of the test come such as to give disparate results, they are in fact discriminatory. And I just wanted to ask the Chancellor to talk briefly on that. So thank you, Councilmember um, Barron. So 
testing in and of itself must be for a specific purpose, which points to the validity of the test, and it must give you a consistent result, which points to the reliability of the test. We know that the human condition, especially as students are developing their academic capabilities, as students are developing their vision for what they want to do and what they want to study, are much more than the sum total of any one test. Now, how those tests are constructed, what the correlation is to the way the questions are worded and the background of students, um, how the test is uh, put together in order to give you a certain conclusion, all of that factors into who does well and who doesn't. So if the notion is that we want to have students who, number one, there are a lot of students who could go to specialized schools who choose to go to other schools uh, because they want to study a particular in a particular school or school environment. But for those students that do want to go into a specialized school environment, then we know that the test as it's currently configured is not meant to identify talent, it's not meant to identify capabilities, it's not meant or constructed to identify grit and resilience, it's only configured to screen. It's a screening test. And in some cases where you may have five answers to a question, three of those answers are all correct, but one is a little more correct. That doesn't tell you anything except how well you've been prepared to take that screening test. And the results are pretty clear. As I've said in my testimony, either we believe it's the kids, or perhaps it's the condition, the instrument, the protocol that is giving us the kind of outcomes that we're getting. That can't be the way that we provide opportunities in a city like New York City that is so diverse. And I also want to emphasize, and I really want to thank you for pointing out the subtle language that gets used when we talk about this particular issue. Uh, because I, like you, will not be silent about that. Mm -hmm. Let's be respectful about how we talk about this issue, but let's be very, very clear that all students in New York City deserve an opportunity, not a guaranteed space, an opportunity. And how we structure those opportunities says a lot about what we believe in in terms of our city. That's what this conversation is really about. It's not a good system, it's not a good test, and it's giving us results, even in terms of boys versus girls being successful, students with disabilities, et cetera, on a lot of different indicators, there's no one indicator that shows us this is a really enlightened way of choosing opportunity for students. Thank you, Mr. Chancellor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Burr. And very strong and much needed point because you're absolutely correct and spot on. I truly appreciate leadership on, on this. Um, Mr. Chancellor, just very quick uh, follow up and just we'll, we'll close out to, to get to, here to the public. Do you believe that charter schools have exacerbated segregation in our school system? <clears throat> well, yeah, I was just on a panel with uh, a number of researchers, and uh, the research is, is clear that by and large, and I'm not talking about New York City, but in, by and large, charter schools are more segregated in their student populations than traditional public schools writ large in America. Uh, that being said, there's a lot that's been talked about and written about, well, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. I want people to keep in, in, in perspective that there are many more opportunities right now than there were 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Private schools have scholarship programs that offer these opportunities to students of color to go to private schools. There are a number of charter schools that take students and enroll students in charter schools. So the, the options and the opportunities are greater, particularly for uh, black and Latino students. So there's some of that as well. Um, but uh, again, I, I have no quibble, um, no, no, no fight except for the fact that we currently have a system in place that I think systematically excludes opportunity to certain groups of students. Right, because on the topic of problematic admissions, uh, many charters don't really give you a choice, they give you a chance, they give you basically a ping pong ball. Talk about problematic admissions, a ping pong ball will decide your admissions into a school. 
So that's, I think, also problematic, and I think that should be brought into the conversation. And just to uh, wrap up, I, I want to just clarify, uh, with regards to the, uh, the important work of the advisory group, uh, deeply value their work and their recommendations. Uh, I guess I was under the impression that there was a meeting, or should have been a meeting already, between February and now, and I'm, based on what I'm hearing, there was not a meeting yet. Is that correct, Mr. Chancellor? So the, the committee is continuing to meet, right. um, and, but there, there is a meeting that we're scheduling where the mayor and I will both meet with the, the committee to discuss the recommendations and then what the next steps are as well. That's the meeting that I'm referring right. to. And just to clarify, because I, I want to just credit their work, there's just eagerness on our part to begin to implement very key parts. Uh, there's an eagerness, a passion eagerness to start, as we heard from the students uh, I brought to mind uh, the famous words, the fierce urgency of now, to start working and implementing, actualizing these things. Um, and uh, final note, uh, one of the pre-considered intros is my bill with regards to uh, uh, asking the DOE or, uh, to report on staff demographics in our school system. Does the DOE have a position on that bill that they could share today? Um, I think it's a great idea, um, and we do compile that data about the demographics of our staff. Uh, it, our human capital division um, it, it has a mandate to look at the diversification of our staff, so right. th it's readily available, but I think it's a good idea, and I think it's a public right. conversation that should be had. Right, and I think it's uh, just to kind of certainly our school system, our staff should be reflective of our, of our, of our city, of our student body. But I also wanted to lead to a, another deeper issue that I've had, I've shared with Mr. Chancellor, about teacher preparation, our future educators, making sure that the curriculums to prepare future teachers is not just focused on content, but also pedagogy, culturally responsive you know, uh, approaches as well. Uh, a lot of work to do around those areas. So, and I just want to note in closing, Mr. Chancellor, you are, uh, you have been very visible and on this issue from the beginning. You have taken your fair share of hits as well, and I think that at times there are some heated exchanges here, but I think we're all really on the same page about getting the best system for, for, for our children. Um, just know that there are advocates here in this body that just want more resources for our schools and create a more fair, equitable process for all. So I, I thank you for your leadership and for, and for your team as well. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Uh, Okay, I'd like to uh, now welcome, we have uh, a member uh, of the New York State Assembly who is certainly no stranger to the New York City Council, uh, former council member, current assembly member, and someone who has been very uh, forceful and outspoken in defense of public schools uh, throughout his career. I'd like to please welcome, uh, council, uh, I'm sorry, assembly member, uh, Char Charles Barron. Mr. Chair, once you say council member, you're messing with my domestic tranquility. <laughs> so I just want you to uh, call me, I am the state assembly member. <laughs> Education should be for liberation. It should be for liberation. Liberation from poverty and liberation from a racist, parasitic, predatory capitalist system. It is this system that perpetuates a value system that is hierarchical, the Weberian value system of class. It is a system that maintains poverty and maintains an unequal distribution of wealth. It is a system that is showing there's a gap between the rich and the poor widening every day. So when we educate our children, we can't say that we just want to educate them so they can get a good job, or educate them so they can climb up the ladder, or educate them so they can be integrated into a system that even Martin Luther King said in his latter years, perhaps I'm trying to integrate into a burning house. This is Martin Luther King, not Malcolm X. 
whom I really love and said some other things, and I'll tell you about that one day. But this is a system that needs radical transformation. This is a system that needs change, root changes. So oftentimes, we organize and talk about the symptoms of a deeply rooted systemic problem. Poverty is a symptom. Miseducation is a symptom. Inadequate health care is a symptom. The problem is capitalism. And its ideological foundation, racism, which permeates every institution in this country. I just thought I'd open up with that. How y'all doing? <laughs> so I firmly believe that a socialist value system, a socialist economic system, a socialist political system is a better system. It is a better system because it has a better value system. It values people. It values people over profit. It values need over greed. And I think this is the kind of value system that we must teach our young people. That's why I was so proud of this panel of young people that came up here. They didn't talk about their personal stuff. They talked about what could be better for all of them. And that's why I'm here today. So I want to give you a little uh, report from the state. Two white men are in an ego, ego battle over the resources and controlling of the education system in New York State and New York City. One of the white men's name is Governor Andrew Cuomo. The other white man is Mayor Bill de Blasio. They are battling each other and trying to punish each other over funding and who's going to pay for what and not caring whether that impacts the children of the system that they're depriving money from. We must end mayoral control. No one person should have any dictatorial control over the system of 1.1 million children with a budget of $32 billion in 1,800 schools and thousands of teachers and principals. No one person who is not an educator should have that control. Some people said, well, we want to give him that control so we can hold him accountable. Accountable? Mayor, you are accountable to every agency in the, in the city. You are already accountable. It's not accountability, it's control. Control, control over a $8 billion budget, a $8 billion contracting budget. Do you know how many people are becoming millionaires off of the contracting budget? of New York City, $8 billion. There are some cities that don't have $8 billion. And this is just a contracting budget. So we were upstate, and I was trying to fight for you all to get more money for New York City. We were battling. How do you have a state that has $175.5 billion? $175 billion dollars, $27 billion for the state education budget, a city with $92 billion and $32 billion for the education budget. That's a lot of money. I don't even know how to make all those zeros. That is a lot of money. There shouldn't be any poverty. There shouldn't be this kind of unemployment. There shouldn't be hungry children in New York City and New York State with that kind of money. But it doesn't go where it needs to go. In 2006, the court said, because of the racism of the state and the unequal distribution of wealth to black and brown schools, the Campaign for Fiscal Equity said that they owe these schools $6 billion. This is in 2006. Here it is, 2019. They still owe $4 billion. So out of this $175 billion, Mr. Chairman, we said, 
Let's do this. Let's do 1.2 billion this year, 1.657 billion next year, and then pay the rest off in three years so that we can pay that whole debt off and deliver it to the neediest schools in New York City and across the state. And you know what happened? The governor said, well, I'm only going to give 338 million. Now, remember, we were all so happy that we had a Democratic Senate and a Democratic Assembly with a, I don't know what you call governor, whatever he is politically, a chameleon. But we had the two parties controlling both houses. One party controlling both houses. Everybody thought the Democrats have arrived. Wow, this is great. Let me tell you something. Last year, when there was an IDC and Republicans controlling the Senate, we got, and I have fought hard for it, totally disappointed. By the way, I don't vote for any of the budgets because they don't do the right thing by the people. I fought and we got 618 million people, or uh, dollars, toward Campaign for Fiscal Equity, 618 million. This year, I said, uh-oh, we don't have those Republicans in control anymore. We got this. Guess how much we got? $618 million, the same amount that was given under the Republican administration. You know, I told them that they should stop calling it a two-party system. They could either be Republicrats or Democans. There should be a one-party system, the way they're acting up there. So we didn't get the money that should have come to the city for this. So we're fighting hard. And when we say education for liberation, we can't just teach our children how to survive a decadent system. We have to train them to change it, not to cope, not to survive, but to change it. And that's a different kind of education. So when we integrate, integrate into what? Integrate into what? And that what is what we got to work out so it works for our children. We know what it takes to educate children. First of all, it takes teachers who know how to teach. It takes teachers who know how to teach. And I know there's some great teachers, but there's some lousy ones that need to go. It takes principals that have vision leadership, and management skills. When we got some great principles, some need to go do something else. It takes a curriculum, and I'm particularly concerned about black people and people of African ancestry. We definitely need to have a mandated, mandated African and African-American history in that curriculum. That should be a mandate. We know it takes a culturally relevant curriculum. We also know that it takes smaller class size. We know that every school should have a library, an updated library with high technology. We know that it takes a music and arts and culture and sports, because that's motivating students to learn. And we know you need to get rid of standardized tests Standardized tests, you know, if they take local tests all year long and got grade point average, that's it. They don't need to do anything else. They prove that they have education potential. So we know that's what it takes. It takes, a, uh, it takes smart boards, computers, science labs, and this city council has to do most of that in the schools in our local district, I know because I've been a city council member for 12 years and we had to do the same thing. So when we're talking about education, we got to educate our children. And when we talk about integration, it's not because Martin Luther King and the civil rights people wanted to sit next to white people at a lunch counter. It's not because we felt we would be better if we went to a white folks school is because we wanted to equal resources. And that's the same thing we're talking about today. I'm all right with an all-black school. Just give me all the computers we need, all the qualified teachers we need, all of the gym, nice gymnasiums. Give us what everybody else has. Finally, 
on the specialized test. I think everybody said it well. I could only repeat. I think the chancellor handled that very well. But let me say this to you. First, there are no seats reserved for any ethnic group. All the seats are open for everyone to apply for to get in. Nobody has a reserved seat. So if you change policies, you're not hurting one group because nobody has a reserved seat. These seats are open for everybody. Secondly, I don't understand how anybody can be against a policy that's going to move the numbers from less than 10% with black and Latino students to, in three years, 45% especially a black person. You know, some black people say, and it gets on, y'all know about the last nerve, right? This gets on my last nerve. Well, I passed it because I worked hard. So why can't they pass it? Those are bougie black folk who think that they made it because they were smart and they didn't. They made it because a system was set up for that kind of stuff to happen. A test doesn't make you smart. I know some pretty dumb people who passed that test. <laughs> the test doesn't make you smart. There are some students who didn't reach the grade level, the score that you spoke of, went on to Stanford University, went on to Harvard University. Oh, they can go to Stanford and Harvard, but they can't go to Stuyvesant? They can't go to Stuyvesant? These, and don't talk about we need better preparation, we need more test prep and all of that. We need to get rid of this test. And how could you be against a policy that says 7% of the top students in each school? I don't even believe in this elitist school stuff. I believe we should have an egalitarian school system. Egalitarianism simply means equal access, equal opportunities for all. We should call it an egalitarian school system. That's what we need. That's equal for all. And for those who try to escape away from the, the standardized, the, uh, the test being removed, and they try to run to, oh, we don't just need to talk about the test. We need to talk about pre-K. We need to talk about some of the other issues in education. Well, we are, and we've been talking about that. But don't try to run away from the fact that this test needs to go, and we need to have equal access for everybody. So if a school is all Asian, then they will have 7%. If a school is Latino, they will have 7%. If the school is mixed, they will have 7%. That's equal, fair access for everyone. Because you went to cram schools, crammed thousands of dollars you spent on cramming your children to, to pass this test that is only teaching them to pass a test. It doesn't measure their academic or their education potential. It just shows that they can take a test. Let's end it. Let's end mayoral control. And let's talk about this state's debt that they owe to this city and to the schools in this city. So I want to thank you for allowing me a few expressions. I want to let you all know something, and I tell this to the public. There is a council member, and I have to confess that I really love this council member a lot. I think she's one of the best council members, and it has nothing to do with the fact that she's my wife. I know, <laughs> of 36 years. It has nothing to do, this is an objective opinion. I think she's the beautifulest, smartest, brilliant council member that this council has ever had, that has ever had. So now that I got my brownie points, I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Does the council member have any questions for the assembly member? <laughs> or is it after the hearing? You did well. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you, assembly member. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, so now uh, we will now invite members of the public to speak. Uh, in the interest of time and trying to keep things along, and I know it's been, it's been long already, and I truly 
praise everyone's patience and time. Everyone will be on a, uh, a two-minute clock. Um, we have your testimony in full, so please, please summarize your points for the council members. Uh, if you need an interpreter for your testimony, uh, please come to the sergeant's desk uh, for, an, for an appearance card, and we do have interpreters here with us. Hello,现在我们将要是希望能够让我们的这个公众的这个人员呢能够上来这边呢进行这个咨询。然后每一位人士呢他们有两分钟的时间,如果你需要翻译的话,你有四分钟的时间。然后呢,所有的人呢希望
We applaud the local community school districts where parents, advocates, and educators recognize the system was broken and created their own school integration plans. In districts one, three, and 15, and in over two dozen pro schools across the city, stakeholders collaborated on plans to reverse work, worsening segregation. They took a bold step, but as a system, we need to do better. It's time for us to focus on all schools. We need a top to bottom retooling of the DOE's approach to high school enrollment from its application process to the complex placement algorithm from its screen and specialized high schools admissions to the vestiges of the small school era. The UFT believes admission to the specialized high schools must be changed to a system of multiple measures. That's not new. That same standard, multiple indicators to assess a student's academic standing must be applied across the board. So a single test does not determine access to gifted and talented programs, middle schools, or the specialized high schools. Equally important, the UFT supports the creation of more high schools, particularly where existing high schools are overcrowded, and the creation of more academically rigorous programs inside more high schools. Frankly, no discussion without segregation in New York City's public schools can be complete without reference to one of its most pervasive forms, academic isolation. We do our students a disservice and their parents when we reinforce a narrative that it's only about eight specialized high schools, and that the only vehicle to success is through those eight, when we know there are hidden gems like the school where I teach, where students, teachers, and community work together to empower students academically and socially. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, my name is Henry Rubio, and I serve as the Executive Vice President of the Council for School Administrators. I'm here today on behalf of our President, Mark Canizaro. More importantly, I'm here to represent our members, the nearly 16,000 active and retired principals, assistant principals, educational administrators, childhood education directors, supervisors of. We welcome and thank you for the opportunity, uh, Chair Traeger and other committee members, uh, for the opportunity to offer CSA's perspective and our support on the resolutions. As we argued in our testimony last winter, CSA at CSA, we believe that our students of every race, gender, and socioeconomic status benefit from a diverse and inclusive classroom. Um, in fact, thanks to the City Council uh, for its support of uh, our Executive Leadership Institute that also promotes professional development to that and to school leaders across New York City. Now, there are, of course, many possible ways in which uh, many possible ways in which the DOE can address systemic segregation in our public schools. And our members, our school administrators, the city's school leaders must always be included in that dialogue to diversify our schools. Let's always be reminded that it is our school leaders who face the critical task of implementing these plans on a daily basis and uh, addressing the fears and concerns of those who oppose them. Um, one of the reasons we believed in the potential of the District 15 plan to change their middle school admission policy and other districts is because principals and assistant principals, uh, uh, school administrators had been included throughout the process and the plan had their support. The plan was the result of years of advocacy and months of public input. And the, result of, and, the, and the result of a challenging, thoughtful work done by principals, teachers, parents, and school community members throughout. Our school leaders must now be given the time and the resources necessary to implement any diversity plan successfully, including funding our schools at 100%. And we'd like to take a moment to just thank this committee and our Chair Traeger for advocating to the Chancellor in the city for that as well. Lastly, CSA looks forward to serving as a voice of school leaders on any task force, especially in the task force um, of uh, the uh, Specialized High School Task Force. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Patrick Joseph, Senior Policy Analyst for the Manhattan Borough President, I'm delivering these remarks on her behalf. Um, the Borough President would like to express her strong support uh, for the Council's endeavors to integrate New York City schools. Uh, in particular, she would like to voice support for the pre-considered introductions, uh, 4277, 4279, and the proposed resolution 417. Uh, 
4277 is, is uh, Traeger's bill, um, that the data on school staff demographics would be shared publicly. Uh, we, we believe this is key, this is essential to monitoring the DOE's progress in making schools reflective of the city's diversity. While the department undergoes the necessary changes to train teachers in implicit bias and create culturally relevant curriculum for students, there is a well-known dearth of diversity within the teaching force uh, that must be addressed. Recent research demonstrates the significance of diverse teaching staff, highlighting benefits that include increased potential for common cultural understanding, improved student engagement, less class time spent on punitive discipline, higher expectations, uh, improved reading outcomes, improved math outcomes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we also believe that t diversifying the teaching force will help many of our youngest scholars see the teaching profession in a new light as there is a, a shortage of teachers uh, across the country um, and this might help students of color get more involved in that line of work as well. We'd also like to express support for 4279 which uh, would require establishing a mandate uh, for the DOE to work with all of its communities to integrate schools. Right now the model is ground up um, which is great but we also do need our school system to comply with the ruling of Brown v. Board of Ed, and it is uh, nigh time for that. Um, thankfully, uh, Integrate NYC, who I believe is represented here today, has already designed a framework for real integration. Uh, a lot of folks conflate desegregation and integration. Desegregation is just moving bodies, right? Integration is that hard work. Um, and so just very briefly, the, the five R's is just race and enrollment, uh, equitable distribution of resources, uh, relationships, developing schools that are empathetic toward all identities, um, restorative justice, decriminalizing schools. I, I didn't hear too much about that since I've, I've been here, but uh, that, that is a very much key uh, as we talk about out-of-school factors that impact our students. The over-policing of predominantly brown communities is, is key to that discussion. Um, and and v just lastly, I, I want to touch on that resolution about G&T. Um, I just want to be clear that uh, our opinions on this, the fact that we should have more opportunity for all students and in, in all districts to be part of G&T programs, this is really a lesser of two evils approach. Currently, G&T is about privilege. Uh, extending those opportunities to other students was better than that. But in reality, we really just need to stop screening kids, stop tracking kids, telling some kids they're intelligent, telling others they're, they're dumb and they won't make it. Uh, that's just vile, and, and that just needs to end. G&T is not a solution for racial disparities. It, it, the research tells us that it actually exacerbates these things like segregation. Uh, segregation, and so I, I want us to just keep that in mind as we have these discussions, and uh, thank you for the time. Uh, absolutely, and uh, if you heard briefly, we had an exchange with the Chancellor over the MOU that we've been waiting now for quite some time, which again, the NYPD has incredible power over our school system. Our school system is still governed by a Rudy Giuliani era police system, which is outrageous outrageous. It is a school system, not a PD system. And I fully agree with you, and I truly, truly appreciate your, your remarks and leadership. Uh, uh, Councilmember King has a question. Uh, thank you, all three of you, for testimony today. Um, my question goes on the line um, of, I'll double back to something that uh, Assemblymember Charles Byrne said, well, what does integration actually mean? You know, um, is it about, we're saying it's not about moving bodies, but really getting the resources into our schools that makes sense. But at the end of the day, it starts at the beginning of the day. We're tapping systems and uh, symptoms as opposed to saying this education system is doing exactly, I said it earlier, it doesn't exactly, it was built to make sure that certain people do okay and certain people don't do okay. And all that is all the other symptoms that come out of it, whether it's poverty, health care, miseducation, whole nine yards. So I want to ask you all as union president, um, representing your unions, what is the union prepared to do to have a real conversation with its membership in regards to the issues that they sometimes enforce themselves within schools? And I come from a perspective of talking to principals and talking to st the teachers about, I'm a teacher who's teaching social studies, and when I want to have a real conversation to empower students on the story and the history of America, I get chastised or I get suspended or I get punished for having these conversations with kids because it doesn't fall in line with the DOE curriculum. So that's a principle throwing a teacher underneath the bus. You represent both of those 
entities. So I'm asking you, what conversations are y'all willing to have, have um, as opposed to waiting for a solution to come from the DOE that say, we as union, this is the approach we want to take to say, the system is doing what it's supposed to do. We got to rip down that whole system and rebuild a new one with solutions that now in, in turn inspires your membership as opposed to put your membership in a position that they can't stand up or present new ideas. Speaking for the teachers union, I can say that our members have been very vocal in calling for the kinds of changes that you're talking about. Specifically around the specialized high schools, members from every one of our schools came together in a task force to talk about what needed to be in place to provide an appropriate education for all students attending those schools. They're the ones who said, these schools are not as representative as they need to be. These schools don't offer the same kind of opportunities as they should. These, we as educators need to provide more to New York City's breadth of students and we want to be at the front line of doing that. By extension, I will say that not only in our pro schools, but across the board, our members are involved in conversations about removing the barriers to honest empowerment of our students, right? And so you see spaces where our teachers are working with organizations like Integrate NYC and Teens Take Charge. That is happening in many schools around the city, particularly in the Bronx, but in many schools around the city. But it is also res the responsibility of educators across the system to think about exactly what you're talking about, and we are engaged in those conversations. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Councilman. I think that we've been on record both in our written testimony and in our participation here and in other venues that our members are overwhelmingly in support of a, di a diverse school system and diverse schools. Um, uh, in, in supporting curriculum to that effect as well, the training of teachers, the training of supervisors as well, and administrators. I think that there are many other factors, some mentioned by my, my colleague here from the UFT, Ms. Hines, uh, that are outside the principal's control, right? Zoning is not in the principal's control. Um, enrollment practices that are conducted by the Department of Education are not in the principal's control. Uh, budgets, despite what the department might say is really not in the principal's control, right? They're limited. Principals are held 100% accountable for everything in a school, but only giving 90% of the funding to do it, right? Um, and so I think on, on our end, there's a lot that our members are open to doing, but need the time and the resources in order to effectuate it. Okay, I, I thank both of you for your answers. And whatever solutions that you, you're coming up with, I don't know how is the DOE receiving, because I'm hearing you say it's out of our hands, we don't manage them. But one the problem I have with creating new task force out of task force, 65 years we know there's a problem. We need to have a task force created data to tell us the same problem that we know existed for 65 years. The question is, what actions have you d told the DOE, we need to do this? And have the DOE said, you know what, you're right, or the DOE told you, well, get, get away from, out of our office? What has the DOE said to the solutions that you're saying in regards to the bias, uh, the prejudice, and the discrimination that's happening in this education system that y'all know that is hurting children of color, period? I think both uh, Ms. Hines and I serve on the SDAG, right? And in our participation, that can, we've offered recommendations. Later, we'll have someone from the SDAG that's going to be talking about it. So we, we're on board with... Uh, those recommendations that have been already made to the Department of Education have been published. Now, there are other things that we have as a union, and I said today, that we think are gonna be key to making anything work. Every school different, every school district has its own intricacies and differences. And for anything to work, you've gotta involve the parents in that community, the local elected officials, the community. Those plans, like in District 15, are the ones that are most likely to succeed because you have community buy-in. And for us, I think that's the most important part um, um, in, 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 in moving any plan forward, right? And that this is not, you're right, this, this is a problem we've had for decades. And we're not gonna fix it in one or two or three years, but if, in order for this to work, it's gotta involve our parents, our teachers, our communities, our, our, uh, our elected officials, and, and, and we'll find a way forward. Thank you. I, I thank you, and I just want to note in, in, in this conversation about inter, you know desegregating schools and integration. I want to note as well about 
students, for example, in District 75 schools that still don't even have full access to their schools. Literally, if a school is not accessible, they might as well put a sign that says, this is not for you. So I don't want to lose that in this important conversation here and today. And there have been advocates who have been on this from the beginning that deserve attention and resources. We hear resources a lot here today, not just in terms of programs and, and, and educators and culturally responsive education approaches and integrations with admissions policies, but making sure our schools are fully accessible to all of our children. That must be a part of today's conversation as well. So I thank all of you for your leadership. And I thank you for being a champion on that issue as well. It's thank something you. that's very important to our members. Our District 75 schools were some of the neediest children in New York City, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank the panel. Next panel from Teens Take Charge, uh, Alexander Rodriguez, uh, Tiffany Torres, Ayana Smith, uh, Toby uh, Paperno, and Marcus uh, Alston. Uh, my name is Alexander Rodriguez, and we'd first like to say that it's disappointing that the DOE is not here to listen to students' testimonies. We trust social media will do its thing. Okay, thank you then. Hi, my name is Marcus Alston, um, and I'm from the f east side of Brooklyn, a place known for its underinvested schools and dangerous tendencies. I guess it's not that dangerous anymore since Molly and Tom made a few coffee shops, but um, we're not gonna talk about that. Um, I'm a junior at Pace High School, a school severely underfunded, cluttered, and below the state level of performance. My school is one out of the three schools in a four-floored building where Pace, all 600, Pace students, all 600 of them, are crammed into two floors. Maybe if I scored higher on my state test score in the seventh grade, my talents would be able to be noticed when auditioning for LaGuardia because I figured that my talent was validated by my ability to sing, not whether or not I got a one, two, or three on my state test. I couldn't help but think to myself, maybe if I was smarter in eighth grade when I sat down um, to take the SHSAT, I'd make it to a specialized high school. But I quickly realized that it wasn't that I was not smart enough, it was that I was not wealthy enough. The test isn't about what you know or how good you are at math. It's your ability to, uh, to obtain prep. The ability to pay thousands of dollars for prep was how you got in, the ticket to endless opportunities. This ticket is grant, isn't granted for people like me, and that's a part of the plan. A school like Stuyvesant High School, where the majority of students are white and 70% Asian, has access to so many things like working water fountains, maintained bathrooms, computer labs, and libraries, things all schools should have as mine has lead-infested water fountains, bathrooms with no dividers, a computer lab with one computer, and a non-existent library, my school, of course, filled with minorities. The idea of separate but equal is what Jim Crow used to justify the segregation of my ancestors in American history, but this history seems to, what I, seems to be what I'm living right now, so I ask, is this really history or his story? Ironically, the New York City school system are is actually separate and not equal. So I guess you win, Jim. Where the m more money you have grants you access to an all-inclusive five-star education while those who don't ha are left for scraps. The mission of the DOE is to create a fundamental learning environment for all students. Who is included in this all? Because it's definitely not people like me. 
I cannot believe that in 2019, we are living in Jim Crow era. It is time to desegregate it in this racist system. The chairman and people of the DOE who is here, um, please do not boast about how great the DOE is until people like me make it to the same opportunities as those to the Upper West Side. Don't you dare. Thank you. Good afternoon to you all. My name is Alexander Rodriguez and I am a junior at the Urban Assembly School for Law and Justice and Direct Action Fellow here at Teens Take Charge. Now before I begin to share my story on being processed in this system, I ask all of you to lose the, all the things you think of when you see the logo on my shirt and who I am. My high school journey begins inherently with my middle school journey and the lack of support I received during my application process. Like all the other students in my class, I applied to the brand name schools. That was all the guidance I got on my application, the words of my peers. Why? Because in a school of about 1,400 students, there were only two counselors. My assistance with this process came from sitting on the floor of my school gym with about 100 plus other students and one guidance counselor. I vividly remember sitting down in my dining room night after night struggling to find a school that aligned with my interest and location without the support of my mother who couldn't speak much English. All I knew was the schools I couldn't apply to and the schools everyone was applying to. The SHSAT only seemed an option to those who knew about it. So I placed pretty much at random eight schools and I ended up getting my sixth choice, the Urban Assembly School for Law and Justice. And to be quite honest with you, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. However, when I was placed into my high school, I was amazed to hear that I didn't have to make another at random decision again, because my school, composed primarily of black and Latinx students, was not going to let their students suffer because of a broken system they are a part of. Because school administration, combined with its nonprofit arm, the Adam Street Foundation, was not going to let competent children of color be failed by a broken system, not in my school. And so with an expansive list of robust enrichment opportunities, dozens of accurately trained counselors and hours of college preparation starting from the ninth grade, I am not another statistic. I am an example of what could be when adult leaders adopt policies like our enrollment equity plan. Thank you. Um, my name is Sophia Sherfields, and I am a senior at Brooklyn College Academy. I attended a predominantly black middle school in Crown Heights, and I graduated as valedictorian, and I got into a selective high school. I felt like I was ready to take on the world. Though my school lacked crucial resources, I was happy to be there. And I thought it was the norm in New York City public schools to not have several sports or underqualified teachers. It wasn't until I joined SEO Scholars that I learned that I was being underserved. My first day at SEO, I was introduced to the Achievement Gap. The Achievement Gap is a disparity in academic achievement among students based on the, on the basis of race and class. At 14 years old, hearing this atro atrocity, I was furious. Furious at the fact that I had a one-sided story of this education system. Furious at the fact that I came to the United States to seize opportunities and make something of myself only to find out there's a limitation to my success because of my income and race. But I mostly was furious because lawmakers and the people that can make real change refuse to do so. The, achieve the achievement gap exists in schools like my high school and middle schools that are not equipped with the same resources as the school in the Upper East Side. We have one sport, overworked teachers, lack of extracurricular activity activities, we don't even have a gym. How am I supposed to compete with students from schools that have several gyms, guidance counselors, clubs, sports, and all the tools that facilitate success in an allegedly free integrated education system? It's, an unfortunate, it's unfortunate that your access to quality ed education is dependent on your zip code or socioeconomic status. As a graduating senior, I never got the chance to explore different sports or take part in AP classes or elective classes that I might happen to enjoy. I was fortunate enough to, take a, to have a program like SEO that prepared me for college and fill in the gap that my school failed to. But in a diverse city with a system that advocates for no child left behind, think of how many kids you are leaving behind by choosing not to take action. Thank you. Um, hello. Oh, can you close this? Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, hello, my name is Ayana Smith, and I'm a senior at University Heights High School. In the fall, I'll be attending Cornell University. Um, and I'm a team leader at Teens Take Charge. I'm before you all today because our school system fails to reflect the students it serves academically. 
This year, I was fortunate enough to serve as a teaching assistant for my school's AP Calculus cohort. I was able to teach class content and offer in-class tutoring to a diverse set of students whose GPAs range from C to A+. I remember asking two of my classmates in the beginning of the first semester, do you understand the content? No, Ayana, it's confusing, they said. It was confusing not because they weren't smart, but because it was challenging. One student was a sophomore who didn't take any Algebra II or pre-calculus courses, and the other student had still been learning English, so sometimes they didn't understand what the teacher was saying. Both both had been at different levels in terms of GPA and knowledge. However, both had been motivated to do well. After working with them for another month, I wasn't surprised when they finally mastered derivatives. This is too easy, they exclaimed. Eventually, they were able to help the rest of their classmates, furthering the student engagement in the classroom. Through this experience, I was able to help some of my classmates believe that they can understand and pass the AP exam. Additionally, I was able to become better at calculus and better at explaining ideas and socializing. What was most valuable was being able was being able to witness learning firsthand. Learning is not meeting a numeric criteria, and learning is not how high you can rank relative to your peers. Learning is being in a space where people are different from you. Learning is being, in a, being challenged by the course content. Learning is being curious, eager, and vulnerable. Every student is capable of learning regardless of prior experience and knowledge within a subject, and every student should have the opportunity to teach as a form of learning. We are only truly aware of what we've learned when we explain it to someone else. We never get this opportunity when everyone in our room is at the same level as us. Implementing teens take charge as academic diversity thresholds for high schools, where at least 25% of all incoming students and no more than 75% of all incoming students pass their seventh grade ELA exam is essential to creating academically diverse student bodies where real learning can take place because academically inclusive schools helps everyone. My name is Toby Viperno. I'm a sophomore at Beacon High School and on the leadership team at Teens Take Charge. I ask you and everyone listening to support Teens Take Charge's enrollment equity plan to integrate New York City high schools. I've gone through my public school career in a bubble of privilege in terms of the resources I have access to and the people I encounter. Yet my dad, a high school teacher at a heavily under-resourced and segregated high poverty school, watches the students go through high school in a very different bubble, a bubble of limited resources. My dad comes back from a day of work and complains that after 16 years of trying to help kids, he is tired of his, his students not getting the support they need at school. Beacon is a school in the middle of Manhattan that is 25% low income and 50% white. At YCD, the school where my dad teaches, 87% of students are low income and it is 3% white. My dad's school isn't the only one of its kind. 237,000 students go to schools where at least 90% of students qualify for free or reduced price lunch. My school is the one that's out of place in this system. But it is not the only school of this kind. The few dozen other selective screened high schools like mine are also deeply segregated in terms of their student body's racial makeup and access to resources. In this school system, Intelligence is defined by your grades, test scores, and what school you attend, which, more than anything, is a measure of privilege. The students that, like me, who attend well-resourced schools with good academic, extracurricular, and social supports and opportunities, and who come from more affluent white families with social capital, with social capital and systemic savvy, receive more help than those who are born without the resources that have allowed me to succeed. A public school education system should have the goal of educating everyone to the best of its ability, not separating the affluent from the rest and setting the rest up to fail. For all those reasons and more, I once again ask the City Council to support Teens Take Charge's Enrollment Equity Plan, which outlines measures aimed at increasing school integration, including eliminating the SHSAT, setting academic diversity thresholds, and better supporting eighth graders in the high school admissions process. Thank you. My name is Tiffany Torres and I'm a junior at Pace High School and leader at Teens Take Charge. I'm constantly reminded that I cannot afford to fail in a system that works to sustain failure, a system that teaches low-income students of color that they are not enough and that the only way to escape the faded clutches of oppression and poverty, the only way to achieve a better life that at the end of the day isn't promised is working twice as hard. When the time came for me to apply to high school, the thought of applying to my zone school was discouraged by my school's administration. 
I was, in fact, encouraged to leave, to stray as far as possible from my neighborhood, from my district. I was told that there were better schools, schools with screens that were not accessible to my peers nor to myself. The first choice on my application was a prestigious high school on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, known for its stellar SAT scores, high graduation rate, extensive number of resources, a forever dwindling percentage of students of color, and a zone requirement. I live in a neighborhood dubbed the riskiest area in Brooklyn for children to grow up in, courtesy of New York Daily News. I was told the schools in my area, with graduation rates barely scraping 50%, lacked the resources I thought I needed to be successful. A serious lack of AP courses, few guidance counselors, and college advisors, combined with a system that fails to meet all of its promises, all contribute to New York City's increasing achievement and opportunity gaps. The schools in my immediate area do not have the tools their students need to achieve their dreams. And whose fault is that? I stand before the City Council today urging you all to take action not only to compensate for the experience of my generation and those before me, but for those who come after me, and for those who are currently being told that they have to work twice as hard for half as much. The job of the city council is to represent the people, take action for the students you are leaving behind, use your voice to fight against the injustices that thousands of students are facing each and every day. Join us in calling on the mayor and the DOE to approve our high school integration plan, which can be accessed at teenstakecharge.com by the end of this school year. We cannot afford to wait any longer. I, I, I just want to say, because I know Councilman Wander has a, has a question, I just want to say that I want to thank Teens Take Charge, and also I think Integrate NYC as well. Uh, the meeting that we had was very powerful and very informative. One of my criticisms of the administration was that, like, where I agree that the one test for specialized schools is problematic, but abolishing simply one test by itself is not a game changer for the entire system either. And you put forth very comprehensive and detailed, strong, thought out recommendations on integration in many different forms. And if you heard my testimony earlier, my opening statement about Murrow High School, what I experienced in my school, very diverse, both in terms of student body and also very diverse, rich curriculum. And so when I hear some advocates say, why can't all schools be like Brooklyn Tech or Sci?" I actually say, why can't more schools be like Murrow, a school that I experience, or schools that you experience, that, that you enjoy. So I truly, truly appreciate your leadership, and I agree, we must act now. We must act now. I will turn to my colleague, uh, Council Member Wynn. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Teens Take Charge, for being here today and for what you've been doing. I, I had the honor of joining you at the Schomburg and Brooklyn Public Library, and some of you presented at, at PS321, and uh, so I'm sold on your uh, high school admissions uh, proposal and, and on the ways in which you are demonstrating what we need to do and what we get out of it. And I just, you all spoke really uh, in smart ways. I, I wanna draw out a little more of the point, and I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but the young woman who spoke about the kind of tutoring and peer coaching, because I think one thing we haven't quite been able to get to enough today and is really important is to think about what, and the chair really got to this with some of the ideas of, of diverse, uh, diversity by achievement, if you haven't integrated a diverse classroom, diverse schools, you're going to have classrooms of diverse learners who are, you know, doing better and doing worse and a little more advanced at different subjects. And I think we have in our heads that if we bring people together, that like holds somebody back. And I think the story that you told about, like, obviously you first had to master the calculus material to be able to share it with someone. So it doesn't sound like it, the approach your school is taking held you back from gaining mastery. And then the ability to be that kind of peer mentor or peer coach that both helps you even better master the material, but also develop skills of team building and coaching and communication that are really valuable. So I, I just like to hear, you know, I, I think um, this is an important part of the vision here is like if we're not just moving bodies around or some kind of zero sum game, but imagining what it looks like to educate in more inclusive ways. Um, I'd just like to hear a little bit more on how you think we balance helping everybody do their best, right? Like helping people push themselves to, to develop skills they don't have and develop their talents while working across lines that recognize like people have different, different gifts at different times. So I was struck by what you said and would just love to hear a little bit more about it. Um, so 
I don't really know how to expand. I feel like um, in part of what I do, I asked my teacher last year since I passed the AP exam if I can work as a teaching assistant for this year. Um, and he said, yeah, sure. Um, and I guess the experience itself was like really eye-opening and it was just fun in general. Like when you're working with your peers, um, they, they seem more receptive of like feedback and I guess they learn better. Um, I've been told numerous times like we really like appreciate what you do and that the fact that you stay after hours with us. Um, and like we feel like sometimes the teacher doesn't necessarily understand like our questions, but since you're a student, you've sat in this room before and you know how the teacher teaches, having you as a resource is really valuable. Um, so I've been able to do that. Yeah. All right. Um, I just, you know, I, we're better at things you can measure, you know, like what goes up on a chart and, and we got a lot of room work to do on those things, but I think trying to figure out how we capture um, what happens if we get this right that is the adding up of the experience you had and making it something that's much more common in our schools is one really powerful thing that we shouldn't forget and I'm gonna take it away from this hearing. So thank you so much for sharing it. Yes, absolutely. And I thank you, Councilman Lander, uh, for noting about the various forms of enrichment opportunities that should exist in our schools and uh, more diversified, doing it the right way, not, not the, the Bloomberg or other folks way. But uh, I wanna know, in my conversations with Diane Ravitch, you know, she talked about the impacts of the Bloomberg administration's approach to create smaller schools, which also, uh, in, in a way, created smaller opportunities and really hurt public schools and, and many across neighbors across the system. So <coughs> there's still damage to undo as we're trying to move forward to make sure that we have a fully integrated, accessible school for, for, for all kids. So I, I, again, I really, truly appreciate your testimony. I know that this is not the first time that you've spoken on this issue, and it's time for folks to act. Thank you, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, Councilman King has a quick, yes. Um, I have more of a statement. I want to say thank you to each and every one of you. I've been working with you all uh, at a library when I was library chair, it's good to see you. But for the DOE who's still in here and UFT is still in the room, um, she made a valid point. I like the point that you made, my sister, about staying after school and talking with your peers. That should be a wake-up call because somewhere along the line in our school classrooms, there becomes a communication gap on how adults are talking to children where p their peers can educate them better sometimes once they understand it. So it's just something that we should be mindful of when we find out why children can say, well, I've been in a dinner class, so well, the teacher hates me. It's not the teacher doesn't hate you, it's just that the communication is not working, so they're not understanding. And an adult would get more frustrated than trying to dumb themselves, scale themselves back to figure out how to get the communication over to our children. And then it's reflective in, in a, a poor grade that they may give to a student. So thank you for being a peer leader, and a, hopefully one day you'll be leading the classroom and uh, you'll know how to get it right. Congratulations to you all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Truly Thank appreciate you. it. This actually Thank you for staying. Oh, absolutely. Um, the next panel I'd like to call up, and f full disclosure, I am a big fan, and I enjoy uh, listening to her, watching, seeing her on TV, and I s hope that she runs for office one day as well. Uh, Ma Maya Wiley, uh, Hazel Dukes, um, uh, Diana uh, Nor Noriega, and Matthew Gonzalez. I think whenever folks are ready, they, they may begin, sure. No, please help yourself to water because it's been a long day so far, so understood. <laughs>
Make sure the microphone is on. Speed dating begins. Um, thank you very much to all committee members. We are honored to be here. I'm Maya Wiley. I am one of the three co-chairs of the School Diversity Advisory Group. Hazel Dukes uh, is here as one of our co-chairs. Jose Calderon could not be with us. But can I ask everyone who's here who's part of the School Diversity Advisory Group in the audience to please stand? Because I think we have a very large representation, and I just want folks to Yay, thank you. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this and, um, so we uh, both um, are, we're all really, really excited and proud um, and thankful for this hearing. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that we're extremely thankful for the support we've gotten from the Department of Education. They have been amazing at supporting all of our requests for public engagement. We have had over 40 meetings. We have had uh, town halls in every single borough with 800 people total, and that was all because the Department of Education did not blink when we asked for the resources and support to do this in a way that built a transparent process with the public uh, as a group of 45 very diverse stakeholders that we believe represent the city of New York. Uh, and the building of trust, I think, was critical to get us to a point where we could make recommendations as a very diverse group that we can all stand behind. And we think that models something that we need to accomplish what we just heard our students say we need to do. And I want to acknowledge the advisory group for that. Thank you. Uh, so just very quickly, we've asked that our full February report be put into the record. So thank you for accepting that into the record. We just want to emphasize some high points of our 73 recommendations that we made um, for a diverse school system. And the first is that we used the framework that you have heard from students today, the five R's. The schools are here for our students and they have to reflect that. But secondly, we said admissions should, in three years, schools should look like their district, in five years they should look like their borough, and in ten years they should look like the city. The, D the Department of Education's goals need to be more aggressive. Um, but we also recognize there's resources, accountability, and metrics. Students have to be included in that accountability. We've attached the metrics we were proposing in the testimony. I will stop to honor the time limits of the committee. And you should uh, feel free to continue. We don't want to cut you off. I, we're really grateful for, for you all being here today. We're grateful for the enormous amount of time and energy and expertise and service that every one of the members of this really sterling group has put together. My comments earlier uh, to the chancellor were in no way um, a denigration of this group. It was more just an accountability measure that when you come to the city council, you have to answer our questions when you're under oath. You can't say, well, answer those questions to another group. So it was in no way a criticism of the incredible work that you all have done. And I would love for uh, either you, Maya, who is amazing, uh, or the other group, my good friend, Dr. Hazel Dukes, or anyone else who's here, if there are other things you want to talk about uh, that you think that we should know about in the context of the conversation, you have plenty of time. Don't feel under the gun uh, by the clock. Well, I appreciate that, and we, we definitely felt under the gun, but mostly to honor how many important people there are here to, to offer testimony. Um, the accountability, I, I would just say a little bit more, I, we, you know, we said the goals need to be much more aggressive. Um, we did recognize in admissions that it really is critically important to take what I think we just heard the UFT speak to, an engaged process with community about what will work, because not our, all our communities look alike, and we really recognized that as an advisory group, and so in those first three years really recommended that there be resource supports like we saw, thanks to Councilmember Lander's leadership in District 15, having a very engaged community process for districts on those first three-year goals. Now, we have to work also past the first three years, and that's why we also talked about resources and accountability. It's really, in terms of accountability, much too difficult for parents and students to understand how the Department of Education is doing on its goals, not because it doesn't have a lot of data, it has and produces and makes public a lot of data. It's just very hard to find and to track and to put it all together. And so part of our, our metrics are make it accountable by putting it all in one place in a simple 
way for parents and students to find how we're doing in our schools around integration, around uh, educational opportunity, around staffing. We were very happy to hear the chancellor say that he was supportive of diversifying the teaching population because that is one of our recommendations. It's one of the five R's that students have asked for and we endorse that. We also had suggested it be tracked. So as Councilmember Traeger, you mentioned, that is also in our recommendations. So we were happy to hear that. Um, and I think you know the resourcing is critically important as, as everything we've already heard. It is simply not sufficient uh, to say, that we're gonna look at how the classroom looks without looking at whether all classrooms have the same kind of opportunities for advanced placement classes, for advanced science, including in middle schools, uh, for gyms, for sports, for arts, for music. All of those are not, in, I, I hate the word enrichment personally, that's just personal. Um, it's not enrichment, it's central and core to educational opportunity. Uh, and so too many of our students aren't getting that. So it isn't enough just to look at the bodies in the room, but what is in the room with those bodies. Um, I'll stop there and um, I don't know if Hazel, you want to First, let me say thank you, Mr. Speaker and the Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Speaker, for coming back because I was gonna come by your office. <laughs> I knew that would happen if I didn't come back. I wanna say that I have given my adult life to education. Anyone in this city know that I have fought hard. I've been in court systems, the NAACP in the 60s brought a suit against New York City. And I was on the verge of going there. I was surprised that I was asked to be a part of this group since I'm such an activist. Cause I believe in action. I believe in action. And I believe, as the UFT say, in this space, we can act with your leadership as a speaker, with you, an educator. You know, sometimes we don't have educators in this conversation. You been a, have been a teacher, you understand what our children need. I want to point out that when we went through every borough, I want to say that Councilman King, we had a little spat outside, but I want to give Councilman, Councilman King credit. Out of all the boroughs I went to, he was the only elected official that I saw. He was there in his community. He was there with his teachers and his principals. I think what was said this morning earlier, we all have to be in this game to get it right. But I want to personally thank you, Speaker, for the leadership that you have let this city council provide. I wasn't here five years ago, Councilman Larris, when you all had, that must have been a charade, because if I'd have been here, you wouldn't have just talked over integration and segregation in this school system. And I want you to know, it's nothing about, I want it on the record, this is not a fight against any group. This is for all the children in the city of New York. It's not a fight. I don't want my Asian brothers and sisters to think this is a fight. The 110 year organization that I represent, the NAACP, every time that we've broken down segregation, all of us have been better for it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Duke. It's good to see you, thank you. So we're gonna speak as our separate organizations, even though we're members of the SDAG. Um, so my name is Diana Noriega. I'm the Chief Program Officer at the Committee for Hispanic Children and Families. We recognize the highly charged nature of the discussion and intentionally enter the space as an advocate for educational equity reform that impacts and benefits all students. Educational equity is about access, inclusion, quality, and opportunity. It must be undergirded by justice. We must ensure that the most historically marginalized communities amongst us have access to the same resources that the top 5 to percent 
top five to 10% of our students do. We want a system that has equitable inputs from birth through post-secondary education. And on the path to achieving it, we know that there are systemic issues that we have to address. The expansion of gifted and talented, increasing the number of middle school DOE test prep programs, as well as keeping the Shazat exam as the sole indicator of admittance to highly, highly selective public schools are not the solution to solve our problem. Currently, GNT programs only benefit 2.5% of New York City students with vast differences in access and underprivileged communities compared to those who are privileged and well-resourced. Black and Latino students make up 70% of the New York City population, yet only represent 18% of the students in gifted and talented programs across the city. That's atrocious. 0% of the students in the South Bronx, Cortona Park, Bed-Stuy, Brownsville, East New York have seats in GNT programs. We side with research that demonstrates the problematic nature of using a single measure to gauge academic capabilities of any child and certainly take issue with subjecting children to that type of high-stake testings at the age of four years old. If you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. We have to find a system that meets the various needs of all of our students. In line with our view that no one indicator can determine the intelligence or academic abilities or aptitude of a child, we believe the Shazat should be ultimately abolished. We believe that admissions to specialized high schools should be layered and reflect the general practice at highly selective colleges, many of whom are actually moving towards a test optional admissions policy. The Shazat was created in 1970, 1971, the law supporting it, which we know supported a segregated educational system. And so we are hoping that the mayor and the chancellor take our recommendations that we're making that would benefit the entire system, not just the top one, five to 10%, particularly the Shazat, which only works with 6% of New York City public school students. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Uh, hello, uh, thank you. My name is Matt Gonzalez. I'm director of the School Diversity Project for New York Appleseed. Um, as Diana said, um, I'm speaking uh, as a member of New York Appleseed, and, um, but I'm also, uh, to disclose myself, a member of the School Diversity Advisory Group. Um, and so I just want to start off by saying uh, thank you for hosting this conversation. Um, I was at the last hearing a couple years ago, and by this time of the day, there are about three members in the actual room, and so we really appreciate um, that many of you really care about this conversation and have, have come to the table to join us in, in fighting for this work. Um, I want to make a few points before we go forward. Um, first, as we have these really difficult conversations, I think I want to urge and challenge all of us not to, to, to resist the, the kind of the urge to resort to um, making policy or making recommendations based on fear, based on the premise of scarcity of resources, or based on, based on an idea that some kids in communities who have been underserved just need to get what the white kids have. I think those, this system as it exists now is broken. It has always been broken, and if we just say we're gonna give um, our poor black and Latinx students what the white kids have, we're still playing in a, in a game of scarcity. And so I, I really wanna challenge all of us to think bigger and bolder because the work of integration is not just about getting what the white kids have or what the kids with privilege have, it's about getting every single one of our children in this city in this country a better educational experience that'll lead to a tremendous uh, wealth of life and, and community outcomes. And I want us to really shift our work towards meeting that goal of, of making all of our schools better for all of our kids. Um, Appleseed and our student-led partner at Integrate NYC have long understood that integration is more than moving bodies. It's about moving resources. It's about moving curriculum and pedagogy. It's about moving discipline policies away from disproportionality. It's about moving our recruitment and retainment of teachers and faculty uh, to ensure that our, our, our staff re reflect our students. And that's why we align and endorse all 73 of the recommendations outlined in the School Diversity Advisory Group's report. Um, lastly, um, I think what, you know, most of the conversation over the last few months, maybe the last six months, have centered around uh, eight schools. And we are really committed to the 99% of the schools that serve all of our young people. And we really want to ensure that as we're talking about these eight schools, that is just the tip of the iceberg. And so what we have 
have at Appleseed have advocated for is the abolishment and the removal of segregated middle school screened admissions because what we know is that 14 of the 15 middle schools who supply half of the students to the specialized high schools are not open or accessible to this city. And so what we know is that the, the process of integration is not about busing kids around the city today. Um, maybe that's for tomorrow, but today it's about removing structural barriers to, barriers to access that were designed to create and facilitate and maintain a segregated system. So join us in removing barriers to access, screens, gifted and talented programs, other selective and exclusionary admissions methods that only provide access and support for a select group of students. Let's open up access to all of our great resources to all of our young people together. Thanks. Thank you very much. Any questions from any? Yes, Brad. Councilman Lander. Thank you, uh, and thank you guys all for being here and for pushing. I, you know, I do want to note the School Diversity Advisory Group has has overperformed the expectations that we had for it, and I want to give you guys credit. You know, we did that first hearing five years ago. We were in this. We got this denial from DOE. We did pass two bills out of it: one requiring information and annual report, and the other a resolution Councilmember Torres sponsored, calling on the DOE to put forward a plan for combating school segregation. And it took two and a half years uh, before they, in June 2017, came out with the plan that called for the creation of School Diversity Advisory Group. But it was a milk toast plan, and some of you up there were joined with us in criticizing the fact that it did not it was not bold, it was not ambitious, it didn't set ambitious targets. Uh, nonetheless, you took up the challenge of joining the group, of leading the group, of building the group, uh, and the fact that you've been able, on the one hand, to work productively with the DOE, but on the other hand, to put forward 73 pretty ambitious recommendations um, that we know are independent because they weren't immediately ready to say yes to uh, is a pretty good thing. So I, I want to give you credit here. The work that's organizing, that's getting some support from inside, but that is building a big, broad coalition to push us is really significant here. So I, I want to say I appreciate it. So I guess my question is this. You heard earlier, and, and the speaker uh, drama, you know, underlined some of the challenges, like the chancellor was not ready. Uh, I know you've got more coming in June, but he could have said, yes to those pieces of your, I'm sure you wouldn't have objected if he had said yes to recommendations you made that he was ready to sign on to. Um, but I, I guess I want to ask you it this way, I, I, you know, if, if the DOE, either on what you've already done or what you've done in June, comes out and says, yes, we endorse them, I assume you will celebrate uh, and roll up the sleeves to, to get the work done and keep moving forward. Uh, where the DOE says no or can't or wait, Will you work with us to keep pushing forward to make sure that the recommendations you're making continue to be that North Star, uh, even if there's more organizing and pushing to do? Well, thank you for the easy question, because <laughs> it's an easy one. Yes. Um, this diversity advisor group, I, I, you know, I want to underscore what a privilege it has been to be a part of, um, because it has worked really hard. It, we have challenged each other. We have not always been in agreement. We've had to work through and understand when we have different positions. Our principles and our goals have been the same. Let me just say that. Um, but the how and the what, you know, there's a lot of area for debate. And we, we and I want to say with participation from staff of DOE, meaning principals, teachers, um, people who are doing the equity and inclusion work within DOE have given us information. They've given us honest their honest take on what some of the challenges are of implementation, which is important to understand. Uh, that's why we did short term versus medium and long term, like recognizing what can get done effectively now and what takes more time. Uh, that process was really, really important, but it means when we penned that 116 page report, there is not one minority report attached to it. That's because we all felt we could all sign our names to that report. Whatever DOE says or does doesn't change where the School Diversity Advisory get Group is on our recommendations. Great, thank you. And I, I didn't. I want to honor the look. The DOE took some risks in establishing the group and giving it independence and in providing the data and providing the support. I gave the chancellor credit. You know, I'll give him credit again. So, and I, th I think there's an opportunity created. Um, and we need to use it as a roadmap to keep pushing. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor King. Um, thank you all again for 
the long months, hours, years, conversations. Um, and I, and I, my question goes in the state of, um, I've said earlier, and I, and I will double back to your conversation as well, young man, in regards to it's a system that was designed to make sure there's not no equity. From day one, this is a system, it goes back to the system of America. So you know, Malcolm X says, only a fool will let his enemy teach his children. So my question is, as you come up with all these suggestions, if you're finding that you're getting pushback from the DOE on your recommendations, what would be your course of action? Because again, if the enemy is in the system of oppression, of educating our children, you may have the right solution, but someone in that room might say, nah, because I can't figure out how to join the party. Well, I think what we're hoping for, and certainly what we've seen to date, is um, honesty on the part of the Department of Education on what they tell us when they tell us something, right? Meaning where they are, what they're struggling with, where they see challenges, where they see opportunity. Our expectation is that when we hear back from the, from the chancellor about his views on our recommendations, which we will hopefully hear very soon, um, if there are recommendations they are not going to accept, we're, our request is to tell us why. In other words, we're not going to just stop with no, uh, and our relationship has been such that we don't really, I, personally, uh, I, don't, I don't have any fear that they won't say why they disagree with the recommendation or why they feel they can't implement it or why they might delay it. Um, and I think we will, at that point, be able to be more reflective on what we would do next. I think it would be premature without hearing from them first to say what we would do if there's disagreement because they may raise something we didn't consider. Um, it may be that they're saying, we don't think we can do it now, but we think we can do this other recommendation more aggressively if we focus on it. You know, it, de it depends on what they say. But I think to your point, the, the group has very much been rethinking schools. <laughs> In mm -hmm. other words, we haven't been sitting around having a discussion about tinkering. We have been having a discussion about the vision exactly as you've heard all day long, the vision for a school system that works for every single one of our children, no matter what language they speak, no matter how they learn, no matter where they were born, no matter, no matter where they, what part of the city they live in, that's our vision. And if it doesn't work, then our recommendations are gonna be to change it. I wanna thank you for that. And if there's any individuals that are getting in the way, we can tell them, thank you, go sell Amway, whatever it is. All right, but well, thank you. Thank you. Council Levine. Uh, Council Levine. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and Mr. Chair, and thank you to this panel for your incredible work on this issue, and having spoken to several of you individually, and of course having read the report, a recurring theme, and, and you just mentioned it, uh, Ms. Wiley, is, uh, is, is the need to improve every school, and that requires resources, and you've articulated that. Um, and when I talk to parents in, in, in schools in my district, that's um, generally the starting point. Um, we have articulated in our city council budget response, as the speaker very powerfully uh, reiter reiterated earlier in the hearing, um, a list of ways the city could, through targeted investments, um, have more adequate resourcing in schools than ways that I think you care about, from school social workers to renovating bathrooms to after-school programs. And um, we're very disappointed that the mayor's executive budget did not include any of those priorities. And I would like to hear from you about your priorities for resources, what we should be fighting for in the budget in the next uh, two months, uh, so that we, we deliver for the, the, the young people that you are trying to do right by? During this process, Councilman, uh, I think you know me very well. And I think that uh, Mayor Wiley said it. We didn't sit around tinkling. We know this is an urgent matter now. We are citizens of this city. We vote in this city. We will have some input individually what we say to our elected officials and where they stand. We have been talking about equity 
for, and that mean resources. So as a citizen of this city, as an advocate, whatever it takes for this to begin, we will be working individually, not just as a member of this advisory group, but individually to see that it is an urgent matter and our children need to be saved now, all children. Um, ditto. Uh, but I, what I wanted to point to, we obviously, when we were developing these recommendations and resources as a category of recommendation, we didn't, um, it, it was one of the areas we also wanted to spend some more time with, just because we weren't looking at it from the perspective of the budget, right? We were looking at it from the perspective of what do all our schools need to have? But I will say that what the things we were very explicit about, for instance, is there really is no student in the school system who should not have the opportunity, for example, for advanced math and science curriculum based on what school they're in. If you're in a middle school in the Bronx and you're able to, ha to, to you're ready for an advanced math or science course, you should be able to get that advanced math or science course. So that, and, and of course we talked about arts and sports and music as critical components of a high quality education that too many of our school children don't have. I would also point to our, our proposed metrics um, for accountability, where we really think it's important also to make more visible. I mean, I think one of the challenges is understanding what the resourcing is and how it is getting allocated by school and program. So in our metrics, our proposal to the department was in addition to tracking race, uh, you know, um, socioeconomic status, uh, multi-language learners, students with disabilities, you know, the, the admissions, uh, we're also tracking whether or not, uh, what the resources or funding are by school, so that it's being broken down by school, the access to advanced coursework by school, um, the facilities available, the way the budget breaks down on arts and music spending. So we've, we've actually suggested that the accountability metrics make much more visible to parents and students what the resource allocations are by school and by program because it, it, it's another way of assessing whether there's some adjustments that should be made. Mr. Chair, we haven't talked much about the legislation in the package as part of this hearing, but I just want to flag, you and I both have bills in this package that speak to aligning the accountability and the reporting with our goals, and we should make sure to work with the folks up here to make sure that that legislation really aligns with the kind of accountability so, that is being talked about by the panelists. To just add to what Maya said, I think the reason we also distinguish by program is because you also have different programs within the same school right. that have access to different uh, resources. Or, or so, segregation within right. a school building right. where you yes. it looks right. diverse Absolutely. if you're watching who walks in the front door, but then if you go see who's in the G&T class, right. who's in the ICT class, and who's in the gen ed mm -hmm. class, you still have segregated classrooms exactly. inside, which is heartbreaking on its own. So all those things will be helpful, right. and, and I'm certainly committed. I know the, the chair and the speaker and the other sponsors would want to work with you to make sure we line up the accountability and reporting in ways that accord with those goals. Wait, uh, thank you all again very much for your leadership and continued work, work on, on these critical issues. Just. Just curious to, to note for the record, when the mayor did r roll out his plan for the specialized high schools last year, I guess through a press conference, did he, did he consult with this diversity advisory group uh, about his event? Uh, I, uh, we learned about the proposal and the rollout on Friday, and I believe it was announced on Sunday. R right, uh, I guess the question is did no. they <laughs> that my, my point is we learned about it right. uh, ap after it had been been crafted. Correct, and, and, and that speaks volumes more ways than one because this group was put together really to look at, as the Chancellor notes, systems and structures throughout the DOE that have been served as barriers, uh, and to not consult with this very group is highly problematic, in addition to not consulting with a variety of stakeholders, including this council as well. Um, because I note that in the list of recommendations, there's not, uh, there's not a mention at this time of the special, specialized schools. I assume that's because folks were not consulted uh, about that proposal. Is that, is that correct? Well, so let me back up one step. Um, the 
the way we have been approaching recommendations as a group is to look at the system holistically. Right. So it's just not the way we've been working to just pull out a handful of high schools. We, right. We've, in fact, we have um, another report coming out in June uh, uh, that, well, we hope in June, <laughs> knock on wood, um, but we're working very hard to get to June because we have been trying to be very intentional about taking the time to be making sure we're research-based, looking at unintended consequences, understanding the data, getting as much data as we can, having an engaged process with the public, that we're looking at screens and gifted and talented programs kindergarten through 12th grade. So we will be making some recommendations, we hope, around screens and gifted and talented programs very shortly, right. but system-wide. So it, uh, by definition, it may touch on um, the Shazat and specialized high schools, but we just have been looking at the system as a whole. Right. Um, and not, and, and it, it would never have been the way we had talked about it to only talk about the specialized high schools. Right, and, and, and I'll close by saying I met recently with uh, another education hero of mine, Diane Ravitch, who is a, is a fan uh, of, I know it might not be popular in the Bloomberg, Bloomberg's world, uh, the large comprehensive schools because they offer a variety of, of rich programs and opportunities for all of our kids. And so I'm curious to know if, if there's any opinion at this time or in future time on, uh, on the admissions policies that Murrow experienced when, when I went to Murrow High School, cl class of 2000, where Diane Ravitch talked about the, the EDOP uh, program, the EDOP approach, um, a, a very uh, academic integration, which actually touched upon other forms of integration as well in the school. Mm -hmm. Has that been discussed yet, or is that something that you're looking at? This, with the well, yes, we've asked for data on EDOP schools, and we're trying to get as much data as possible to understand all the different opportunities we have to ensure right. really high quality. Because I'll just note that I experienced both a very diverse student body, but also a very diverse, rich curriculum, mm -hmm. which I really appreciated, which helped shape my teaching career as well. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to give a shout out to Murrow and the ed op approach as well. And I, again, I thank, I thank the entire panel. Thank you. Can I make one, uh, one yeah, point please. about the ed opt idea? I mean, I'm speaking for yeah. uh, McIntosh from Appleseed, not for the SDAG. Um, I think one challenge with um, like really innovative ideas around th that, that uh, focus on educational option models is that when you have a system, uh, particularly in high schools, of hierarchies, where you have the like the screen, the highly selective screens, less selective screens, ed op models, right. and you have this kind of system of, of hyper competition, um, the the kind of theory of action behind the ed op model, I think it's undermined in a lot of ways. And right. so I think part of what you know the conversations we've been trying to have is like, what do we, how do we design and, and really vision a uh, a system of schools that serve every single person's needs, um, that but that also ensure that uh, we're we're capturing and 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 really engaging the full wealth of diversity that, that this city has to offer offer and so um, you know I think you know we want to definitely engage in, in thinking through where where do models like uh, ed opt fit into uh, a large system of high schools um, but I think as we as we look at the the kind of tiered system of high schools we have um, you know the reliance on um, certain models over others I think is going to continue to kind of create this 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 over competition that um, I think undermines the the vision and values of public education Great points, noted. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you to the entire panel. Truly, truly appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, I, I know the, the next panel that we're going to call up. I think some folks might require some uh, translation services, which which we will provide. Uh, I'd like to. Uh, uh, Chang uh, King Zhang. I think the last name is uh, Sh Sh Shazang. Shazang. Wu Dae Kwan. Zhang uh, Chang King. Uh, Zhu Hui Ni, and oh, thank you.
，第一个名字许慧恩，第二个名字郑长青，第三个名字常清征，第四个名字兼秀章。刘德全、秀江Ah uh, yes, I, I read a statement for a mom. And yeah, I'm okay. You want me to read it, or you want me to do one? I I read and then you can. Okay, sure, no problem. Okay, then where should I sit? You should sit here. Okay. Okay. Mm. Yeah, I I read a statement for a mom who uh want has to go back to pick her kids up. So, um, um, my name is Xiu Jiang. My name is Xiu Jiang. Uh, I'm a low-income family. I'm a full-time mom, and I'm from the low-income family. But I don't want my child to be a low income anymore. I wish they would do it better than me. I want him to be the person who can help the community. Um, 所以我觉得教育是唯一的让我孩子成为，呃，可以帮助社区的人的方法。So I think about that education is the most important to my child to help another people. 嗯，我把我所有的时间都花在我的小孩身上。I spend all my time to my child. 我希望我帮助他养成爱读书的习惯。I would help him to be have um most important thing is to be more time to read. Ah, 我更注意让孩子学好数学 I will let him to focus and concentrate in uh learning the math. 我相信特殊高中是好学校 I I believed special high school is uh very important to him. Um. 特殊高中考试并不难，只要孩子用心努力学习，就可以考上。Specialized high school is not very difficult. He just need to be focused and concentrate, and they will get it. Um, 如果孩子们都努力学习，纽约市的教育水平就会更好。If all the kids can study hard, the New York education will be become better. Ah.、Uh, 如果每个学校都是好学校，就没有特殊高中考试。特殊高中这一说了。If all the school is the best school, it doesn't have a specialized high school in New York City. 嗯、um, ，我我非常不懂，为什么要分亚裔小孩和非裔小孩呢？ I really doesn't understand why we need to be separate to say, oh, you are the Asian kids, oh, you are the African American kids. We all American child children. We we all have a uh, sorry, we we do have a American dream. We all have American dream. We do want to have a better America. We would like to have the better America. Thank you. Thank you so much.
对，就是这个。嗯，大家好，我是一个两个孩子的家长，一个普通的低收入的家长。Hello, I have a、uh, two children and I have a low-income family. I'm from the low-income family. 我也是一个英文并不好的第一代移民。I'm the first generation immigrant, and my English is not that well. 不然，不然我也不需要翻译了。If not, I don't need translation service. OK， 我放下今天的工作来到这里，是因为我认为现在的市长和教育总监推动的这个教育改革取消 SHAT， 它其实是一个房间里的大象。Right now, I give up to work today. I come here. I want to represent myself. The the specialized high school test is very important to our family. Uh, I mean, the room in the the Edison in the room. Oh, and also the uh Edison and the room. 那我直接的说吧 ，I'm straightforward. 取消 S H T I T 的改革是针对亚裔的歧视。I think about that. You you cancel the uh the P S H S H A T. It's kind of not fair to our Asian population. 是市长为了他自己自私的利益，以及掩盖他的教育失败而推动的这个违反常识的做法。I think this is uh the our the mayor is selfish, and he would give up. He 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 give up himself to represent his doesn't do very well in his representative in the education in New York City. 一个显而易见、不言而喻的常识。A very basic thing is. 测试是一种检验，而检验是保证质量的必要手段。Test is give the people have a testing who they representative is positive. 在我们的社会里。In our community, testing is unparalleled. Testing everywhere, including our cell phones. If there is no testing, it cannot be used. Even though we are not using the cell phone, we need to test if it works or not. Another simple thing is, America is a fair market economy. United States is fair for everyone. It's good for everybody. 不是个结果平等的共产主义国家。It's not a communism country. 肤色与学习无关，肤色也与科学无关。Your skin color it doesn't equal to your education. Your skin color is not equal to your rich or poor. 任何强调肤色比例的人，我认为他们都是种族主义者。I think about the, all the people who is based on the the, the face color, the, the skin color, is not fair, is unequal. It's racist. It's racist. Yeah. 想一想，现在市长想要操弄的，他们并不是关心学生真正学到了什么。Right now, the mayor, the discussion, the point is not they really want the ch children has the best education. 他们只关心他们的肤色的比例。They just care about the percentage of uh their the skin color. 想一想美国现在的战略对手的国家。Think about who is uh another side of the American. 那些追赶的国家正快速的追上美国。Those country is step by step to close to the United States. 他们靠的是美国错换先贤们的艰苦奋斗。是更高标准的考核，更加艰苦的学习。Because those country is using a very uh strong testing score to testify their the children， 而不是那种所谓的快乐的无害的学习。It's not using something is for enjoyable education。为了美国的未来，我们必须要坚持高标准的考试。For the future of our America, we should be have the highest standard of the testing. New York Times report. New York Times report. 二零一四年，市长拨款一点五亿美元。In the 2014, the mayor is gift a budget for a hundred forty million dollar. 要改进九十四所学校。
to go to uh, change the 94 different schools in New York City. So he spent those money and the time, it's only three schools has changed. So to school education changing is so slow. Maybe our mayor is for his future to do something not appropriated. I have two children. I only have a public education source. I do not have a discover program. I do not have a private school source. I think they can through the test to change their life. 市长的改革后, 我想问, so after the change of the mayor, they make the decision. Top 7 How could you 100% sure those top 7% of the children, of the students, they are all equal? 如何确定所谓的贫困指数? How to make a decision of the low income? How if they are not the, seven, the top of the 7% and they do not have the one, 187 those are school or discovery program, what do they do? Department of Education is supposed to be uh, maintain the quality of the education. It's not just like a, a preschool to give a candy to the kids. 这不是教育, uh, That's not a game of number. Life is very difficult and challenge. Just like on the picture around this room. Only working hard, then we can be changed our life. Only tests can change our the children's future. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Rukou, do you want to do you want to just uh, clarify? The, the translation is okay. It's not perfect, but it's okay. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. It's it's not 100 percent, but but it's close. And and also, if there's testimony uh, that they have, uh, as he's reading from, we'd like to receive everything as well, and we'll make sure it's translated 100 percent. Correctly. Uh, all his family is, uh, is low income, and he also currently is uh, in the low income also. And also he will try to help uh, his, uh, her parents to get some like financial support. He lost the chance to continue the education. Uh, he, he lost the chance, and at the moment, he applied for a job, and looking for the job to work in that, to help her parents. Now, right now, I have three kids in my family. They are two kids in sixth grade, and one is uh, first grade. 
。我很庆幸我的小孩很热爱学习。I'm so grateful that all my kids like to start like that learning that in school. 嗯，我的最小的小孩一年级，他通过了天 gift and talent 考试。呃 ，my little little Charles has passed the gift and talent. Uh, gift and talent the the test. 但是因为位置有限。However. I mean, the, the qualify is uh, limited. We are still waiting for that. Not sure so far what the status. I hope the Department of Education can offer more chance, even opportunity, to give those cho to give all those child. 对不起，没事。那那每个孩子都受到更更全面的教育。Uh, hopefully, all the kids can have a kind of chance to learn it. 不是废除考特殊高中考试制度。It's not to abolish the SHSAT uh, examination. 我是一个妈妈，我知道小孩需要更好、更丰富的知识。Um, I know I'm a mother, and I know that the children that my child needs more support and help. 这样才能成为对社会、国家更有用的公民。Then therefore, that my child can be a useful in society and helping this country, um, to be a better citizen. 谢谢。Thank you. Um, I, I thank you very much for you. Oh, oh yeah. It's okay, you translate it. Oh, okay. <laughs> translate what I said. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, I thank you for today that, that you, you have come here even though you have taken a day off from your work and uh, we're very grateful that you have came here to speak. Uh, I, I think no, no, I do that. I think it's important for um, mainstream Americans to understand uh, new immigrants' uh, uh, the situation, because they, most of them are first-generation immigrants. They work hard. They are low-income families, but they want their children to do better. That's why they want to keep the test, right? So, so that their children have a chance to go to school and through education they can. Uh, get a, go to college and then get better jobs and become uh, outstanding citizens of our community. I know that many of these parents are the first generation immigrants. They don't have any education, so they are very hard working. They want their children to get better education, so they are the first As you can see, all of them they don't have privilege. No平均。你你你看見這些家長其實就是從貧困家庭其實也沒有就是很豐厚的底子。They work hard, they work minimum wage jobs, they work in restaurants, laundries. 他們都是洗衣店啊、餐館,就是在那些低層的工作崗位來在工作。So if it, if their children can do it, I hope the local born children they can learn from them. No, work hard, study hard, have a goal, and you will succeed. Uh, 就是你看这些孩子都是很努力的去为他们的将来而奋斗。我也希望其他孩子可以跟他们一样的学习，就是为了他们的将来的目标而奋斗的。Thank you. Uh, 谢谢。Thank you very much. And again, if there's anything that was not uh, 
translated correctly prior, we want to get, get the accurate accounts. So yeah. if there's anything, uh, written testimony or any follow-up conversation, I'd be happy to meet with folks just to make sure we get the right information. Thank, thank you, Councilman Ku, for, for your leadership and oh. support as well. 那我知道可能之前翻译如果有些不正确的话之后写证词的话可以翻译的时候可以更准确一点如果觉得有什么没有讲清楚的也可以来我的办公室去讲清楚的谢谢 And also I just want to just give some historical context here as well because uh, again this is like the former history teacher me but the Chinese speaking community is not a new community in this country 那我想要讲一下背景历史背景因为我也是历史老师那我也知道就是华人的也不是就是他们也不是就是新来美国的一个民族The Chinese actually also helped build the United States of America as well 很多亚裔还有中国的家庭也是帮助建立起这个国家的 And you know we heard earlier testimony from students which I Appreciated the history on it, the uh, the famous Supreme Court case Brown versus Board of Education. One of the cases that Brown overturned was actually a case that was uh, decided in 1927, based out of Mississippi. Uh, the case was titled, I believe, Lum versus Rice, where Mississippi was systematically and intentionally excluding Chinese students from entering pu public schools. And that was one of the cases that Brown also overturned in addition to Plessy, Plessy versus Ferguson. Um, and so I just want to just give context that um, to be mindful of, of, of the sensitivities around this issue that, and also that the Chinese speaking community is not new to America. Uh, no, no. They, they're a part of the American experience as well. 我只想给一下历史背景就是以前一九六几年的时候我们推翻种族歧视就是说歧视性的一些学校的时候其实最那个案子是追随到一九二七年在米西西比州的时候其实也同时推翻了那个时候排除华人学校去跟白人一起共同
So that is a process um, point that I would like to mention. And I was a little bit mystified by all the comments against the DOE. I'm not the best friends with the DOE, but since the uh, new chancellor arrived last April, it has been a very different DOE. I have been working closely with the chancellor and his um, management staff, top level staff, and it feels very different. They are listening, and I do genuinely believe the chancellor wanted to integrate our schools and end the segregation that has been the trademark of our public education system ever since it started. So I trust the DOE's willingness to do the right thing. I think, from where I'm standing, it is the mayor who is holding things back. This is mayoral control. The mayor is accountable. If things are not happening, then we have to hold the mayor accountable. We have to ask him why things are not moving forward. So that was something I wanted to mention. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that we have existing established parent leadership structures like CPAC and the ECC and the CECs and citywide education councils. If we are to move forward with establishing these bodies to look at the school diversity advisory groups or any other task force of that sort, I urge the city council to actually consult with those established parent leadership organizations to recommend people to sit on the task force, as well as in drafting the bills. We have a lot to offer. We are the parents on the ground. We see our kids go to school every day. We know what's happening from the parents' perspective. So I appreciate that the parents are included in various task force memberships, but in selection of the parents, I think it would be a good idea to use the established structures. And I support the uh, reporting bills on the demographics wholeheartedly. We need those reports, both for teachers and students. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Traeger and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Adam Lubinsky. I'm managing principal at WXY Studio. Um, WXY Studio uh, recently helped facilitate the community-led process in District 15. Uh, we also performed research for District 1 a few years back and have worked with Boston Public Schools. This work has been uh, inspiring and humbling, um, and uh, it is also partly an outgrowth for, of uh, PhD work that I did about 10 years ago. So uh, we believe strongly in it, um, and we wanted to share uh, four quick observations and then uh, four thoughts going forward. Uh, on observations, uh, one, um, through research that we've done, it has become clear that assignment policies that emphasize choice uh, without uh, standards to create racial and socioeconomic diversity tend to create more dissimilar schools. Uh, that was certainly the case uh, in our research in District 1. Assignment policies that utilize school screens tend to create more dissimilarity between schools. That really was uh, clear in the work in District 15. Um, Changing assignment policies is clearly a very challenging process. Uh, I really want to advocate for community-based uh, work, including the creation of working groups uh, that have a separate ability to set out their own recommendations. Uh, I think that the work that was done in District 15, which had a lot of groundwork laid by uh, Councilmember Lander's office and advocates, really made for a much smoother process. And then finally, in terms of observations, combining uh, community-based processes that look at integration in combination with inclusion efforts really brings more people into the process. So very quickly, four considerations moving forward. Um, D15 spurred changes to the integration policies in terms of admissions. Uh, they need to look at how the, uh, the inclusion recommendations are followed up on much more clearly. Uh, second, um, we should all assume that school zones aren't static, and so there could be a periodic review of school zones. Uh, third, I think we should look at uh, a logical link between the level of schooling, elementary, middle, and high school, uh, and their geographic context and how community-based processes are run. Elementary linking with neighborhood level, middle schools linking with districts, high schools linking with citywide. And then finally, I want to make a point that 
planning our schools uh, affects the way our cities are planned. This isn't a one-way street where housing sets up uh, segregated schools, they both uh, infect each other. Um, and so when we think about rezoning our neighborhoods, we also have to think about uh, the nature of our schools. Uh, and that carries over to how we conduct our environmental review process, which right now only looks at uh, numbers of seats, but should also look at the effect on, uh, on school integration. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon all. Thanks for sticking in, sticking in there, right? These are long days. Um, so my name is Maria Bautista. I'm the Campaigns Director for the Alliance for Quality Education. We're a statewide education advocacy organization that intentionally centers racial justice as part of our mission and vision. And that's what brings us here today. Um, I specifically want to talk about the, the Shazat. Um, and as a city, we should be absolutely ashamed that only seven black students got into Stuyvesant, and that only 10% of our black and brown children um, got into these specialized high schools, um, even though they uh, represent well over 60% of our public school demographic. It's even more offensive to know that there are campaigns, some of them flush with cash, um, who are pushing to renew the current admissions policies while claiming that they're against segregation and sy um, systemic inequality. Let's be clear about this. Allowing a system to remain the same guarantees that we will continue to uphold systemic racism. The history of the, the hecht Calandra legislation, the, the legislation that enshrines the single test admission policy is no secret. It reveals the original intent and motive of the legislation was to block the growing calls to diversify these schools at the time. The test has served and continues to serve its original purpose, to keep black and brown children out of these schools. This alone should motivate state legislators who hold the power to address um, the original legislation and the mayor who can change admissions requirements at five of the schools to take action. What we're seeing today is again the lack of political will to tackle the racist foundations plaguing our school system and complicity with white supremacy. The specialized high school admissions test is only the tip of the iceberg. Systemic racism feeds off the Shazat and gifted and talented programs and screen schools and segregation itself as tools to hoard resources. Worst of all, wealth and access to resources are confined to white affluent communities while the rest of our school system is under-resourced and underfunded. New York State still owes New York City Public Schools $1.4 billion, which Governor Cuomo has refused to fund under the court-ordered and mandated campaign for fiscal equity. And this year, we were also let down by, by our, um, our Democratic counterparts at the state level. This system ensures that our communities are forced to fight for scraps. Black and brown communities are forced to participate in the sick dance for limited resources our Asian brothers and sisters have felt that they've been left out of the process and feel voiceless, and this is all wrong. And so is moving forward with a plan that doesn't fundamentally eliminate the test as the sole basis for entry, and that doesn't include multiple measures. Imagine pouring all of this energy and money backing the Projects Act campaigns into a campaign to ensure that all of our schools are high quality schools. This is where our struggle lies, and this is where we are organizationally. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much to the council for holding this hearing today. I really appreciate the discourse I've heard here. My name is Tony Smith Thompson. I'm a public school parent, and I'll be speaking in my professional capacity as an organizer for the New York Civil Liberties Union. Overall, we support the council's efforts to address segregation in New York City schools and support most of the proposed measures here. I will say that many of the proposals have distant timelines and seem to have overlapping purposes, and we really ask that you avoid creating redundant oversight bodies and ensure that resources are really put toward concrete and targeted actions. A uh, few things, we support Resolution 196 in favor of changing the admissions criteria for specialized high schools. The reliance on high stakes testing for admissions to these schools and other programs does maintain segregation. It is for this reason that we have concerns about Resolution 417 with regard to the creation of additional gifted and talented programs. Um, as has been stated earlier, we really must ensure that the admission systems for these programs will promote diversity and desegregation. And finally, 
We must remember that the goal of segregation is, is not just to maintain physical separation, but to isolate people of color from power, opportunity, and democratic participation. We continue to see the impact of this. Consider that 60% of white students are clustered in just 271 of the DOE's more than 1,800 schools. These schools are disproportionately better resourced than schools serving students of color in racially isolated schools. That is the purpose of segregation. Physical desegregation alone is insufficient to undo this. We must push for action beyond modifying admission systems in order to undo institutional, cultural, and pedagogical bias and discrimination. Immediately, we urge the elimination of high-stakes tests as the sole admissions criterion and urge targeted and sustained funding to ensure we can take bold and consistent action to undo segregation. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Traeger. Thank you, Councilmember Ku. My name is Vanessa Leung, and I'm the co-executive director of CACF, the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families. And I'm speaking today not only as the co-executive director of CACF, but also as a long-term school reform advocate and proud public school parent of three elementary school boys. Uh, for over 30 years, CACF has been the nation's only Pan-Asian Children and Ad Families Advocacy Organization and it leads the fight for improved and equitable policy systems, funding, and services to support those in need. We have a responsibility to the APA community to advocate for educational policies that benefit all APA students, including and especially those most marginalized. Our community is incredibly diverse and vast, consisting of groups from East Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, the Indo-Caribbean, and Pacific Islands. And contrary to the stereotype of the model minority, too many APA families and children continue to struggle to succeed. APAs have the highest rate of poverty among all racial ethnic groups. Over 85% of the community is foreign born, 42% of households speak an, a language or linguistically isolated. We often face language barriers and are the first generation in our families to attend American schools and pursue higher education. CACF exists because it is our vision for all children and families, including the APA community in New York City, are safe, healthy, and able to reach their full potential in life. This includes the 216,000 APA kids in our system, including the over 5,000 kids who took the specialized high school test this year and did not make it. We are constantly fighting the harmful impacts of the model minority myth, which prevents our needs from being recognized and understood, but also used as a wedge to continue to pit minority groups against each other and justify the inequitable distribution of resources and opportunities across communities. Today, we want to be clear that we stand united with our allies from other communities to fight for educational equity. We must continue to fight for equitable funding and resources that support the, both the academic and social emotional growth of our students. As a parent, I understand that all parents want what is best for their children. However, as parents, we need to start thinking what is best for our children does not mean simply wanting what is deemed best by others. As a parent, I do not want my children to just be good test takers. I want my children to love learning, be willing to take risks and challenges, learn from their mistakes, and know that one's life is never defined solely by their lowest low or their highest highs. Yet we've created a system that defines our children's ability for accelerated learning at age four, and then again at age 13. We're in a system that makes selecting a middle school and a high school so complicated and stressful for all of our families, but especially more so for those struggling with language barriers uh, and or those ensuring that our children's health and learning needs are met. Um, we have the most segregated schools. We have an opportunity now to create opportunities for students um, in for accelerated learning, but not within the structure we have now. The city specialized high schools are a severe reflection of the segregation and maintaining the single exam perpetuates that segregation. I, I do believe that it is a disservice to all our students, including our APA students, and I just wanna end with a quote from a Stuyvesant alum and how, uh, how the high stakes single test and test prep culture has created an unhealthy environment. Many of us came to conflate not only our potential for success, but our worth on testing. Students who performed well often developed condescending and judgmental ways of relating to those who do not. It was an environment that encouraged individualism and a harmful belief in bootstrap mentality, making us especially vulnerable to depression and anxiety. We obsessed over grades, improving our intelligence, fearful of being on the wrong end of our classmates' condescension. These dynamics continue to harm students long after high school. Um, again, I want to thank the City Council as well as folks and look forward to working with anybody who wants to build a strong public school system. Thank you. My colleagues have any questions? 
Thank you all very much. Appreciate your work. Thank you. Um, next, we're going to call up uh, Tasfia Rahman, Amy uh, Sin, Anna Wu, uh, Nada Al Nakar, Jason Wu, uh, Awana uh, Muhammad. Good afternoon. Thank you for holding this hearing regarding New York City school segregation and happy APA Heritage Month. My name is Nada Alnagar, a youth advocate in the Asian American Student Advocacy Project and a current junior at Brooklyn Technical High School. Below is the experience of Edison Zhu, a youth advocate in the Asian American Student Advocacy Project and a current senior at the Bronx High School of Science who cannot be present today. I stand as the only student in the 2015 graduating class of PSMS3 to attend a specialized high school. Do I, as a student who passed the SHSAT by mere points, deserve it? Perhaps, perhaps not. But what I know for sure is that the SHSAT failed to evaluate my closest friends as individuals, but rather as what the black ink shows on paper. One was a salutatorian of the graduating class with a big heart and a will of steel. Another was my closest friend, also a salutatorian, who, const who constantly exerts himself to discover what his passion may be. He would now confidently say that it is epidemiology, the epidemiology inspired by his internships and professors and driven by his dream to contribute to the greater good. On the other hand, I attended a middle school where the majority of students were fully aware of specialized high schools since the sixth grade, leading many to prepare early and ultimately get accepted into specialized high schools. It is unfair that in some parts of the city, middle schoolers are set on going to specialized high schools since the sixth grade, while in other parts, middle schools, middle schoolers find out a month before what a specialized high school is. While many students in specialized high schools are capable, the same level of capability could be found in so many students across New York City if the situation of their school was different. Also, a single test does not show character nor passion, especially when the test's existence wasn't known to the class until September of eighth grade, just a month before we had to take it, and when the test materials were beyond our coursework. A single test cannot contextualize a student. A fair test is based on the perimeters that all students are given the same educational opportunities and same quality education. The SHCT is upheld by neither. We need an education, education system that doesn't discriminate against communities of low income and or minorities who are system, systematically zoned in New York City. All students should be held to the same standard of quality of education and of accessibility to opportunities. In the long run, we need a system of evaluation that would see past wealth and race and most definitely numbers. Thank you for your time. Hi. Hi. Oh. Hi. Uh, my name is Anna, Anna Liu, and I'm a youth leader at, Asi at the Asian American Student Advocacy Project. I'm currently a sophomore at Stuyvesant High School, and I'm advocating for the for SHSAT reform and greater diversity and in integration in New York City schools because I see the impact of a segregated system in my classrooms every day. Walking through Stye's halls, I will inevitably hear the N-word thrown around casually up by, by students who probably don't understand what it is that they're actually saying. Because the city's school system is so segregated, most students at Stuyvesant have been educated in environments where they've never had to learn how to be race, race conscious. Sty, Stuyvesant is another one of those environments. When I was in middle school and planning to take the SHSAT, I remember one of my friends who was black, and she was adamant about going to Stuy because of its prestige. 
The week after the SHSAT, I asked her how she felt about it, and I learned that she decided not to pursue her original plans after she discovered that only 1% of Stuyvesant High School students were black. She wasn't optimistic about her chances of fitting in, and even less optimistic about her chances of success. I'm at Stuy, and she, is, and she isn't, not because she didn't work hard enough, but because she didn't feel that she would be safe and happy at a school where so few students looked like her. When people support the SHSAT, they're supporting the archaic belief that education should be exclusive and are actively discouraging students that are not part of the group deemed deserving of a quality education from pursuing it because educational spaces continue to be hostile spaces for them. I also want to add that a lot of parents think of the SHSAT as a way for their children to receive a better, better quality education and to succeed in the future. But I think the purpose of uh, these reforms that we're advocating for is to expand access to opportunities so that the quality of education that students receive doesn't depend on this one test that they're taking. And so, um, yeah, thank you for this opportunity to testify. Hello, hi. Uh, my name is Amy Sen. I'm an associate professor of sociology at the City University of New York. I'm also a member of the executive committee of the STAG. Um, but today I'm speaking to you um, as a researcher of education, inequality, and immigration. I'm also a mother of two, of, of two students in the, the public system, and I am speaking on the, as, an, as an Asian American. Um, there are two main problems facing the public schools in New York City. The first being that many K through eight schools are not doing its job in preparing students for high school. And the second is that currently within the system now, there are many talented students that are denied access to some of the most elite and well um, resourced schools in the city because of a flawed admissions policy. And too often, the problem, problem one is used as an excuse to not address problem two. But they're two separate and equally important issues. I support moving away from a system that uses a single, single test to determine admissions into the specialized schools, but also recognize the problem inherent in K-8 schools is more fundamental because um, specialized schools only serve a fraction, a tiny fraction of students. And this DAG has offered 73 recommendations to address educational equity, and many of these recommendations speak directly to how the city can improve K-8 schools. In this heated debate around the Shazat, I think it's really important that we recognize that only 18% of APA students will ever attend a specialized school, and the vast majority of Asian American students have the same unaddressed educational needs as many other immigrant students and other students of color. They are attending the same overcrowded, under-resourced schools as their Latino and black peers. They have unmet English language um, support needs um, and so when we prioritize diversity and inclusive classrooms, and when we increase investments and efforts to build educational pipelines in K through eight schools, um, we, that benefits the APA community as well as all communities in New York City. Okay, hello, good afternoon. Thank you for having me today. Uh, my name is Alana Mohammed, and I'm a Brooklyn Tech alum. I'm a first-generation Asian American. My father worked two to three jobs to provide for me while my mother quit her job to help me study all throughout school. I didn't have test prep or any of those resources. But I'd like to say that I would support more transparency into how the SHSAT is constructed since uh, right now there is no research that really supports that this is a reliable measure of student ability. I think we need to keep that in mind as we go forward with these conversations. And as an archivist, I'd really like to highlight some historical context that I feel is uh, missing about the deep-seated fight for desegregation that black people primarily have led in this country. Uh, specifically in New York City in 1972, hundreds of white parents in Canarsie shut down schools for three days because black students were being bused in from Brownsville. One protester claimed, we are for equality, education, and integration, and this is not a racial issue. 
but a later story quoted one parent as saying that white people were, quote, fearful that their kids' education was going to go down the drain if black students attended these schools. In 1973, these same parents won a redistricting battle to keep black, black students out of Canarsie schools and suggested schools in Brownsville simply be upgraded. And I would be remiss if I did not, did not mention Heck Calandra, which was established primarily to circumvent a study into whether schools were culturally biased against black and Puerto Rican students. I understand that now we need to address charges of anti-Asian discrimination, but as an Indo-Caribbean uh, alumni, I hope that we can keep in mind the diversity of Asian Americans and not just consider the loudest or best funded voices. More research into the ethnic and socioeconomic diversity within our communities is needed to better understand our concerns. And I'd just like to say that um, for more context, black students are more likely to be severely punished for minor infractions in schools. Uh, black and Latino students are less likely to be referred to gifted and talented programs despite high test scores. Uh, Non-black teachers have lower expectations for their black students. We do not all face the same challenges in education as people of color. And so expanded GNT programs and the lofty goal of fixing K through eight have merit, but cannot alone solve the deep-seated segregation we face. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jason Wu. I am a graduate of Brooklyn Technical High School, class of 2003. I am submitting this testimony in support of admissions reform of the specialized high schools and fixing K through 12 across New York City. This is not an either or choice. We can do both. I was born and raised in New York City, and I am proudly a product of New York City's public school system. My parents were working class immigrants from China who came to this country in pursuit of the American dream. I understand what the specialized high schools mean for the Chinese American community, community in New York City. I understand that the changes to the admissions process brings up complicated feelings of discrimination, bias, and scapegoating. The Department of Education could have rolled, this, rolled out the, the proposal and changes better. These are valid criticisms. However, this is not sufficient reason to maintain the status quo. Just as critics of Shastat reform have repeatedly stated that tweaking admissions to the specialized high schools will not fix K through eight, similarly, keeping the status quo will not fix K through 12. It is short-sighted and divisive. There are a couple of myths that I, I'd like to address. One, Asian students are being penalized by admissions reform. This is discrimination unfair. The current admissions policy already unfairly excludes disproportionately black and Latinx students in New York City. So the question is, who bears the burden of, of, the, of, the, the, of exclusion from these schools? Number two, Shasat objectively measures merit. M moving away from the Shasat introduces bias. The issue is the Shasat is screening out lower income students and underrepresented students of color who, already, who also possess merit and potential. The current admissions policy is already biased. Number three, admissions reform will result in, admit, in admitting less qualified students. The notion that students who are admitted through the expanded discovery program or, or holistic admissions criteria will somehow be low performing students is just wrong. Number four, the specialized high schools are special. The specialized high schools, like many public schools, have many problems. Admissions reform is the right thing to do, but it does not go far enough to address racial and economic inequities in our education system. All of our young people deserve better than the very limited opportunities that exist at the specialized high schools, which are overcrowded, which have limited spots in advanced placement courses. There's a range of issues that exist even at the specialized high schools. Number five, promoting diversity hurts Asian Americans. Diversity benefits all students and promotes a vibrant learning environment. This benefits all students. Um, to conclude, I'd like to also just address the Shasat lawsuit that is being brought by the Pacific Legal Foundation. I believe that PLF, an organization based in Sacramento, California, is attempting to dismantle diversity integration here in New York City under a guise of colorblind civil rights rhetoric. This is the same organi organization that brought the Supreme Court case, Parents Involved, in 2007, which struck down desegregation integration efforts in Seattle, Washington, and Louisville, Kentucky. I am dismayed to see Asian Americans being employed as a racial wedge by PLF and others. These same groups and its members are also actively attacking voting rights, and they have come to our city to promote their anti-civil rights agenda. As a New Yorker and as an Asian American, I say not in my name. 
As an advocate for racial and economic justice and as an Asian American, we must resist how our identity and experiences are being used here. We must acknowledge and address the many struggles in the Asian American community, including poverty and immigrant rights, but attacking measures to promote diversity in our public schools is misguided. We must address educational equity by addressing the root causes, and we must do this in solidarity with all marginalized communities and communities of color. Good afternoon, my name is Tasfia Rahman, and I'll be speaking as a policy coordinator of CACF and as an alum of Brooklyn Tech. As an Asian Bangladeshi American raised in Bed-Stuy in the 90s and 2000s, I grew up in a diverse neighborhood with families and friends of different racial, ethnic, and religious background. I went to an elementary school where even though standardized test scores were low, we learned about the civil rights movement, celebrated annual multicultural potlucks, and wrote fun essays about our cultural heritage. At the same time, faced with limited English proficiency, my parents were unable to navigate the school system and were too embarrassed to even speak with my teachers, let alone advocate for themselves and their children. So when I scored low on my standardized test, they resorted to tutoring, which continued up until the Isha sat. The pressure was intense. I was told that my future depended on a single test and I had one chance to prove my value, my worth. That's what a single high stakes and pressure ridden test does to a child. It creates a sense of impending failure and disappointment at a young and impressionable age. When you allow a single test to be the only standard of intelligence, you breed a toxic learning environment with students cheating, bragging about loss of sleep, and competing with each other, even bullying each with each other based on differences. As a Muslim, I heard many Islamophobic comments being casually thrown around. But I'm also disgusted to look back at how, during college admissions time, I stood by and witnessed many of my white and Asian Pacific American peers accused our black and Latinx identifying peers of getting into prestigious colleges based solely on their race. Equity and elitism does not go hand in hand. In a society stratified by race, elitism strengthens racism. As elite schools to specialized high schools are not an exception to the entrenched racism that plagues the system. In fact, they embody it. The Shasat, an exam that is rooted in anti-desegregation history, perpetuates segregation both outside and inside these schools. A multiple measure admissions process is the first step in creating more diverse, inclusive school environments that welcome the multitude of backgrounds and experiences of our students and nurture their unique individual abilities and talents that go outside of being good test takers. Instead of advocating for more specialized high schools or gifted and talented programs that perpetuate elitism, we must advocate for building more and better quality schools in general. We must fight for funds owed to our public schools and better pay for our early childhood educators. We must invest in improving the social and emotional growth of our students, instituting culturally responsive education, and supporting students' mental health needs. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, thank you very much. I just have a, uh, appreciate a very powerful testimony. Um, just a quick question of professor of education. Is that here correctly? Thank you. Well, soci well, sociology, thank you. Thank you so much for, for your service. Uh, just a quick question because one of the things that, um, and I appreciated uh, uh, Maya Wiley's, uh, you know, her words that she's not fond of the words enrichment, but central core services, which I, I support. And actually, I, I appreciate that kind of, uh, I think that's better terminology, vocabulary to use. Um, the question I have is, as a former teacher, I was trained and I was told by my teaching training that we have to differentiate instruction to meet the diverse learning needs of our students. A lot of the staff development or teacher development training that I received uh, focused on uh, students that were struggling not at level and how do we get them to level. Um, what sh should instruction look like, for example, those students who are at or above the above level who sometimes complain that classrooms might be going too slow or not, or not challenging enough? Like, what should that look like effectively? I'm just curious to hear your thoughts. Well, I think it depends on what, what grade we're talking about. In, right. in elementary school, in kindergarten, first grade, third grade, we have effective pedagogy that teach that, that effectively teaches to a wide range of, of ability levels, right. right? So segregating children at the age of five into, into, gift, into track, tr tracking them into, into schools and programs is, is, is very unusual um, right. nationally. We don't have programs like that, and we have um, curriculum that can teach to heterogeneous classrooms. 
as children get older, there's specialization, there's greater differentiation. Um, and I think that there, you know, we also need to recognize that someone who is particularly excelling in, say, in math may not be excelling in civics and vice versa. And so, sure. I had the vice versa. Yeah, and vice <laughs> right. versa. Or, right. you know, and so I think that and a test isn't going to be the way in which we can capture all the dimensions of giftedness or talent. Right. Uh, and so I think that we need to, you know, strict tracking, um, whether within schools or across schools, creates, does not always serve educational purposes. Right, yeah. right. Uh, because one of the things we've heard consistently from, from folks who are, are advocating for uh, abolishing a sole measure is the use of multiple measures. I, I'm just curious, if, uh, I guess, through the advisory groups and other stakeholders to hear what exactly those measures are and making sure that they're also supported by evidence and research. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I think that no single metric is perfect. Right. Um, standardized testing has some is is valid. I think, in my opinion, um, as an educational researcher, it does is predictive of certain things, but um, grades are as well. In fact, grades are the single most um, or the single most valid predictor of later college success, right? And so, if you're going to design um, a mechanism to identify academic um, success very narrowly defined, what we know is that using multiple valid metrics that uses a combination of tests, standardized tests and grades, allow, is more valid, is more predictive of later outcomes than using any one single metric. Mm -hmm. Thank you, very important. Thank you, thank you very much for that. Okay, I'm gonna call up the, uh, the next panel. Uh, why watch in? Uh, Kavork, uh, Krim, Krimian? Krimian, sorry. Uh, Charles uh, Vavruska, uh, Wilton uh, uh, Sedeno, uh, Dr. Uh, Ivan uh, Khan, and uh, Mr. Uh, Jonathan Roberts. Uh, folks, if it's okay, we'll take a quick two minute, two minute recess. I'll be right back. Two minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know these. Uh, it's five o'clock.
Sharon, just to the sergeant arms table.
All right, folks, we, we will uh, start again. But before we start again, I just want to kind of just first quickly publicly apologize for incorrectly citing a court case. I said it earlier, uh, the Lum versus Rice case. Um, I, I cited it uh, in reference to the problematic decision uh, that came out of the case that doubled down on segregation uh, in, our, in, our society, in our country, but the background of the case is highly problematic. Uh, as well, so I just want to publicly apologize for incorrectly citing that, and I thank you, the educators, for flagging that for me as well. Uh, and with that, uh, I will now turn to the panel. Hi, my name is Charlie Veruska. I want to thank the uh, Education Committee for giving me this chance to talk. The specialized high schools have been beacons of opportunity for generations. They provided opportunities for poor children, for immigrant children, for working class children, for middle class children. They know if they work hard and use their God-given ability, they have the opportunity to go to some of the best schools in this country. The SHSAT is objective and merit-based. It doesn't ask you what your race is, where you're from, or more importantly, who you know. Now, we talked to many alum of the specialized high schools, and many of them create, uh, said there was a pipeline that got them in before. These were gifted and talented programs. These were advanced classes. These were SP classes. These were honors programs. Many of these programs have gone away. That's why I urge the council to vote for Resolution 417A and expand gifted and talented. But we have to ask ourselves, why does Mayor de Blasio want to get rid of the SHSAT? And today, DeRoy Murdoch has exposed a MathGate scandal. It's a huge grade forward scandal which is being pulled on our parents and our children. And I request that this council investigate this scandal because if our parents don't know that their children aren't learning because they're getting high grades when they're not being taught math, that's a huge problem. Maybe worse than the lead scandal in our in public housing. And why does Mayor de Blasio want to get rid of the SHSAT? The, uh, getting rid of the SHSAT allows them to cover up that scandal and continue grade fraud and continue scamming our parents and children. So I tell the council, please keep the SHSAT in place. Do not recommend Heckland to be repealed. And please investigate this Mathgate scandal that Mayor de Blasio and Chancellor Carranza are imposing on our children. Thank you. Hello, my name is Kev Krimian. Um, I'm, uh, thank you for having me. I'm the parent of two SHSAT students. My first daughter graduated from Stuyvesant two years ago, and my other daughter is graduating as we speak from Bronx Science. Um, I've been in and out of, as a volunteer parent in these schools for six years. I'm as appalled by the lack of diversity as everyone else. Uh, but the SHSAT is not the problem. Um, we had a kid here earlier from selective schools uh, like Townsend Har Harris, Bard, Beacon. These are not SHSAT schools, and the lack of diversity there is not that much different than the SHSAT schools. Um, I think the problem is the, the l breadth of the pipeline the la lack of opportunity for every kid to know about these programs, to know about the GNT program that feeds into SHSAT. My, my wife, as a stay-at-home mom, made it a full-time job to figure out the GNT program in our district. We were, in dis we, uh, we were zoned for PS49, the test was in PS87, and the program was in PS 153. Sounds simple now. It took months to figure it out. And we were parents who located in New York after our service overseas for the GNT and the SHSAT programs. So it's lack of information, not the actual process of getting into these schools. Um, these schools are not that bad. They produce 12 Nobel Prize winners in physics and chemistry. That's like 5% of all Nobel Prize winners in chemistry and physics. That's a statistical anomaly. Uh, that's like batting 300 for 30 years in a row. It is something special. And we got to be careful of the unintended consequences of fiddling with this. Um, may not seem related, but I'm reminded of how we lost Amazon 
in Queens. Um, that was terrible. That was weak thinking. And I've been all over the world serving this country, and I know our adversaries, and they're not looking at this as a democratic process. They're looking at this as soft Americans shooting themselves in the foot. They're not undermining their schools that produce Nobel Prize winners. If anything, they're treating them a lot better than we are. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Ivan Khan. I'm a proud Bangladeshi New Yorker and a product of New York City. Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Ivan Khan. I'm a Bangladeshi New Yorker and a proud product of New York City Public Schools since the first grade. During the week, I do serve as the CEO of Consultorial, a supplemental education program serving low-income families in, around, in the outer boroughs, one in Brooklyn, eight in Queens, and two in the Bronx, that last month nearly helped 40 black and Hispanic students receive offers through our scholarships and partnerships, and I'm here to share some of those best practices. Um, this includes four out of seven black children who, who attended Stuyvesant High School, who got into Stuyvesant High School, four out of Hispanic children that got into Stuyvesant, um, Stuyvesant High School, and one of our Hispanic students, Alan Arias, wrote a beautiful op-ed in AM New York, which you may have read um, about a partnership that he was a part of. The biggest factor helping these kids was not our SHSAT program councilmen, council members, um, it was their early grade level proficiency. Right now, only 25% of black and brown children are not receiving the proper DOE support to be fully grade level proficient. So if you take that one fourth of passing black and brown kids and you multiply it by the four tenths of the students that are actually sitting to enter the specialized high schools, one fourth times four tenths equals one tenth, which is 10%, which is exactly the result that we're at right now. My family and I arrived in 1987 as immigrants from Bangladesh, just one stop away from um, the Shea, Shea Stadium. My dad was a high school teacher in Sheepshead Bay, Canarsie in Wingate High School, and he ended his career as an AP in Wadley High School. So growing up in the house, I understood the disparities that existed, not only as a kid serving, the, being a product of the, special, uh, of the public school system, but hearing from my dad what was going on in other areas. He realized to move us out, and even though we had the IGC and SP programs that were non-testing based, I commend you, Council Member Traeger, for recognizing and remembering those teacher-based recommendations for advanced classes for K through eight learners. Over time, um, he did get sick by 2002 while I was a uh, medical student at Downstate. And after graduating, I chose to leave my promising medical career to serve my community to ensure that objective uh, merit-based entrance criteria do exist for all immigrant New Yorkers. Uh, right now, we're doing programs in Harlem, uh, STEM, uh, and with Brooklyn Tech, and we have our own scholarships we've had for five years. Council members, I've given links to schools in North Brooklyn, entire borough of the Bronx, to DOE schools, and in Harlem, and quite oftentimes my uh, director says the guidance counselors simply don't forward the free links. And unfortunately, charter school networks are taking up our scholarships, even though that's not our intention. We really want public school kids to know and our scholarship's still out there. So I'm here not to talk about our company, but to share how much we value diversity as a community of Bangladeshi New Yorkers. And even though you know, we, I lost my dad and he got to see a lot of the Bangladeshi community do well for himself, it's, it's my legacy to ensure the same uh, ha success happens for black and brown children, blacks and Latinos, and I want to ensure that, remind everyone that the SHSAT was validated uh, through an article in the New York Times um, that was released this past summer, so uh, we can't blame the messenger for it, let's fix the pipeline, and we can't miss this opportunity to fix our grade level proficiency once and for all. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Wei Hua Chin, the president of the Chinese American Citizens Alliance of Greater New York. Uh, I want to make this clear. We're for unity, not division. We're here for inclusion. And there are people who are attributing all sorts of opinions to us that I find really offensive because we never even thought them, we never said them. Maybe there are one and two, but you find that in any group. But it is not fair to attribute to Asians saying that we own these schools. That is not true. No one owns these schools. We pass through them, we learn from them, we grow from them, and we thank our teachers for what they give to us. Thank you also, Chairman Traeger, for some history, because I really appreciate it. I have this included here, too. Because three days and 150 years ago, in harsh environments, in harsh conditions, that the Chinese completed 10 miles of railroad tracks in 12 hours. 
That is an amazing feat that has not been surpassed to this day, even with modern equipment. Days later, the Transcontinental Railroad was completed, as you said. And in those celebrations, the Chinese were excluded. To add to that, because we worked so well, the Chinese Exclusion Act was passed. And that was the only act ever in America to exclude a people and to deny them civil rights because of their ethnicity. Now today, 150 years later, we are again being excluded because of exemplary performance, because of race. Feel our sense of injustice. No one should be excluded because of race. The SHSAT is an unbiased academic measure that ignores race, wealth, ethnicity, power, or privilege. For years, the schools were mostly Jewish. For 20 years, the majority of tech was black and Hispanic. Now the schools are mostly Asian because of the changing city. The schools are great. The meta study commissioned by the DOE validated the test. The test works, which doesn't work, is K to eight. The proposed admission changes cover up the failing K to eight. We want to bring back gifted and talented with changes, not necessarily with one test, but with a, a number of different entry points, in fact, as children grow. And those were the pipelines to the specialized high schools. We should not exclude one poor group of children for another. They are all our children. We don't exclude and divide. Instead, let's include and educate. Please oppose Reso 196 and support Reso 417. Thank you, sir. Hi, my name is Jonathan Roberts. Uh, you've, you've got a budget coming up. Uh, I have, I have three, three programs that I urge the city council to take all steps within its power to implement the following three programs. The first would be to hire enough additional teachers in underperforming elementary and middle schools in order to reduce class sizes by 25%. The second one, recruit a thousand new math and science teachers for low achieving elementary and middle schools. Offer enough compensation, because teachers are underpaid, to attract and retain highly qualified and talented teachers for, for, the, for these schools. Third, restore rigorous math and science enrichment and advancement programs in underserved communities for all students who want this challenge. That's for your budget. So please, th these are solutions. Um, I'll skip that. Uh, test, test results can be extremely disturbing to see. But papering over the diagnosis condemns future generations of black and Latino youth to lives of unfulfilled potential. So I urge the city council to support a massive investment in our crumbling educational infrastructure by reducing class sizes, recruiting math and science experts, and restoring enrichment and acceleration programs in underserved communities. Thank you. Any questions from my colleagues? I, I, is your microphone? I want to thank all of you coming today and uh, spending the whole day here, and I concur with all your suggestions. Yeah, I hope the chairman <laughs> Does that I, I just I just want to note uh, uh, you know 
we heard a lot today, and some members are aggressively pushing, you know, for expansion of the G&T uh, programs pipelines. I think you've heard my concerns with the current uh, definition of G&T that it really, I mean, does anyone here believe that it's developmentally <laughs> appropriate to be testing four-year-olds on a single measure? Yeah, on the, on, on the uh, GNT? One, one, one person at a okay time. If I take this one, I have a six-year-old and a four-year-old, and I run a test prep company, and I'm not for GNT testing at all. I think it should absolutely be expanded and available in every single school like the way it was when we were kids. We were, we're in our late 30s, I think, one year older than you are. So back then, it was just a... The, the students who are just doing well in the class because the teacher saw potential home support and the student was driven to work hard, those kids, we all got somehow placed in 1-2 or 2-1. And those classes were predominantly black and Hispanic. It just mattered of where you lived. And granted, even then it wasn't equal because by the time I got to Eastern Queens, yeah. you saw like, the, the inequity in funding. So I absolutely do not support GNT testing for a four-year-old. Right. There, because one of the items that, you know, that I think is worth also raising in a hearing like this is that we are in a hyper-testing culture, yeah. and there is an impact that, that this has on students in more ways than one. There is something also called trauma that's related to, to, to excessive testing on, on, our, on our kids. And I, I would just ask, uh, have any of you have seen recent questions uh, on the specialized high school exam, if you can just comment on them very briefly, just one person. Well, I, you know, the, the material that we have that's provided by the handbook, the DOE gives a handbook out, and it's supposed to be given to every single sixth and seventh grader. Too often, my black and Hispanic kids in my centers are finding out about the handbook one month before the exam or w one week after the registration deadline. And it kills me to see that black and Hispanic children are being kept from these resources. As far as what you're asking, as far as the alignment of the material of the exam to the, to the school standards, the exam has been shifted to, to change verbal to ELA, to remove scrambled paragraphs and logical reasoning, which were never traditionally taught in schools, and I support that. It's been replaced by editing and revisions. At the same time, no 14-year-old's future should be determined by one single administration of one exam. I feel there are ways to improve the process, to make, open up the access, to have every single child available to take it, and they, they can choose to opt out. You can have more than one administration of the exam, just like the SAT. You don't need to have everything riding on one sit-down of one test. Additionally, the subjective criteria in the college admission stuff totally, totally is not good for new immigrants because our parents don't know how to navigate the system. We don't know how to, nav we, we, we don't, we're not brave enough to even face our teachers, our, our kids' teachers at school because of our, you know, anxiety around, you know, speaking to, to someone of authority. So these are deep-rooted trauma um, aspects that new immigrants have have dealt with not only you know South Asians and Asians now, but uh, many eth other eth ethnic groups before us. Right, and and so when folks have said, you know, just expand GNT, I think you've heard my issues with that. And when folks just say, well, fix K to eight, you know, I used to teach high school uh, history, and and I taught a Regents course. Yeah, I would be very upset if the exam had questions on topics that were never covered or, or discussed or taught in my classroom, the fact that even if you completely, you know, revolutionize K-8 education, there is a fundamental problem with testing, in my view, my, my opinion, testing students on topics that they've never even discussed in K-8. K through eight. Um, and, and so I, I think we need to think deeper about not just the, 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 this specialized exam, but really testing in general, there's too much of it. Quite frankly, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a proponent of project-based learning. I, 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 I support consortium schools that I don't think get enough attention in New York City, need a lot more credit for the work that they're doing with project-based learning and supports. But I, I think that we, we need to have, in my opinion, constructive dialogue um, 
including the specialized schools, about how to make you know, improvements that are really for the best needs of our kids. And also just to, to say again that meaningful integration, mm -hmm. meaningful integration does not weaken our schools. It, it actually mm -hmm. will strengthen all of them. And I, I'll, I'll, I'll close it there with this panel. And I, again, thank you for your time. You know, just for the record, I have no problem with testing four-year-olds because the playing field is more level then. By the time you get to eighth grade, I think a lot of the die is already cast. So, and, you know, there are problems by then. Uh, so, but, but when you're dealing with little kids, yeah, we can, it, 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 the separation hasn't occurred as deeply. It's fairer time to test. What we need is two, two, two ways of GNT, one the tested and one the non-tested. We have both have traditionally been very successful in this city. I mean, the tested programs work, but we also need a top class in every school, an IGC class, and we need honors and SP programs in every middle school, and plus a tested gift to the talent in each district. If we have both, we can do both, and there's no reason we can't do both because they both work. Right. Just uh, I'm speaking as, as, a, as a former licensed, educator, licensed teacher and someone that actually went on to receive his license in school administration, yeah. I, I don't believe it's appropriate to be testing four-year-olds. Um, I don't believe you're testing for intellectual capacity. Okay. Well, my daughter was tested into a gifted and talented program, 25 kids in kindergarten. Right. Three of those kids were accepted to MIT. Well, so, I mean, the system, it works. So, I, why not do what works? If that works, keep it. And we put the other way that works, too. Let's have both. We can I, do both. I, I just respectfully believe that that is only really testing privilege and whether kids are having good or bad days. Yep. At, at four years old, I think our students deserve Yep. To but you take 25 more. kids, three get into MIT. That was just random then. I, no, I, I, I mean, it, it, it works. I, I agree with you, Councilmember Traeger, and I would love to see that money reinvested into smaller class sizes and culturally relevant education and integration from kindergarten at a very, very early age. I, 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 I appreciate that, and I thank the panel for, for its time. Thank you. Uh, Maud uh, Marone, uh, Lynn uh, Andrews, uh, Jenny Veloz, uh, Abraham Velasquez, Juliana uh, Zaragoza, uh, Andrea Ortiz, Juan uh, Cartagena, and uh, David Kirkland. And Maya Wiley, is Maya Can you understand? Yeah. How many? Good afternoon. Um, as a public school parent of four children in District 2 elementary and middle schools, the availability of... I'm sorry, could you just say name, name for the record? Oh, I so we have. Uh, my, my name is Maud Marin. Thank you. And as I said, as I'm a public school parent of four children in District 2 in elementary and middle schools, the availability of college preparatory high schools is of great concern to me. I'm also the vice president of the Community Education Council for District 2, which is the largest school district of our city. And in that capacity, I have heard from hundreds of other parents over the last six months about how the mayor's plan to replace the SHSAT with a 7% quota system for specialized high school admissions will negatively impact their children and their children's ability to access the education they need and deserve. All children deserve access to an education that honors their interests, their aptitude, and their willingness to work towards their goals. This plan does absolutely nothing to increase the number of seats at STEM-focused high schools which over 30,000 New York City students attempt to access every year via the SHSAT. 
In District 2, approximately 19% of students attend specialized high schools each year. A drop to 7% would drastically reduce the number of seats available to District 2 students while not creating any other comparable education elsewhere, and that's unacceptable. I also ask this council to consider that specialized high schools are among some of the most gender-balanced high schools of New York City's academically accelerated schools. They're 54 to 56 percent boys in a system that's 52 percent boys. The mayor's plan is a disaster for bright boys who fare much worse under the subjective grading standards used in multiple measures admission schemes. I ask this council to support parents in rejecting this flawed proposal and to join us in demanding more specialized high schools. I'd also like to just make a quick point, a comment to something that I heard earlier from Maya Wiley of the School Diversity Advisory Group. She said many smart things, and I commend her for the amount of work that she's done. But she said that, and I'll quote, our principles and goals are the same, referring to the group that was together. And she also said, and I'll quote, not one minority report was attached to it. I don't agree with her that that is such a great thing, because the lack of diversity of thought and opinion in a group creates an echo chamber that doesn't do anything to help bring our polarized communities together. And I think that that group and other groups that are working on diversity would do tremendously well to listen to the communities that feel so excluded by these plans. Because the desire for more diversity in our schools, I think, is shared by communities that both want to get rid of the SHSAT and that want to keep it. And I think it's deeply unfortunate that our chancellor has been um, setting us up in a situation where the goals for diversity and the goals for excellent schools are seen in contradiction to each other because they shouldn't be. We New Yorkers deserve both. We deserve integrated schools where children of all different colors and all different abilities and all different ethnicities can go to school together, but where we can also have excellent schools that are helping our students prepare at the highest levels that their abilities can help them reach. And I, um, and I think that parents who disagree with our chancellor um, should not have to be called racist all the time because it sets up a dialogue in the city that's deeply unfortunate and I think that we need to recognize that our shared goals can be, meet, can be met if we listen to each other with a more respectful tone. In advance, I'd like to... Oh, just make sure you, uh, your microphone is on and... Uh, oh, sorry. Yep. It's okay. In advance, I'd like to thank you um, for listening to my statement. My name is Lynn Andrews. I'm a mom of three um, New York City school children, one in elementary, two in middle. Advance equity is Chancellor Kranz's message, and I agree. We need more diversity in our schools. Absolutely. The definition of equity, the equality of being fair and impartial. If only grades were impartial, unfortunately, that is not the case. Grades are subjective and also leave kids behind. Factual. Grades from seventh grade are just as high stakes. Only 1% of New York City high schools are basing admission on one test. The remaining 99% use multiple measures. There are children who are much better test takers than their grades reflect. We all learn differently. Some say that Shazat is not equitable. That is logically given the lack of diversity in the specialized high schools. It is currently the only measure that is transparent and non-biased. All children have or should have access on how to prepare. One day, one test is tough. I agree. I'm a horrible test taker. So why not allow the children to take it twice and then take their top score? Should a student have to take the MCATs to get, gain entry into med school? Should a law student have to pass the bar to practice law? These are specialized high schools and have a much more rigorous specialized curriculum and should be inclusive. The chancellor and the mayor are concerned about the specialized high schools being diverse, race, class. What about children with special needs, learning disabilities? This bill is integration, but doesn't seem inclusive to me. What accommodations will be preserved or eliminated? I asked a question at a CEC meeting last fall about kids with IEPs, and how will the new plan include these children? The answer from Mr. Wallace, Josh Wallace, there will be many more seats for kids with IEPs under the new plan. And he said he would like to discuss this with me further offline. Fine, I followed up, I emailed Mr. Wallach, Wallach. And he quoted this, we do not expect to see a substantial change in number of students with disabilities getting an offer to a specialized high school under this proposal. That's coming from Mr. Wallach. Well, 19% of New York City's school system is made up of children with special needs. How is 1% in this current specialized high school system okay? 
I have two boys with dyslexia and both have IEPs. My oldest son is in eighth grade and is not and will never be in the top 7%. It gives him zero chance to attend a specialized high school given his stakes. His learning disability does hold him back. He, is, he was allowed to take and prepare for the specialized test this year and he succeeded. Both my sons and other children with IEPs have been excluded from the conversation regarding specialized high schools and inclusion. This bill has unintended consequences and is not inclusive. I'm asking to reform, a reform to be done and done right before passing this bill. Thank you. I also, um, my cohort had to leave um, and I'm speaking on behalf of Lab Middle School. I am here today to represent the children and families of the New York City Lab Middle School. We are a District 2 screen school located in Chelsea and our student body is 38% in economic need. I'm proud to say that 77% of this year's 8th grade class received an offer to a specialized high school. That is 142 children out of 186. If the Barron Bill, Assembly Bill A-104278 passes, only 13 children will be eligible to attend a specialized high school. I would like to know the DOE's plan for the remaining 129 high-functioning lab students that have worked so hard and come from so little. It saddens me to think there has been no thought, no communication on what this does to the lab middle school children and their future. We have asked at various community forums and no one has an answer. There has been no transparency and no proper data to support this bill. We do not feel it is fair to pass a bill that has serious implications for New York City children of all ethnic and socioeconomic backgrounds. We have written to the mayor, the chancellor, and Corey Johnson's office requesting meetings to discuss this issue for our children, and we would like to provide ideas on how to improve diversity. We have zero response, and we want more diversity too. Thank you. Good afternoon, and um, thank you, Speaker Traeger, for uh, staying this late in the evening. My name is Liliana Zaragoza and I am assistant counsel with the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. LDF, um, as, as you know, was founded in 1940 by Thurgood Marshall um, and LDF is the premier civil rights organization that litigated the very case that we've talked about many times today, Brown versus Board of Education. Yet today, 65 years later, LDF continues to fight to ensure racial equity in education for black students and all students to fulfill the promise of desegregating our schools. For these reasons, LDF applauds the important first but modest steps under consideration today to address not only segregation in K through eight, but also to push for alternatives to the SHSAT. The urgency of addressing and remedying the stark racial disparities and racial, racial isolation in New York City's public schools is more apparent today than ever before. Indeed, our city and the conversation around the specialized high schools has become a central part of the national conversation regarding the meaning of merit, race, power, and the harms of segregation and discrimination in school admissions at every level of education, not just K through 12. By making access to the specialized high schools more equitable, New York has an opportunity to begin to reverse the trends that infect the public school system overall and that make it one of the most segregated in the country. Recently, LDF together with co-counsel moved to intervene on behalf of some students and families and organizations who we heard from earlier today, including Teens Take Charge um, and the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families, all of whom were incredibly inspirational um, and who make clear the needs of the students who are currently in our schools today. The current admissions policy, although it is true that perhaps more could be done than looking simply at grades, locks too many academically strong New York City students out of an important pipeline to opportunity, a pipeline that is meant to be a public one. And it, not only is this unfair to individual students, it tells a false story about the intelligence and promise of those black, Latinx, and underrepresented APA and Indo-Caribbean students who have persevered and pursued excellence despite difficult circumstances in unequal elementary and middle schools. While opposition groups and individuals have argued for addressing the pervasive inequality in New York City's elementary and middle schools, 
in lieu of in eliminating the Shazat, these steps are not mutually exclusive. The city can and should do both, address the unacceptable segregation and inequality in the city's public schools, while also adopting a plan that isn't tethered only to the Shazat. Good afternoon, Councilman Chair. My name is Abraham Velasquez, and I'm giving testimony on behalf of Dr. Marsha Jean Shah and the Brotherhood <laughs> Sister Soul. Um, the Brotherhood Sister Soul was founded in 1995 and provides comprehensive, holistic, and long-term support services to youth who range from the ages of 8 to 22. Our theory of change is to provide multi-layered support, guidance, education, and love to our membership, to teach them to have self-discipline and form order in their lives, and to offer opportunities and access so they may develop agency. And to, better be, to be better agents in their own lives, our young folks need more student support staff in their schools. This hearing, although specifically about diversity and segregation, is also about funding and discriminatory practices in our school. It's not lost on the Brotherhood Sister Soul that the elite schools to which many seek admission are not over-policed, under-resourced, under-invested, and without proper teaching and support staff. The majority of the schools are black and Latinx youth are seeking in New York City um, are lacking these support, but they're not, there's always seeming to be an abundance of funding for school police. And divestment from student success is a civil and human rights issue. In 2018, there were 2,800 counselors and 1,200 social workers serving our 1.1 million students. In 2016, there were, on the contrary, 5,500 NYPD personnel in NYC public schools, 190 of who were armed. These statistics are deplorable and indicative of our growing inability to support the needs of our young people, especially the marginalized. One in 10 students in NYC are homeless, and 74% of our public school youth are economically disadvantaged. <coughs> Moreover, 96% of teens surveyed indicate that anxiety and depression are of the top problems that they and their peers face. Given these realities, having more NYPD staff than student support staff is a major injustice. Crafting poetry to express their hopes, they write that guidance counselors can help me feel that I'm heard at school can help students feel that they have bright future. College counselors can help students finish what they've begun and can let me know asking for help is okay. They can help me get through eight hours of school without bugging out. Before fall 2020, our city and state officials should increase by 20% the budget for NYC public schools and earmark this investment to the Department of Education for the hiring of student support staff, but not limited to social workers, guidance counselors, therapists, college counselors, career counselors, and Title IX coordinators with nurses and more. Our youth members at Brotherhood Sister Soul are hosting an interactive exhibit about their experiences in schools and in demand for student support staff before the fall. I invite you, council and all present, to please see their experiences and their exhibit before it closes on May 12th. Thank you. Hello. Good afternoon and thank you, Chair Traeger. My name is Andrea Ortiz and I'm here on behalf of the New York Immigration Coalition. Um, which serves over 200 immigrant organizations. And I'm here to talk to you about the inadequate number of quality seats that serve older newcomer immigrant students or even allow them to enroll. We should be disturbed by the fact that more than one in four multilingual, uh, multilingual learners drop out of school and only one third graduate on time compared to three quarters of their peers. But much of the debate around segregation has missed a major exclusionary challenge affecting most of our, our most vulnerable learners, namely that across the system, there are not enough good seats for older males. Year after year, our education collaborative members confront this issue. YABCs and many transfer schools do not so serve older males, even though traditional night school programs in Queens and Brooklyn were abruptly closed while small schools without e &L supports were propagated under the Bloomberg um, Bloomberg tenure. We have been working to train Family Welcome Center staff to adequately support immigrant youth, and enrollment staff also recognize the greater pro pro problem. There are no schools that they can offer in high-need areas with programs that can serve newcomer immigrant students. 
Moreover, central guidance on what constitutes a quality program for older males and comprehensive, comprehensive list of male specific programs are needed so they can easily identify and offer already available quality spots. Strategically expanding access to quality programs and optimizing the enrollment system is crucial, especially as older newcomer youth and particularly SIF students need robust programs to develop their language and content knowledge in a short amount of time before they age out of schools. Without counselors, social workers, and dedicated teachers who are culturally responsive and ready to infuse all subjects with language acquisition, these youth, these youth will struggle to graduate. We are grateful that we've been able to work with Mirza Sanchez Medina, who oversees the division of MELS, to address how the system effectively excludes and isolates older MELS. And it is our sincere hope that as we are questioning how to dismantle systemic segregation, the City Council and the DOE feels the gravity of the problem and works to begin immediately to reduce the MEL dropout rate by creating high quality programs for older MELS in communities with large immigrant populations prioritizing new programs in Brooklyn and deep in Queens in areas where schools cannot meaningfully serve our most vulnerable populations. We must ensure youth and families are giving meaningful choices to guarantee male students are placed at schools equipped to support their success from the very beginning so that they don't lose time that they don't have. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just want to add one more person to, to the panel because I know they have to leave. Uh, Janine, Kylie, yes. Make sure the mic is on. Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Janine Kiley, and I chair the Schools and Education Committee for Manhattan Community Board 2. This January, CB2 passed a resolution in support of revised proposals to increase diversity at specialized high schools and other public schools and the disclosure of data relating to all proposed changes to the specialized high school admissions. It was passed 37 to 0 with two abstentions. Um, so fairly unanimous. I just want to share the, our recommendations. CB2 is deeply concerned about the inadequacy and inequality of education in, in public schools throughout New York City and supports the following. Community Board 2 recommends that the mayor make revisions to the current proposal to change the admission process for specialized high schools because we are unable to support the proposal as it is currently written. But we are eager to see a revised proposal to increase diversity and achievement <coughs> among the students of New York City. CB2 objects to the revised discovery program requirement that eligible applicants must attend a school with an economic need index of at least 60% because this will reduce the number of low-income students eligible to participate. And before New York State and New York City change specialized high school admissions, CB2 requests public access to DOE data that would be relevant to understanding this process and the impact on schools throughout the city and in our community, and there's more details in our resolution. CB2 also urges the Department of Ed to pursue additional initiatives to increase diversity in New York City public schools, such as starting early and expanding city and state education funding for high poverty schools to provide more resources for 3K, pre-K, elementary and middle schools, including funding smaller class sizes and expanded special education programs offering the gifted and talented test to all pre-K students and expanding G&T programs that start in third grade and reevaluating the 2006 decision to base admissions on a single test that has resulted in the percentage of minority children in these programs to plummet, improving instruction in middle school and increasing opportunities for students of color, of low income, income and of immigrant parents, and providing effective outreach for parents, for students applying to high school beyond distributing a 400-page high school directory and requiring attendance at high school fairs, including language accessible and culturally appropriate outreach to help ensure that families are not only informed about their high school options, but they also feel secure about the options that best meet the needs of their children, given that there are more than 700 public high school programs in New York City and 70 in District 2 alone. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much. And I just want to note earlier that we heard uh, calls for additional uh, social workers and counselors in schools, which we wholeheartedly support and endorse. That's a part of our budget response. And just to note that the DOE currently has a freeze on hiring social workers and counselors. And that impacts our immigrant communities as well because they can't hire bilingual. We should get bilingual social workers. Of course, workers. We, need, we, we desperately need bilingual counselors and social workers in our school system. So I truly appreciate And across all the languages. Of 100%, 100%. And I truly appreciate your advocacy on that point. Thank the panel very much. Thank you. Thanks. Uh -huh. OK. Uh, Bei Zhang, uh, Mark Crane, Phil Wong, uh, 
uh, Dao Yin, uh, uh, Chen Kwok, and Yafin Chu. Uh, you may begin, whoever. Sure. Good evening, Councilman. I guess the benefit of speaking so late is I get to hear the entire full day. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Yatin Chu. Um, I am a mother of uh, two kids in New York City public schools. I come as a parent and hopeful that we'll do the right things for our students. In recent years, every March, our public officials and the media complain about the lack of black students that receive offers to specialized high schools. What once used to be majority black and Latino specialized high schools are now emitting just 10%. The fix proposed by some people is to get rid of the emissions tests, the SHSAT. They deliberately ignore the inconvenient fact that the test hasn't changed. It does not discriminate on the color of your skin. What has changed is the quality of our education and the academic support systems, especially in the criti critical formative years, namely K through eight. That is where we must focus our efforts if we want to reverse the decline of our public schools. For the past decade, and certainly for the past six years, under Mayor de Blasio, state test results have remained at a mere 25% passing rate for black and Latino students. But there's little outrage compared to that of the specialized high schools, because the Blasio administration and the SHSAT opponents have scapegoated the test. They cry, kill the test, as if that will magically fix the terrible education that our kids are getting in K to eight. New Yorkers come from very diverse backgrounds, and we're all, we all hope that our children will have a chance at a better life. More opportunities, and for that, we need to give them a good education, one that inspires them and challenges them to reach their fullest potential. Although diversity has great advantages, it also means that our education system must meet the needs of a diverse student body so that the students can thrive. The mayor's plan for specialized high schools will benefit 2,000 kids at the expense of 2,000 other kids on the basis of skin color. He claims that this is equity, but all 4,000 students are economically disadvantaged, so the mayor's plan is in reality racist and discriminatory. Worse still, he is willfully neglecting the other 55,000 kids in eighth grade who will continue to fail at un unacceptably high rates. I say his plan is leave almost every child behind. True equity is giving all kids a good education in all of our 1,800 schools. I ask you, we should keep Shasat and work hard to develop a school system that will span past a political term and leave everlasting benefit. Thank you. So um, since I've listened to the entire day, would you give me two minutes to speak to some other issues that I've heard that I think is also related to this? And you know, we're all um, advocates of diversity. Um, I want equal opportunity for all the students of New York City. Um, I come from District 1, where we have implemented um, priority system for uh, those identified as disadvantaged. That's a great thing. However, I implore you to look at the maybe unplanned and unforeseen consequences of what that has done to my school. 
um, where 60% prior, priority is given to 60% of the seats of students that meet low income, um, temporary housing, and I think uh, learning disability, which is great. However, if those families don't choose our school and we don't fill those seats, we cannot notify other parents who do not meet those criteria and want to come to our school until the fall of the year that their students are starting. No parent of a five-year-old wants to move them a month after you know, getting them acclimated to their kindergarten and having to transfer. Now, this is what has happened in two years. Funding was pulled from our school because we weren't up to capacity. And um, it's going to continue to go that way until, you know, the school fails. Um, so I like to understand, like, what is the solve for that? Because, you know, we're getting, we're already an under-resourced school. And by implementing these aspirational and great diversification policies, it has hurt our schools tremendously. And we know that if we don't have the correct resources for kids that are already in the school, we're looking at a downward vicious cycle that will start for this school to not be performing at par, and therefore other parents won't choose to come to the school. So I want you to take that into consideration when you think about all of these policy is not just how it looks the first year, but what it looks like two years, three years, and five years and 10 years down the road. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dale Ying. Uh, I'm the executive VP of Queens Residents and Voters Coalition. Thank you, council members. Uh, thank you, everybody, for listening. I think um, many of you are tired. It's so long. Um, I just have a very quick question. You know, um, Team USA was not qualified for the 2018 FIFA soccer game. How do we do that? Can we make FIFA to change the rules to use hands? Because I know Americans are very good at the ball's game to use hands. In terms of the um, NFL, the National Football League. Unless you can allocate 7% of a group of people, say Asian American, to the National Football League, unless you can allocate 7% to the Hollywood A-list, we will not agree with your plan to change the particular SHSAT. That's the reason. Good politics, not just to change something from the right to the left. Good politics are improved continuous improvements. I'm, I don't know if everybody here is curious about the chancellor's salary. New York City pays big, big salary to hire the chancellor. The mayor appointed the chancellor. For what? It's not for fighting with one, two communities here. You came from Houston, we want you to improve the largest public school systems in the nation. As I said, the largest. If I say New York City public school system is the greatest, I think few people will agree with me. That's why a lot of the problem a lot of problems here. We need to fundamentally improve the public system, not be focused on the particular SHSAT. That's why the two specialists said SHSAT is only a small portion of the game. That's all from me. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, Councilman Traeger and uh, 
this committee for allowing me to speak. Uh, again, it's relatively late, but I would like to spend about 10, 15 seconds to correct a, a statement made by Assemblyman Charles Barron previously earlier today. Can you just uh, state your name for the record? Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Phil Wong, P-H-I-L-W-O-N-G. Uh, I'm a member of the uh, CEC 24, and I'm speaking here uh, representing uh, my school district. And uh, um, I will spend 15 seconds. Uh, Ch uh, Assemblyman Charles Barron said today that the uh, specialized high schools are open for all. That is not true because under his bill, if it's passed by Albany, only the top 7% of each school will be even considered for a specialized high school. So if we have students at the 92.7 percentile or 90, 92 and a half percentile, they won't even be considered uh, an, or be given an offer for the specialized high school. So that, no, not under his bill, not, it is not open to everybody. In the, in the present system, the heck Calandra system, anybody can go to the guidance office and say, I would like to sign up and take the test, no matter what your grade is. That system is open to all. So let, let, I want to correct that. Okay. All right, let me begin. Uh, um, I want to start by quoting uh, Bronx Borough President Ruben Diaz. He made an editorial a few days ago at a Caribbean News website. He's, he's a proud graduate of PS13 of the South Bronx District School Dis District 7. And he graduated with the uh, honors, uh, a GNT program. Uh, back then it's called SP. Uh, and is, he found it very disturbing to see that today there are zero, not only his school no longer has a GNT program, the entire school district has no GNT program. You can just Google uh, uh, Ruben Diaz. Uh, GNT program. Uh, so we, ha we have to ask, at least this was never brought up, what happened? Why were they eliminated? And where was the outrage? This like, we didn't hear a thing, we maybe heard crickets, all right? Now, compared to my district, District 24, right now we have five schools with, uh, with a very strong curriculum GNT programs, we have five schools. And unsurprisingly, these five schools produce a lot of students. They feed a lot of students to the specialized high schools. Okay, so this is, this is inequality as I see it. I, uh, this is uh, what Chancellor previously said, uh, implicit bias. What happened? Wait, oh, there, it's complicated, it, it's, uh, it's complicated why entire districts uh, got the funding got removed or the program got canceled. But this is the reason why we have schools that produces better students and feeds to specialized high schools and we have schools that just unprepare. One more example, okay, in my own district, District 24, we have schools that offer zero regions classes to eighth graders. Three blocks away we have another school that offers one regions class and then we have a better schools that offer three regions classes. So obviously they produce very different quality students, right? And, and this is a problem we need to address. We need to address because the top 7% of this school over here is not the same as the 7% of the school down there. And obviously they're not gonna do well in these specialized high schools because simply they're not prepared. Okay, I'll, I'll, end, I'll end this right here because my, my time is up. But this is a fundamental issue and we should get to restore this pipeline, restore the GNT program uh, with, with whatever admission stand, uh, requirements to be determined. But we need the GNT programs to produce the best students to feed the best schools. Thank you. I, I, I thank the panel. It just. You know, I, I, I'm careful with the language about referring to certain schools as the best schools or not. Um, as I mentioned in my opening testimony, you know, this hearing is much more than just eight or nine schools in New York City. And I again repeat one more time that I am a proud graduate of Murrow High School, a non-specialized school, but gave me a very special education and gifted education in many ways. Um, I just want to note again that uh, I read the, the borough president's uh, comments and also the Brooklyn Borough President's comments as well about GNT. GNT in its current form is highly problematic. Um, 
the issue is more than just uh, whether it's a pipeline or not. The pipeline is problematic. Whether, you know, I, I think we've heard over and over from research and, and, and advocates, and, and it's accurate that these types of programs actually exacerbate segregation uh, in our system. And it's really important to note that, again, look, look at how they, they're determined at such a young age, at, at four years old, which means that we, we, we're hearing cases of two-year-olds, two-year-olds already going through test prep, two-year-olds. When I met with Diane Ravitch, uh, who was, a, was an education historian and I, I think a champion on education, she, she noted, for example, that in, in Finland, I think in schools, uh, the children go to school at seven years old because they want children to be children uh, below seven. Um, and it just, I, I, we, we have to look at this, I, I agree, systemically as a whole. Specialized schools are, are a part of this conversation. But I will respectfully push back on language that folks refer to these schools as the best schools because I think we have to make sure that, that every neighborhood and every school um, in our neighborhoods have great programs, great opportunities. Um, and so I, I think we just have to be very mindful of, 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 that, of that language. I completely ap appreciate, uh, you know, I, I, I heard comments today about we, we support diversity, but we're gonna have to at, at get to concrete proposals on how do we actually make that happen. And that includes our entire school system. Uh, yes, K to eight, but also our high schools as well. Um, and I, I think one of the, the mistakes that the mayor made initially was, you know, you can't start a conversation on exclusion by excluding folks. And I think that has been well noted. But moving forward, we, we, we do need to have an inclusive dialogue, constructive dialogue. And that's why I do appreciate uh, uh, you know, my, my Wiley's uh, comments and, and her leadership and others on, on the diversity advisory group that I think is more reflective of, of the city of New York. Uh, about the important work of looking at this systemically across the board. So I, I, I thank you for, for, for your time, and uh, I, again, uh, Can I speak that. to that regarding- Just very agenda? briefly, because I want to hear from the next- Sure, uh, yes. sure. Um, yeah, I think the word GNT, I mean, as a parent, the, the school selections and the school quality is so poor that I'm not really looking at GNT as, oh, really gifted and talented. I'm just looking at those schools and those programs as well-performing schools, that's really it. I mean, I think it's really sad that um, our schools are so bad that we're really looking for these little nuggets of GNT um, to get just a good education in New York. So I, I agree, I mean, look, if all schools were great, we don't need them, we don't. But it's gonna take many years, possibly decades, for us to lift up our schools. And if you dismantle or change the GNT, you're basically telling parents that want a good education for their kids is look elsewhere, because we're not providing in New York City. Right, and I, what I'm saying is that, and I mentioned this earlier in my remarks about what I experienced in Murrow as, as far as uh, opportunities for advanced courses based on uh, certain strengths and interests that I had in history, for example, where I seem to excel better th than in math. In math, I needed more support. Uh, my classes were very diverse. My experience was very diverse. Murrow was very diverse. Right. Um, and I benefited from that uh, entire experience. Education is, is an experience. Uh, it, it's, 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 I was trained to make sure our students go uh, to become you know, independent critical thinkers. Uh, uh, and, and so I, I benefited from, from that Murrow High School experience. The, cu the current format of G&T uh, from my professional standpoint, and I certainly I pr appreciate you know your, your opinion, is that at, at testing kids at four um, does not really test them on intellectual capacity, so to speak. To me, it's just about matters of circumstance at times, or, or privilege, or whether kids are having good or bad days. I mean, a lot of research goes behind this about the different factors. So I think that to simply say that we just need, need more GNT, I, I think. That is not a part of the whole picture. Also, this conversation around bad schools, great schools. Um, I want to note for the record that I actually supported 
the, the approach behind the renewal school program to invest in public schools, it's never a mistake to invest in a public school. The issue was the perception of these schools, which I, in many cases is false. Um, we have to fight back against that. I have a high school in my district, John Dewey High School, that was really uh, took a, a lot of hits during the, 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 the Boomerg administration, f fed bad negative perceptions, and enrollment dropped because mm -hmm. there was perceptions it was not safe or not doing well. Well, I want to tell you that you know, with uh, there was a change in leadership and some investments and resources and support, at least from this council member, John Dewey is turning around. Um, and, but we had to fight back against these false perceptions that the school was bad. It's not a bad school. Um, it takes many years to do that. Right, right. So I, I, I just, I just want to just say that, to me, are there schools that are under-resourced? Yes. Uh, what does that mean as far as opportunities? Everything. Because when I visit schools uh, as chair of this committee in different neighborhoods, when I'm asking school leaders, uh, what can you do with additional resources, let me tell you what, what they share with me. They, they, wanna, they wanna hire a, a full-time school psychologist or hire a, a, a full-time social worker, not share them. That makes a difference because when I have visited schools that were under the, the renewal school program, one of the schools I visited in Queens, for example, when they hired a bilingual social worker, that made a tremendous difference uh, in terms of addressing their social emotional needs, which led to better academic outcomes, and the school is now off the renewal school list, and now it's called the Rye School, which is a whole other name issue, which, which the, the mayor, mayor created. But so my point is that when, when, when we address social emotional need, needs of all of our kids, there are better academic outcomes, but you can't do that if, if the schools are under-resourced. And the last thing I'll say is that in the specialized schools, one of the things I, I, I speak with former uh, current students. I've, I've actually visited Brooklyn Tech recently to visit. I met with students there and I met with staff as well. Um, one of the things, feedback that, that, I, that I received was that it's also some of these schools have greater access to more resources um, and more than other schools. And that's also a problem because all of our schools should be equipped with resources and opportunities for, for, all, for all of our children. So I, I just want to just, as I just note that as I, as I ask the chancellor to also sometimes just, you know, and actually he agrees that all of our schools should be good schools and not just, just be mindful of the language that there are schools, when folks say that there are schools that are the best and schools that are not the best because we, we create this, this this feeling and, and this real perception amongst our students that they're somehow inferior, and they're not. They have been deprived of certain opportunities uh, that have held them back. And so I, I, I don't see schools as bad. I see them as under-resourced, as understaffed, as marginalized, as not providing the types of opportunities and services that our children are entitled to. And, and, and if they did have those opportunities, all of our children uh, should be should be excelled. Well, since so. you brought up the renewal program and it, it was resourced, and the RAN uh, um, research that came out um, a few weeks ago showed that there was very little impact in terms of improving academic outcomes. So I'm not really sure putting more funding in some of these schools really led to anything that is beneficial. Well, um, I mean, aside from attendance marginally going up. There was no other positive academic outcome that came out of nearly $800 million of our New York City taxpayer dollars. Right. It, it, respectfully, these schools did not struggle overnight, and no one's going to fix things uh, overnight either. Uh, the mayor's and the chancellor's own documents stated that you need at least five years for uh, the program to really full, to fully take shape but the state ordered uh, reviews after one year or two years, and the mayor began to hold them accountable after three, mm -hmm. which I thought was also n not fair. Secondly, when you don't explain to the public adequately and sufficiently what a renewal school means, you create a, a perception problem. And what we saw in many of those schools, I visited a number of them, what we saw in those schools is that many uh, communities were confused about what that meant, and staff in those schools began to look for transfers out because they thought that school might close. Educators want to work in a stable environment. They, they're afraid of losing their jobs, so they looked, they trans, so quality educators transferred out of them. 
parents began to get, uh, get, get concerned about sending their kids to renewal school because they felt it was a label and enrollment dropped in some of them. So some of, them, some of these issues that you highlighted became self-fulfilling self prophecies yes. because the mayor, without any mandate, chose to label them such a way. I support community school approaches where we provide wraparound services, integrated services to, to meet, address social emotional needs. So it, to me, it was not just the issue of the, uh, we need actually, quite frankly, more resources in our schools, but I, I'll end there, mindful of time. I thank the panel and I'll call, call the next panel. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, okay, next we'll hear from uh, R Reverend uh, Adrian Thorne, uh, Luke uh, Davenport, Anna Minsky, uh, Raman uh, Rahan, uh, uh, Brandy Carbone, uh, Sharmali uh, uh, Ramad Ramadip, and Yifeng Chen. Sure. Uh, can folks just state their name very quickly, just make sure that we called every, everybody up and we have everyone here. Yes, I'm Reverend Adrian Thorne. Luke Davenport. Anna Minsky. Sharmali Ramudit. I'm Ethan Chen. We'll call up uh, two more. Um, I think it's Aspie Meyer. Debbie Meyer. Oh, Debbie Meyer. Meyer. Forgive me. Debbie Meyer and uh, David Rem. Yeah. Uh, I guess whenever folks are ready, that may begin. Good afternoon, or good evening, I guess yeah. now. Um, hi, my name is Reverend Adrian Thorne, and I'm a member of the Alliance for School Integration and Desegregation. I'm here to speak to the um, resolution to create a school diversity monitor in the Human Rights Commission. Um, as we all know, New York City has the most segregated schools in our nation, yet research shows that, um, research over many years shows that all of our children benefit from in integration. They benefit cognitively, academically, and socially. Um, but the public school that my uh, child attends has the highest percentage of white students in our district. So white students make up 15% of the DOE, but the school that we attend has 60% white students. And in first grade, my daughter was the only African-American uh, girl in her, in her classroom. So I think it's time for our school system here in New York to catch up with what the research says, which is that all of our students, regardless of socioeconomic background, race, um, benefit from an integrated school system. Um, I think that we are failing our children in the 21st century and that we need to um, have the help of this school diversity monitor to close this opportunity gap. I think it is not true that we have, as you have suggested, an achievement gap, but rather an opportunity gap, that things are not available to all of our children equitably. And equity for me, it's been defined in a few ways today, but it means that children have what they need. And all of our children don't have the same needs. And we want the city council to create this position to make sure that our children have what they need. I think that the annual reports that um, this position would offer us that would track the DOE's um, efforts to combat segregation and to implement integration are, are very important for our city. And so just to close, I would um, ask the council to support this resolution 
uh, to support the DOE in doing this work, and most importantly, to support our students who um, are counting on us and I think have been waiting for us for far too long. Thank you. Uh, uh, good evening, and hello, everyone. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify, Chairman Traeger. Uh, my name is Luke Davenport. Um, in my day job, I analyze data for schools, um, but I'm here in my capacity as a member of New York City Alliance for School Integration and Desegregation, as a few of us are as well. Uh, I'll just say a little bit about our um, coalition. We're all volunteers, but we have over a thousand members, um, and. We are educators, activists, parents, students, um, broad, very diverse cross-section of New York who all believe um, that we need to you know, actively desegregate and really and truly integrate our schools in New York City public schools. Um, we wholeheartedly embrace the five R's framework for real integration that the students of Integrate NYC have put forward. Um, and you'll see those reflected in our policy document, which I'd encourage you to take a look at. Uh, we released a policy platform in June 2018 um, which calls for a number of things, one of which is eliminating G&T programs, another is eliminating middle school screens, among other things. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about, um, because it, it, at ACID we talk a lot about um, historical patterns, you know, what has happened in the past, right? This isn't the, the first uh, chapter of this history. Um, and what I think you see over and over again is whenever the city attempts to remedy de uh, segregation in the schools, there's a backlash. Right? And often that backlash isn't framed as far as um, you know, opposing integration. No one is saying we don't want uh, integrated schools. I haven't heard anyone say that. Uh, and yet, we have to recognize that regardless of the intent, that what has actually happened has been continuing to entrench segregation further uh, over many, many decades and many, many years. Uh, and I fear deeply that that's what we're doing now. If we pursue further G&T programs, uh, if we open more specialized schools, do more things. Uh, if we keep the Shazat, we're doing more things that separate students, smaller minorities of students uh, from the larger group. Um, so I think there's a lot that could be said about the problems with the Shazat um, that don't even actually have to do with diversity, frankly. If, if you weren't considering that, you would still have a good reason to eliminate the Shazat. I mean, we've, we've heard a lot of um, evidence about uh, the fact that grades are more predictive of future success than tests, right? That's pretty well established in the, in the research. Um, you have other aspects, you know, test prep, things like that. Um, but I think there's kind of a larger question, and then I'll, and I'll wrap up, um, which is why are we okay with having these separated educational experiences to begin with, right? Where is the evidence that supports them as being good education practice? And in fact, if you look at, uh, there were two 2014 studies around the specialized high schools that indicated that students who go to specialized high schools did no better in terms of getting into, through, and the prestige of the colleges that they went to than similar scoring peers who went to other high schools, right? Uh, you talked a lot about, you know, what is a good school, right? What, getting around that language. Uh, I think that's a really important point. Um, that research is also true for g and It's very, there's very, the, the research, the record on whether or not G&T programs are effective is mixed at best, right? So I think we need to ask ourselves, why are we constantly wanting to create separate schools by ability when the evidence doesn't support that approach necessarily? Um, so I'll leave it there. Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. Hi, my name is Anna Minsky. I'm a New York City public school parent. I'm also a member of my community education council in District 5 in Harlem, and a member of the Alliance for School Integration and Desegregation, like the others on the panel. Uh, and in my professional life, I provide technical assistance on the use of data to guide systemic and structural reforms at Menace Associates. Um, so um, I guess I want, it was important to me to come today because as a parent, I wanted to call on the DOE, and I guess they're not here anymore, uh, to take drastic action thoughtfully and inclusively so that our schools can become truly integrated, um, citing the five R's framework um, for the children who are in the system right now. And I wanted to use this opportunity to call on the mayor and the chancellor to take immediate actions on the recommendations of the school diversity advisory group to em eliminate middle school admissions screening and to eliminate all gifted and talented programs. Um, but for the rest of my testimony, I would like to focus on the two um, bills that relate to data transparency um, on the communication 
as on my experience on the Community Education Council, I can speak to the importance of having the school level, level demographic data um, and the expansion under the bills would be excellent. Um, I can talk about the ways that we use it, but I'm sensitive to time. Um, there are basic, the bill is thoughtful about um, gifted and talented programs and how they've been used as a mechanism of school segregation. I um, mean, it calls that out specifically, but there are a couple of other structures that I think are important that aren't handled right now in the bill, and my written testimony talks about it more specifically. Those are the use of self-contained special education classrooms, uh, the use of admission screening, as people have talked about, and the use of school transfers, which in our district where charters, charter school students outnumber public school students um, become a very important mechanism for school segregation. Um, and I just finally, wanted to conclude, since nobody else mentioned this, by raising the question of whether, um, as we think about designing these bills about data, we're comfortable with asking every student to identify with the bureaucratic racial classification system that has been used primarily to promote racism. And might not this be an opportunity to nudge the DOE to allow each parent and student to identify their own racial and ethnic identity on their own terms? <clears throat> Hi, my name is Sharmali Ramuda. I'm a member of the Community Education Council for District 3 <clears throat> and also a member of ACID and many other groups that were represented in this room or I pop into their meetings. Um, and so many of those other voices in this room spoke so very eloquently about um, why we gathered here today and um, precisely to the data that, and experiences that have motivated the, this hearing today. So what I would like to speak to is um, the lens that I've developed and how I developed that lens in my work and how it informs my, my view on um, CEC3. Uh, so what, and that position is rooted in social justice-centered leadership and policymaking. And how I got there is um, first by doing historical research. At New York's Historical Society, there's a rich trove of resources that document the political and civic opposition to desegregation. Dr. Matthew Delmont explains in his book, Why Busing Failed, Race Media and the National Resistance to School Desegregation, that New Yorkers were just as biased as residents of Alabama and Mississippi, and many New York politicians and citizens did not want the Brown decision to come to their schools. So you only have to travel uptown a few more stops to our neighbors in District 5 to Harlem Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture for access to all the other scholarship knowledge and historical insight into the root causes of this resistance, as explained by Ella Baker, Langston Hughes, and other luminaries of the Harlem Renaissance. So historically, policymakers only know how to segregate. If you would like to now do the opposite, my recommendation is to seek out this scholarship that describes what social justice-centered leadership and policymaking looks like. Dr. Sonia Douglas Horsford, Janelle Scott, and Gary Anderson wrote a book, The Politics of, Edu uh, of Education Policy in an Era of Inequality, um, that has really informed my thinking and how um, I make my decisions on CEC3. So you have taken uh, the momentous step in legit legitimizing 65 years of education advocacy in the New York City educational landscape. Moving forward, if you would like to do more than just restate the obvious, it is time to partner with all of the research institutions, the CBOs, the other stakeholders who were here in this room that have been advocating for these very oversight commissions, task forces, demographic data metrics, and advisory groups um, to help correct the segregation that is so starkly visible in our New York City schools. And I have an example of what we've done in District 3, I can put on my official CEC3 hat and speak to that, which is um, just that uh, the Community Education Council for District 3 has made diversity and equity one of our primary goals as a council. And CEC3 represents the Upper West, West Side and parts of Harlem. In a resolution that the high school committee passed, in which we passed unanimously, we speak to segregation and inequities that exist across the entire system and recommendations that should look at all of that. Um, we speak to the scarcity mindset, which is a barrier to addressing this. We speak to the complexity of the admissions process, um, which 
needs a comprehensive, and we speak to then a comprehensive plan where integration and diversification efforts by the city have not included proposals to improve programming and leadership at underperforming elementary and middle schools or a discussion of the future low-performing high schools that are not adequately preparing students for college and careers. So efforts to expand and replicate successful school models need to be a large part of the equity efforts. So we continue to work on these efforts in uh, CEC3, and we look forward to partnering with you in a comprehensive approach. Good evening, everybody. My name is Yifen Chang. I'm a parent of um, two kids, age six and three. Yes, my older son, who's age six, is in GNT. So um, let me tell you a little bit about myself. So um, I came to this country at um, age 16 as a new immigrant. I didn't speak English. I went to New York High School, also in Brooklyn. So um, well, New York High School, it's a great school. I mean, it provided me with all I needed to succeed. So uh, eventually, I went to um, Stanford to obtain my PhD degree in statistics. And I have been a data scientist since then. So I have over 10 years of um, experience analyzing data, building statistical models. So I do want to point out that people say, you know, like GNT or um, specialized high school test doesn't measure the performance. It does. And as you can see in the recent the New York Times METIS study, right, there's uh, apparently a very strong, very significant statistical um, significance um, for the correlation between the performance of students at the SHSAT um, and the performance when, uh, when they um, actually start the high school in the first few years. And also, when I was a high school student at New Utrecht, I did a study myself, um, taking an advanced placement statistical class back then. And I do find that there's also association between the um, students, like grade point average, and also their performance on the AP exams. So um, that's that. Uh, so I'm for test, and also because I'm working in this field of data science, so I know the need for the artificial intelligence, for the big data, for all the modern um, technologies. That's why, like, I totally disagree when people say, you know, like, oh, we should get rid of testing. If you get rid of testing, what could be used as a universal standard to, you know, justify if students are performing or not? It's like you have to take an exam to become a doctor, right? You have to um, take a job interview, answer all the technical questions to see if you are a fit for the right position, right? And also, um, secondly, I think it's really about parental choice when it comes to school, right? So, um, I mean, like, as a, as a, as a parent of um, two toddlers, age three and six. My son is in the first grade, as I mentioned before. I think it's about, I'm a full-time working my, uh, mom, and also my husband is a full-time uh, working dad. So every, every night we get home after 7 p.m., we have to sit down with him and make sure that he learns like, what he's learning at school today, and then like, we ask him about like, what's going on at the school throughout the day, right? So it's really about parental engagement and involvement, right? The parents have to be there for the kids, right, in order um, to make sure they are learning. They are learning how to read, right, and do the basic math. So, um, and also, like, as a New Yorker myself, I'll call it, so um, we love diversity. That's the reason that I chose to come back to this great city after spending five years at Stanford doing my PhD. So, like, have you guys ever considered the economic impact of like all this, you know, getting rid of testing, get rid of everything? We want all, like, we all want best school for all and best education for all our kids, right? I think the economic impact, as I could feel it, right? I recently read on the newspaper um, from the pre previous year, like, um, survey, there are like 40,000 New Yorkers moving, right, leaving the city. So if all this, like, change of um, taking, taking down, like, um, 
whatever, like really elite schools and then taking away this and that, right? It will result in a lot of middle income families who want best for their kids to leave the city eventually. So I do want like all of us to also take um, this into consideration. And lastly, like I said, the specialized high school is only 1% of the school, right? What about the 99%? What are you gonna do with that? Why don't we fix all the schools? Why don't we fix the failing k 2 aids? I think um, Chancellor Carenza is framing the uh, diversity for the failing of the schools. The causation is wrong. As a statistician, I could, I could confidently say it's the other way around. If you fix the face, you, if you fix the failing K-8 schools, then all the diversity problem will be gone. All the schools are great. Why are we sitting here having this fight over good school, bad school? You know, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. So, oh, there's one more. I'm sorry. Yes. So thank you, because that's the perfect segue to what I'm going to talk about. Um, I've got to talk um, before I've been on the very first panel, so this is different for me. Um, I want to talk about not the 40% of kids that might get to take the Shishats or the G the G T test, but the 60% of kids that never learned how to read in our schools. Uh, segregation is, is a symptom of a lot of issues, and literacy is a very important one. Um, we know our low literacy rates mirror the rest of the nation. We know struggling readers do not lack intellect or curiosity and it affects people of all races and backgrounds. I always thought public education was a bootstrap and a silver bullet. I thought public education is what states provide for citizens to foster civic participation and create a workforce to drive our economy, not fill its prisons. I thought elementary school teachers could teach reading. And then I found myself a parent of a struggling reader and everything I knew about public education was challenged. My son is dyslexic, like about 20% of the population, and like most struggling readers, he requires instruction based on the research behind reading. Most schools don't deliver that, even though dyslexia represents 80% of all learning disabilities. A resourceful parent can find and pay for tutors with appropriate skills or a psychologist able to evaluate their kid or an attorney who can sue the school district for free and appropriate education. That doesn't just cost money. It costs time during the day when most people are working and they can't make calls, they can't go to appointments. Um, a savings account's really important too. My family spent $90,000 to try to keep my kid in public school. The taxpayers of New York have generously put in $150,000 to help him become a reader and writer in a specialized dyslexia school. So if education were a bootstrap or a silver bullet, we wouldn't allow so many kids, nearly 60%, to flail and not learn to read. Struggling readers get disconnected from school. They never reach their potential. They become statistics rather than leaders. They have mental health issues, some as early as grade school. Without really resourceful parents, they are likely to become homeless, victims of child abuse, domestic violence, or part of the criminal justice system. So I wonder, are schools led and staffed entirely by people who, as kids, found school easy? Did Title IX strip the teaching colleges of the best and the brightest students? Why are schools teaching science but not respecting the science of reading? Why are university departments so siloed from one another and not informing the doctors, the social workers, or the educators? The neuroscience is clear. Dyslexic students and other struggling readers succeed when schools address the five pillars of literacy. No science backs up the incredibly ubiquitous balanced literacy or whole language instruction. Um, we should really end the reading wars. What else can we do? We can screen early for the risk of dyslexia. Pediatricians could do this along with hearing and vision tests and family history. Pre-K and kindergarten teachers could do this. Social workers could help families find resources early, and help parents understand what to demand at school. Teaching colleges can play a much bigger role in ensuring all children learn to read. They can prepare teachers to understand reading. School districts shouldn't have to retrain their teachers. So if these struggling readers learn to read before they need to read, learn to read, we'll reap the benefits in many ways. More room in special education for kids that really need it, uh, fewer kids will act out with frustration, classrooms will be easier to manage, and the demand for great middle schools and high schools will increase. Um, my formerly illiterate fourth grader left a Harlem public school. He had also um, uh, qualified for GNT um, and is now an eighth grader at the Windward School for Children with Dyslexia. He will attend Bard Early um, College next year. With the science of reading in place, education can be 
come the proverbial bootstrap. So um, I'd like to propose some kind of reporting bill on literacy. What are teaching colleges preparing their teachers with? And what are the schools using to teach these kids? Um, I took my family, um, we went to Washington, we went to the African American Museum and the Holocaust Museum. So we were having a lot of discussions about Jim Crow and the Southern strategy. When we walked up to a poster in the Holocaust Museum that explained that the Nazis made a policy not to teach Polish people to read. And my son just looked at me and was like, do we have the same policy? Thank you. I want to thank you because uh, I want to note also that there have been systematic efforts to even uh, for the, in the DOE not to even mention or specify dyslexia on an IEP, which adds to the systematic deprivation of services uh, to, to our students. And I truly appreciate your very <coughs> passionate, meaningful advocacy on this issue. And uh, I do appreciate that. And just to, um, I, I want to just to, Note that uh, we have a New Utrecht High School graduate here. New Utrecht High School is where I taught, uh, and uh, I, I'm very proud to have taught at New Utrecht, another very di good, diverse school. And I appreciate that you refer to it as, as a great school, because there are great schools beyond, uh, you know, uh, just the specialized schools. And um, I, I would just say respectfully that when when folks say fix fix the other schools or but if we keep referring them as failing or bad, uh, that adds to the problem. Because in my opinion, and I appreciate that you went to Stanford and, and, and have data, and I truly, is that when you, when folks refer to schools as bad, uh, or look at data, right, uh, on the school report card's webpage and look up certain things, I would encourage families to also look up what is their fair student funding allocation? Fair student funding allocation is how much they receive in city dollars uh, to support the students in that school. The majority of our schools, overwhelming majority of our schools, are not receiving all that they're entitled to. And so I refer to some schools as, quite frankly, under-resourced, understaffed, and they cannot effectively meet the needs of all of their kids. I agree that if all schools were properly resourced and staffed and equipped with the opportunities which all our kids deserve, that will be the ultimate game changer. There's, there's no question about it. Uh, it's it just, I try to be mindful that as we've heard from some advocates, some folks come up with, with recommendations on how to integrate, diversify schools, uh, to refer back to uh, some of the prior testimony, some of those efforts have actually exacerbated um, segregation in our schools, and segregation has many forms, racial, academic, uh, based on stu students uh, w w with special needs. Uh, also, as I mentioned before, there are schools in District 75, which really do not get talked a lot about, that serve already a very, uh, uh, you know, special needs po student population that are not even fully accessible to them. Uh, and, and so this has taken, this is a, this is a greater, conversa broader conversation. I am just asking folks, uh, as a former teacher and as someone who cares deeply about public schools, that to be mindful of our language, to be mindful that schools need help, need resources, need support. Uh, and if folks keep referring to schools as failing, bad, terrible this, that perception becomes then someone's reality and they will not enroll their child in their neighborhood school or this, rather than work together to improve all of our schools and to demand public officials to get to, to deliver the resources. We heard before from a state legislator who noted on the record that New York State government just passed a budget that technically was not an increase for our schools. And some of the same folks then complain about inequities and problems in our school system. You can't have it both ways. You must, we must get resources into our schools, particularly in those schools in communities that have been historically marginalized and shortchanged in many different ways. So again, I, I thank everyone here for your very powerful, passionate testimony in your work. Thank you, thank you so much.
uh, folks, because we are, uh, the translator has to leave uh, very, very soon, if, if, if you don't mind, if we just have uh, a, a panel just to come up very briefly just to speak with the translator so we don't lose the translation services, if that's okay. Thank you. I, I truly do, do appreciate that. Um, so the translator will, will say the names. Uh, I call the people. It's Li, 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 Man, Li Man. Man Li. And uh, Hu, Hu Yuhua. And uh, Zhong Jing. And uh, Zhao, yes. Zhao Zhanwen. And uh, Liu Qing. Okay, whenever folks are ready, please. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Jin Zhong. Uh, my name is Jin Zhong. My name is Jin Zhong. I'm first generation of first generation of immigrant. Um, I was the mother of two kids in the public school. Uh, the two kids is all born in America. Today I coming to participate in this hearing. It's feeling the mayor's proposal. He feels like uh, uh, the mayor was racial discrimination to the Asian people. Uh, mayor is uh, trying to cover his, his failure in the education. Uh, Oh, he's tried to uh, raise up the conflict about uh, inside the races. Uh, this is not vice. Uh, mayor, sh mayor should be pay attention to the PK8 and, uh, and so on. Uh, should be pay attention to the basic education. 我相信考试是对学习能力的考量和认可. Uh, the test is, uh, is reflected people's ability. 好像医生, 律师, 会计师, 护士等等, Same as the nursing, lawyer, uh, attended to test the same thing. 我支持考试. I support the test. Thank you. Okay. Uh, 大家晚上好. Uh, my name is Liman. Uh, good evening. Uh, 我是一个七个月大孩子的妈妈. 
I'm a mother of the seven months kids. Uh, uh hearing about the proposal of mayor try to cancel the SHSAT, I feel um, it's not uh, understandable. Uh, Everybody should have a fair chance to learn. 如果一个孩子, 他应该获得一个很的教, uh, if a kid they try the best, she will get a, a better chance to study. Uh, so the, the mayor says she wants to give everybody a chance to learn better. So why they didn't teach the kids to learn hard? Because the mayor to, to do the way to let the, the people not that uh, qualified, not that study hard, to better school. So I think that you have to give everyone a fair chance, and not to change the rules to let them get a fair chance. You should give them a fair way to study. Uh, it's not uh, the change of the policy to let them achieve that. Um, 好的, uh, that's all I want to say. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Councilman uh, Mark Chaker. And um, um, I, before I start my statement, I want to ask you something. Is uh, um, for me, I. Uh, listened to the to this hearing almost a whole day since this morning, and uh, I find that uh, it looks like you or uh, council members just choose some uh, speakers first, and uh, then uh, the real public hearing is very late, and after most of the council members left, after all the media's left, and. Uh, like uh, I found out, like uh, Miss Shino uh, Tanikawa, she came in late afternoon and uh, she has a chance to speak, and then she left. And uh, I want to know so what kind of privilege she has. And uh, I don't un understand and I don't accept this kind of public hearing. <laughs> anyway, so. Why I'm here today? Because the mayor de Blasio filled our schools. He wasted 773 million on renewal program. And uh, just now you said uh, he needed five years, and he did it in the office for five years. And he, he didn't uh, improve the schools. He closed the, some schools. And uh, I, uh, I don't think that's uh, uh, correct. And uh, that's uh, not, uh, you still give uh, all the senators, they still give him the mayor control, that's uh, unaccept, uh, acceptable. And uh, the Chancellor uh, Carranza, he came in New York for one year, and he did nothing just uh, to divide in our communities. And uh, why now uh, City Council and the Chancellor and uh, you all want to eliminate the SHSAT, the test? is to try to help Mayor WSU to cover his failure. And uh, as you said before, that uh, there are very few AP classes in some high schools. And uh, many, class, uh, many schools are under resources or poor performance. And uh, as, as, our pa uh, as us parents, we know that. And uh, we have no choice. We don't want our kids to go to that schools. That's the reality. You have to face the reality. Reality. Otherwise, you cannot fix the problem. You cannot uh, avoid to say some words and uh, do some, avoid something, and uh, that's not the way to fix the problem. 
and uh, the reality is SHSAT works. It works for decades, and all the students, the eight schools, they benefit from this test. So why don't you, I'm not uh, targeting you, but all the, because I prepared this for all the council members and uh, everyone in education. So why don't you fix K2A first? Why don't you improve all the school first before you touch SHSAT? Why you put the card in before the horse? So at the last, I want to you, uh, all the council members, ask yourself. You want to do something right for all the kids, or you want to do something wrong, but you can reach some political goal. Thank you. I, 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 I appreciate your, your uh, passion on this issue. It's just the, the students that testified uh, at the start of the hearing, uh, they're a part of a, uh, an advocacy network of kids, students that have been working on many of these issues for students uh, for, for a number, number of years. And uh, to you know, credit their hard work and to validate their hard work, certainly we wanted to hear from student voices. And I would note for you, that prior to this hearing, um, I, I visited Brooklyn Tech. I met with Brooklyn Tech students, a, a variety of students, not just one group. I met with the staff. Uh, I have heard, and I, I will say that it, it, it pains me how divisive many of these things, issues have become, and it does have an impact on those student bodies as well. I appreciate your uh, phrasing that schools are under-resourced and understaffed because that's a big part of, of this issue here as well. And the question becomes, why are certain communities more under-resourced than others? And with regard to the specialized schools, I acknowledge, fully understand, that many of the students that are attending the specialized schools themselves uh, don't come from economic privilege. You know, many, I, I understand that. But th what, what I'm hearing is that the schools themselves have access to, to more resources than other, other schools, and that becomes an issue, again, in terms of equity and fairness across our system. So I, I, I'm sorry that folks are waiting. This has been a long hearing. Um, uh, these, these subjects will require, will have a lot of passionate testimony, um, but I, I have been working hard to hear all voices, and I want to hear all voices. I will continue to hear from, from all voices because we need to have everyone here at the table. So I, I, I appreciate uh, you, you being here and waiting, waiting this long. V very quickly, last word, and then we have to we have to move on. Yeah, just one minute. So thank you very much. Just as I said, I'm not talking to you. I'm just uh, yes. uh, like I talking to all the council members. I appreciate not, that, and I appreciate that you stay so late with us. Yes, and I really thank you for your hard work. Thank you. But uh, talking about the specialized high school, I want to say is the government spend much less money on the, those kids. For example, I heard from Stevenson High School. Right. The kids, the money spent on them is much less than the regular high school. Why? Because they get money from the alumni. And they get help from other, the, graduate, the students graduated. Right. Because they want to come back to help their school. Well, also, yeah. just to note for the record, because we have to move on, the city itself, the city government itself, adds a, adds a weight on the funding formula to those specialized schools. Uh, so that's in addition to whatever they might receive from their alumni associations, the, the fair student funding formula adds actually a weight for specialized schools. So they get more money because they're specialized schools, which adds to this concerns about equity. But I, I do, we, we have to move on. So I, I again, appreciate your time here, here this evening. Thank you so much. OK, uh, thank you all for, again for your patience. Long, long day. Um, uh, Jerome uh, Kramer, uh, Chris Giordano, George Lee, and uh, uh, we have a rep here from the New York Changzhang Chinese community. Yes, please. So we'll call two, two more folks up. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. OK. 
Okay, uh, Sharon uh, Just and uh, Greg Waltman. Well, these are low chairs. <laughs> I do. Just one copy, though. Thank you. And I do appreciate this panel's patience because we wanted to make sure that the folks had transition services before the transition had to leave. So I do appreciate your, your patience. Um, and whenever folks are ready, you may, you may begin. Uh, my name is Sharon Just. I dropped off two letters earlier. I don't know if the committee, or if you all have all received those. I'm a PA co-president, parent of three, and speaking with respect to data crunching done for the D3 high school committee. Uh, this data combines the DOE demographics, high school directory, test results, city-state ranking for all New York high schools. The Shashat schools enroll 15,500 students, so I grouped them to compare against 19, the top 19 non-specialized schools, which enroll the same number of kids, around 16,000, but which use mixed admission methods, not just the Shashat. If you look purely on an academic basis, not discussing demographics, the Shashat schools significantly outperform those top 19 non-specialized, which are schools such as Beacon, Eleanor Roosevelt, Townsend. The Shashat schools are 108, 180 points higher on SAT score. Their SA, ACT scores are four to five points higher. Region scores seven or more points higher than the top non-specialized schools for the same group of 16,000 students. The question on the Shashat, thus, should not be framed as get rid of the Shashat because other things predict performance better. That's just not correct based on the data. The question is whether the Shashat misses students who could otherwise have performed at those levels. The status quo is not acceptable because it has led to the Shashat schools under-enrolling black and Hispanic children. But neither is the DOE proposal, which would take a child at the 99th percentile who's third in their homeroom of 30 children and leave them in a school with no options to reach the specialized high school looking at what is available in the rest of the schools. In the rest of the schools, even if you include the Shashat schools, only 5% of New York high schools even offer at least four of five AP STEAM classes, AP Bio, Chemistry, Physics, Calculus AB, and Calculus BC. The Shashat schools de facto are serving as New York City's advanced STEAM schools, Bronx Science, High School of Science, Math, and Engineering, Brooklyn Tech. I'm a Georgia Tech alumnus and an engineer, and an event this month, the Georgia Tech president told alumni that if you haven't had algebra in eighth grade, calculus and physics in high school, you're not getting into Georgia Tech. Furthermore, their typical prep is AP calculus and AP physics, and two years of calculus, not just one. New York City is woefully underprovided in high quality STEAM high schools. When people say the solution is to make all schools better, the problem is that 85% of schools are below the US average SAT, and the average size of those schools is only 500 kids. How do you take a 500 kid school, which is about 100 seniors, and try to put AP Physics in it? For one child, that will not happen. You must aggregate those high performers in order to fill classes of AP Physics, AP Chemistry, AP Calculus, and if you don't provide those classes and those options, you are shutting the door to schools like Georgia Tech, and that is patently wrong for New York City to do. New York City needs to expand the number of seats in the Shashat schools, but also open the door for, the, for children to enter with the top middle school approach so that you have a pathway in by test and a pathway in without a test and allow both pathways as equally important. You can do so by expanding the number of seats. I've laid out a very detailed proposal that adds 5,000 seats or 10,000 seats to take the Shashat schools from 15,000 to 20,000 seats or 25,000 seats, and it steps in enrollment in a way we're at the end of the time of the phase in of sophomores, freshmen, juniors, et cetera. If it's 25,000 seats, it's 56% Shashat entry, 44% top middle schoolers. If you get to 20,000 students, it's 69% Shashat, 31% top middle schoolers. And I can show you exactly where to get those 5,000 seats. You've got a 2,500 seat school coming online in Queens. Queens currently only has York, which is a 500 seat Shashat school. Dedicate that as a Shashat school. Take one school each in each of the other four boroughs of a 600 seat school, because remember I said there are around 500 seats, find a 600 seat school that's failing. There's a bunch of them. Close it, migrate to a Shashat school. And right there you've got a plan that's 69, 31, and meets both. It's a win-win approach. We've got to stop battling over who gets in the lifeboat and build more boats. Thank you. Thank you, President, uh, Chairman Traeger. I had a speech prepared earlier, 
And uh, <clears throat> I changed it because Chancellor Carranza made an outrageous statement in his testimony this morning. But I think I'll change it again <laughs> uh, because I heard some more outrageous things said. Uh, I heard that the specialized high schools should not be considered as better schools, that all schools are good. And with all due respect to your loyalty to Ed Murrow and, uh, <clears throat> and John Dewey, the fact is that the specialized high schools, uh, uh, Stuyvesant, Bronx Science, and Brooklyn Tech produced 14 Nobel Prize winners, John Dewey and, uh, <clears throat> and Ed Murrow. Uh, and the Finnish schools that Diane Rapich is so fond of did not produce 14 Nobel Prize winners. The three specialized high schools produced a disproportionate number of math, math Olympiad gold, gold medalists and physics Olympiad gold medalists. Neither do the Finnish schools, nor Ed Murrow, nor John Dewey produce them. I'm not saying that you get an invalid education at Ed Murrow. I'm not saying that the people who come out are any less moral human beings or any less complete human beings. But if you're looking for a particular kind of STEM education and excellence, there is nothing better than the three specialized high schools, and then the eight specialized high schools, and what produced them is the SHSAT. That is the only thing that curated class after class of distinguished STEM students. I'm following what you said, actually. So if you and some of the previous people who spoke here um, uh, talk about uh, all schools being the same, or there's no good schools and no bad schools, where some of the other people said, I want my, to send my kids to a good school, you're talking at different levels. I mean, you're both right in some sense, but if you're going to make Stuyvesant into an Ed Murrow, people are going to leave New York City. The 40,000 people that Yifan talked about, that's going to happen. But if you make Ed Murrow into Stuyvesant, people will come to the New York City public school system. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. My turn. Hi, Kasama uh, Mochega. Uh, I from the New York Sumjen Chinese Community Foundation Association right, Chairman. Do we catch your name? I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Min Lee. Thank you. Uh, also, I'm a Democrat candidate for Queens County Community in 2020. Okay. Uh, I want to say, you know, like. The Matthew Palacio, he said the Asian uh, student percent too high because this is, I not agree. This is not helping for the student uh, to get a better education. So, I mean, it should be key for the testing. And how you to get like more students get a change? I mean, the city, city and state get a funding for the, for the junior high school. So when school get a funding, they can hire the teacher to teach in the special high school testing. Make all the students get more chance. And another part, you know, the city should be create like more, uh, five more special high school. You get more space. So you, I, I mean, there's more students get more chance. And keep for the chat, please. Thank you. My name is David Rem. As a native lifelong New Yorker, I am a proud father of a half Colombian Hispanic daughter born to a first generation immigrant mother who was a September 2019 accepted Stuyvesant High School incoming student. I was appalled at hearing Chancellor Carraza's comment that anyone who wants to keep the SHSAT exam unchained, unchanged as the sole criteria for children gaining entry into New York's eight specialized high schools is a racist person. I believe that Chancellor Carranza owes all New Yorkers an apology. And I call on the Mayor de Blasio to fire Carranza for making such a blatant <laughs> racial statement. I thank the New York Senator John Liu for publicly calling out Carranza's statement as a racist statement. It is insulting to me to think that my brilliant minority Latina daughter would somehow need de Blasio's proposed racial quota in order to gain entry into a specialized high school. Ava scored a 600 on her SHSAT exam, as well as scoring, scoring a perfect 4.5 on her New York State math scores, as well as scoring a 4.2 on her ELA test 
state test. Ava scored 43 points above Sir Iverson's cutoff of 557. Ava has been a lifelong 99 to 100 report card student from kindergarten to eighth grade. I'm the product of the New York City system, 1970s and 80s, when the same SHSAT test was also the sole entrance test to gain entry into these specialized high schools. In the 70s and 80s, Brooklyn Tech was predominantly black and Hispanic. I lived here, I saw it. Just like Stuyvesant was predominantly Jewish. Nobody had a problem with the test then. Today, the majority of their specialized high school students are composed of a dis different minority, namely Asian. So why all of a sudden do de Blasio's Carranza's racist anti-Asian proposed policy to get rid of the SHSAT exam warrant even any consideration? They don't, and they shouldn't even be considered. In fact, race should not even be listed on the SHSAT exam itself. In private and Catholic schools, when children take that test, there is no bubbling in for your race. I used to bubble in human race back in high school. There are some 439 New York public city schools, eight of which are the specialized high schools. We should leave the eight specialized high schools alone and focus instead on the 430 or whichever ones are those which are failing miserably. So how do I propose to fix the failing New York City public school system? Firstly, you must fix K through eight. That's the base for any student to achieve great things in life, which the majority of it's in shambles. Secondly, there are 27,000 kids that took the specialized exam test this year and there's only 5,000 seats. You have to add numerous other specialized high schools to the system. Thirdly, we should even listen to some of the specialized high school principals, such as Stuyvesant's principal, Eric Carranza, who is also a Latino man. He opposes Chancellor Carranza's and Mayor de Bill de Blasio's plan, proposed plan to get rid of the exam. Further, fifthly, we desperately need to add more gifted and talented programs. They still make a difference. I understand the particulars, but they still make a tremendous difference. We also need to add free uh, specialized prep classes in all schools, in all boroughs, throughout all racial areas. Lastly, and the most importantly, and I heard you, you knock it a little bit, but the 15 feeder schools, they work, they're proven. We need to copy and duplicate that in all middle schools. Why would you not want to copy and duplicate something that has been producing, whether it's whatever the reason that's occurring in that school, whether it's the teachers, the quality of the teachers, whatever, the funding, the money, the resources, whatever, you have the data, it's real easy, simple. Also, do not continue to pass children from grade to grade who can't even meet the New York State exams, and that happens all the time. The mayor and the chancellor also grossly misrepresent to New York's public about their discovery program, which, in my opinion, unfairly allows students to gain entry into that, and, and he states that they missed the cutoff by just a few points. That's not the case. Every single one of those discovery program children did not even meet the minimum requirements such as the 448 score at Brooklyn Latin. And actually, you discriminate against other black, Asian, Hispanic children that fortunately did not reside in the mayor's, one of the de Blasio's carefully crafted and racially biased residential zones, AKA the 60 score poverty residential level. So you allow in an Asian, black, Hispanic child who scored way under the cut, not a few points, 70, 100 points, and you didn't let the Hispanic, black, Asian child, whatever, in that scored one point lower than the cutoff. There's no quick fix that de Blasio and Carranza so desperately want. The New York City public school system broke down over two decades ago. So I'm going to give him his props. He's not entirely to blame. There was the Bloomberg administration and other past administrations such as the Dinkins administration. Okay? But therefore, eliminating the SHSAT test is not the quick fix to a remedy caused by a severe decades-long problem. 
The New York City public school system will take many, many, many long years to improve, not the five years that's spoken about tonight. This is reality, but this is a reality that mo most people do not want to hear. Chancellor Carrazza is quick to mention that no other high school in the country relies on a single test, the SHSAT test, for children to gain entry into a specialized high school. I would counter with this, has been said multiple ten times tonight. No other specialized school in the country, in the country, has provided 14 Nobel Prize winners and scientists and all the rest. The SHSAT exam is the fairest, race-blind, gender-blind, ethnicity-blind, wealth-privilege-blind method to establish which brilliant children get into New York's eight specialized high schools. In closing, let it be known that I am not Asian. However, I love Asian people, and I love all people, and that's the God's honest truth. In keeping the SHSAT exam, I have I have zero special interest in keeping the SHSAT exam, as my daughter Ava has already been accepted into the top specialized high school, Stuyvesant High School. However, keeping the SHSAT exam is just the fairest policy for all of New York City's children. And I am kind of appalled that the chancellor and other commissioners and council members, they, they want us to hear them, but they always run out and as soon as the, the politics and the, and the bright lights and the cameras are over, there's about 12 people left in this room. And I thank you two gentlemen for being here. And I am very upset, as you can tell, and I feel passionately about this issue. And I just feel it is, it is just wrong to approach this issue. And I would respectfully ask that you do not support Mayor D Bill de Blasio's and Council and Carranza's uh, proposed policies to get rid of this exam. It's not the way, gentlemen, to, to, to get to the bottom of the problem. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Council. Greg Waltman from G1 Quantum Clean Energy Company. I'm here to talk about the concrete solutions you were uh, alluding to. Um, First off, starting with um, Chair Barron's husband, Assemblyman Barron, echoing his comments, uh, you know, it's completely disingenuous to think that with the value entitlements and um, point of privilege that anything resource allocation wise is going to get distributed back into these schools to make the type of difference that you're looking for. And, and when I say it's disingenuous, I say it in a frame of context from a clean energy standpoint where I've been echoing clean energy solutions such as the wall, solar wall application, where you're putting solar panels on 10 feet of border wall on the southern side. If, if it's going to be there, it might as well create energy, which creates 242 trillion kilowatt hours of energy or $291 billion of energy per year at 12 cents per kilowatt hour allowing us to export energy to Latin America to reduce the barrier to entry for them to participate in the global economy and contextually, uh, contractually um, creating those types of contracts derived out of New York can be most beneficial in reshaping the type of budgetary considerations as we talk to the school or, or talk about school and, and, and revitalizing and, and injecting capital into these types of initiatives. So when I, when I see the Green New Deal and these initiatives talked about, it's almost like the city council is a house at the casino being imposed upon by value Omaha, Nebraska establishment constituents. And what happens is you're, you're having um, an issue where you're th trying to throw $14 billion Green New Deal at, at, at these issues, but in reality, someone's already came to you and said, well, the wall pays for itself and there's way more to be had in excess and revenue to be generated to address these issues. So, so it's, it's almost like saying, okay, we have, a, you know, say we didn't have pens and a, and a way to write, right? well, we have all this paper, like maybe we can create a, a utensil or, or something to, to write with. And then, oh, well, Mexico is going to create the pen, right? And then, well, I've already said that 
if you put solar panels on the border wall, you can, you can create 242 trillion kilowatt hours of energy and, and, and fraction, you know, whatever fraction you'd like to cut of that into. And, and it keeps going out. Oh, well, we have $14 billion to create that pen. But the solution's already been addressed. And now you're going to go $2.2 trillion on an infrastructure deal. And I've already outlined a way. Now, I didn't even get to quantum tracks yet, creating the first ever self-sustainable city in the world. But, but you're, Do you have testimony that you provided for I, us? I Menchaca two months ago. OK, if you could email it to our, uh, to our committee. To, because at this hearing we're having a little bit. But does, that, does it make sense? It's almost like you're you're a casino trying to clear right. these value bets, but someone's sitting here right in your face, articulating the solutions. Right. But the media, due to the hyper protectionism, the the value based hyper protectionism right. that's rampant in the media, it's not being presented to the public as an alternative so, solution. So, so we'll follow up. So when it. you talk about, right. excuse me, one more time. When you talk about money being allocated to these types of school and programs, right. and you say you have no resources to do it, it's just not only disingenuous, it's criminal. Right. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Uh, so just to kind of uh, to wrap up here, and I, I want to be very clear, I have never and I do not question the greatness of Stuyvesant Tech and the great, these great schools, never once. I will take always issue when other schools bec become unfairly denigrated, uh, quite frankly, no fault of their own, in my opinion. Um, and I'm proud to say, I am, I'm a proud Murrow High School alum, as I should be. I think you would agree, we should be proud. Um, I'm proud that Murrow High School helped produce the education chairman of the city council. I'm happy that Murrow High School produced uh, Academy Award winner Marissa Tomei and, and other talented folks. And I applaud Stuy and Brooklyn Tech and other schools for producing noble, pro I mean, th this is extraordinary achievements. The, the challenge before us is how do we create equity and opportunity across the board? And I appreciate some very concrete proposals that we've heard he here, here today. And I appreciate your passion on behalf of, of, our, of, our, of our children in New York City schools. Th thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Last panel, and the most patient, right? Uh, Donggi Zhang, Mindy Jia, uh, Yu Rao Deng, and uh, Dong, uh, Dong he, uh, Donghi Zhang. Yes. Okay, so uh, whenever folks are ready, just uh, state your name and you may begin your, your testimony. Thank you so much. Make sure your microphone is on. Okay, is that good? Uh, hi, my name is Dong Hui. Um, I'm a Queens resident. I'm a parent of two kids. One is going to Stevenson and uh, another one is going to Bronx Sands. I'm here also, I'm the president of New York City Residence Alliance. So I would like to say, as a parent of two kids from special high school, I fully embrace the idea that uh, there are too few blacks and Latinos. So I would like to see the population of blacks and Latinos going up, so to reach some kind of racial balance consistent with the city population. But, however, that, that cannot be on the price of lowering the standard. By lowering the standard, you are just going to destroy those eight special high schools. 
which is not acceptable. However, on the other hand, I cannot accept Ms. Chancellor's language saying there are too, more, too many Asian students. He was saying the Asians own all the special high school. That's not acceptable. That's racism language. He should, <laughs> he should apologize that, and he should be fair for that. Okay, first, let me get to his point that he repeatedly saying in the morning when I was here. He's saying there are no other universities taking one test as a criteria. I would like to say, it's okay, how about two tests? Okay, if one test is not fair, let's do two tests, like the SAT, whatever, or three tests. You know, would, be, would he be happy on, on that? As long as it's about uh, objective, I'm sure he won't accept that. So one test is just excuse. And the sec, I, I would like to say in the current, in the current system, in the current, current financial burden we can accept, the one test is most objective and the most practical way. And the second, about the test itself, he was, he was saying something, oh, we got rid of the test, so the students don't have to take the test, you don't have to prepare the test. I feel shamed for, for, the, for, the, for the boss of the nation's biggest public system. He doesn't encourage students to prepare the test and take the test. For me, as a father of two students, and uh, I was also a student for a long time myself. <laughs> so preparation for test, and the test itself, and more important, the reviewing after you take the test, that's the most crucial part of learning process. The test, preparation for test, and review test is a necessary step to study and to learn. So that should be encouraged, that shouldn't be abolished. What, how, how, can, how can school be called a school if without a test? How can an admission process be objective without an objective test score? And third, okay, his, his claim saying the Asians have privilege you know, to go to the prep school, that's a big lie. The prep school, it doesn't cost a thousand dollars. It's only like a few hundred dollars. And also, I know city has been offering some program, like dream program, like other program, you know, to offer students who don't have to, the ability to pay for the few hundred or few thousand, you know, to the test prep. So the preparation is, is not a problem. And actually, the Asian people don't have financial privilege. So 65% or something else, similar to that, of the Asian students or of the students in Stevenson High School, they receive the free lunch program, which means they are, they are, they are from low-income family. And actually, many parents who were here this morning, so they don't even speak English. They, they, do, land, they do laundry work. They do waiter, waitress work. You know, they do the nail, uh, they, do, they work in the nail industry, so their average family income is like $20,000 or $30,000 a year. And uh, I think that's almost equivalent to if you don't work as a single mother, if you don't, you also receive some government stipend so allowance. So that's about the same amount of money. But why the Asian kids can succeed is because the Asian family they value the education. So for the, for the, for the family who only got like $20,000 or $30,000 a year as their annual income, the whole family income, they don't go to vacation, they don't go to luxury restaurant, they save every penny, and they, they save every penny for their children to go to school. Also, actually, the money is more, not the most important. The most important thing is that 
you know, the parents spend the time and they put attention on their students' education. So as long as each family can do, do that, your children will succeed. It doesn't matter whether you know math or you know English. So it's a matter whether you, whether you care about your children's education. I think that's the only reason that the Asian families, <coughs> the current Asian families can succeed in their children's uh, education. I think every family, while regardless, you are you're black, Latino, you are white, you are Asian, you are from Korean. So as long as you pay attention to your children's education, you can succeed. So that's really something should be encouraged, but not punished. The current policy, the current proposal put by mayor and to the chancellor is just punishing the hardworking kids. It's just punishing the hardworking Asian family. Okay. We all know, and on the other hand, we all know the real reason that there are currently fewer black and Latino kids is that because in their district, it's not their family's fault, it's the government's fault. And, and as many speakers had already said, it takes five to 10 years to fix. You cannot be rushed, but we have to fix them. We have to encourage, we have to, find ways to encourage families to, to, uh, to take care of their children's education, to pay attention to their children's education. So, so as long as we start doing that, we will improve. And on the way that we are improving, we will find out that not only those eight, eight special high school is you know, a prominent school, all the schools will be shining, all the kids will be shining. I think that should be the eventual goal. That should be the eventual solution. I don't want to go, uh, go into deep uh, that. But uh, I do have some comments about the chancellor himself. He's, he was saying racism language. Mr. Zhang Liu have criticized uh, him on that. And also, you know, he and the mayor proposed the discovery program change which actually started this year. We all know the proposed discovery program that was implemented this year. It, it was unconstitutional because it intentionally excluded 80% of the Asian kids by, by doing whatever is called the school poverty index. As a result, you know, like my children's school and uh, Ram's uh, child's school, so we were all excluded. There were also many, many poor Asian kids. You know, their, their family were poor, but they were already excluded from the discovery program. That has been to be changed. But the result is, we all know the result, even by exclude, excluding 80% of the Asian kids, in this di year's discovery program enrollment still <coughs> There are 54% of the Asian kids got enrolled into the Discovery Program program. That again tells us how hard have the Asian families been working on to, to educate their, their kids and how badly our school system and the mayor had failed our black and Latino kids. I agree, every kid was talented. Every, every kid should be deserved should be deserve a chance, but a chance, you should start from the real thing. You should try to improve their state test score first, and then talk about the special size high school. And uh, I have to ask, so, so but the, the chancellor saying, oh, we have tried every tool, so I have to eliminate the test. I have to ask him, what about if, say, the state and the the state senator and the state assembly gave you the authority, let you do the experiment, which of course I don't agree. Our children are not rice, are not white mouth. We should, our children shouldn't, cannot be afforded to, to do such an experiment. But say, let's do the assumption. If their proposal is implemented, do the 7% code, I, I kind of see that at the end, you know, there are some kind of uh, 
home reallocation, what about if after they implement the program, still 70 or 60 or 80 percent of Asian kids go to the special high school? What is he going to do on that time? Are they really hating our Asians? So I think he is racist. He shouldn't be. He shouldn't be the boss of the nation's largest public system. He doesn't deserve that. He messed with San Francisco first. People didn't like that, didn't like him. And then he went to Texas. He messed up with Texas. And why, why our mayor have to hire him as, a, as our chancellor? And also, I knew he was once prosecute, uh, he, he, he was not prosecuted, but he got involved, he, he was involved with a sexual harassment lawsuit, and at the end, I know it, it was kind of settled, but shall we consider that when, when, when you hire him as a school chancellor, shouldn't be our school chancellor be a role model of morality as well? So I would like to say he is really he shouldn't be, he shouldn't be doing that, that job. In the end, I would, I would like us to say, I think in, in some occasions, I know, you know, from statistics reason, we have to ask what is your race or country origin? Where are you from? You're from Korea or you're from Colombia? You are Asian or you are black? You are Latino, you are in, uh, native Indian. But I feel that at some, many occasions, we don't even need to ask quest that question. For example, in the school admission process, why the kids is black or Latino? Why does that, that, that matter? They are all American kids, and they all have American dream. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, and uh, the last the last two speakers uh, appreciate you, your being here. Hi, my name is Zhang Wen Zhao. Um, I'm a mother of, uh, um, you know, I have one child, so he's in sixth grade. Uh, so first of all, I have, um, you know, I have a comment about today's hearing title. The title is actually called um, Segregation in New York City Schools, and I, um, I actually have a uh, you know, problem with this uh, title because segregation by definition, it is the action or the state that sets someone or something apart from other people and other things. And then you know, by saying there is a se segregation in New York City, it is actually a misnomer. And then by using this misnomer, it actually stirs and divides the city and the communities. So I actually think it's irresponsible for um, officials, you know, elected by New York City uh, residents to use this misnomer. So that's first. So, and also um, specialized high school um, at New York City actually are open to every single kid at New York City that are willing to put in the efforts to prepare for the rigorous study at the specialized high schools. So SHS 80 is actually an objective way to measure the students' effort and readiness for specialized high schools. It is irresponsible to eliminate the SHSAT without coming up with an objective and agree a point alternative to measure the incoming students' readiness. From the middle uh, 1970s to uh, 1990s, black and Hispanic kids make up uh, close to half or more of the Brooklyn Tech uh, student body. And the percentage has dropped since then, actually due to, not due to the SHSAT, is actually due to the reduction and dearth of the gifted and honors program in the black and Hispanic neighborhoods. Even back in the 1970s and um, 1970s and 90s, the kids that make into the specialized high school that 50 percentile of the Brooklyn Tech, they take they took the SHSAT exam. So SHSAT exam is not the problem. So uh, finally, I actually want to propose to uh, really solve this problem. It is that stop focusing on SHSAT and the specialized high schools. Second, bring back the K-8 gifted and honor programs in black and Hispanic pro uh, neighborhoods to focus on the pipeline. Third, 
study SHSAT and study SH uh, specialized high school and replicate their success story to all schools. And then fourth, open gifted and honors program in all high schools to create more seats for all the students in your city. Thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you for everyone for to still being here. My name is Yuran Deng, um, English name Annie, and I'm a proud alumna of Stuyvesant High School. Um, I just wanted to be pretty short and fill in some of the holes that were pretty left by the numerous testimonies we've had today. So, fact. Um, actually, the Department of Education itself sponsored a study on the SHSAT and found that it is a statistically strong predictor of high school GPA, region scores, and AP scores. They've actually had the study since 2013, but hit it, um, because obviously the mayor wanted to do, do away with the test. Second, the New York as a state spends the most per capita on its students than any other state or territory in the nation, actually averaging around $24,000, and the per capita fund at Stuyvesant, only 17 k So we're not actually better funded. Now, the chancellor wants to say that he's not trying to hurt the academic proudness of these schools, but he already has. In the discovery program that has, ha, was implemented this year, at Stuyvesant, the lowest score for the students that were admitted in the first round was 560. For the discovery program for Stuyvesant, the range was from 471 to 485, not even 500. So that's a whole 80 points lower than the lowest point um, that was admitted in the original class. And what happened to the people who scored in the range between that? You know, what happened to them? They just got lost. They just got forgotten. No, they got discriminated against. Now, we're here to speak specifically on 196-A because whether or not you like the test, the proposal really doesn't work. Why doesn't top 7% from every school work? Well, from the data we found out today in the Massgate article, we found out there are schools in the city where only 2% of the students pass the state math exam, while 93.5% of the same students pass their math classes. So grades are highly inflated, and these schools are not performing. So take that school, only 2% pass their math exam. If you take top 7%, that means there are five additional percent of the student at that school will be entering a specialized high school or have the option to without even passing the state math test. So that's not really the type of student you probably want to pass into these schools which are geared towards science and math studies. What does the test test? English and math, very simple, it's reading. And while some of the math topics are not yet covered in the eighth grade curriculum, you know, that is actually the test that's put on the students. Do you have the extra, what it takes to study on your own and master those areas which you eventually will need to learn anyway in high school? So for the parents who actually invest in their kids to learn the topics that are covered on the SHSAT is not just to master a test. They're learning ratios. They're learning fractions. They're learning frequency tables. That is actually what I saw on the sample test that is offered in the NYC guide, which is given to students on the specialized high schools. Now, what would happen if we offered the plan um, that was proposed? Actually, the people actually made models to say what would happen. In this top 7%, it will include actually 500 students with a one or a two on their math state test, and 400 with only one or a two on ELA. So that's maybe like 900 students who are underperforming and maybe needing remedial work at Stuyvesant or the other seven schools that are tested into. Now, you have to realize that students don't study in a vacuum. It takes time away from the classroom when you have um, when you have questions that are not at the standard level expected of the whole class, right? So and when you introduce students who are unprepared to these schools, you are drawing from the resources which are already less than the average um, for, the, for the city. And one of the last things I want to mention is I want to draw two comparisons. One is um, with 
the City College in New York. It was once a beloved college and highly esteemed called the Harvard of the Poor. And then we had open missions, but which increased diversity, but did not give any credit to merit. And then what happened? Well, now when I tell somebody that I went to Stuyvesant and I went to City College, people ask me what happened, which makes me feel like, you know, it's not <laughs> a good choice just because of the prestige, but also because of just how much credit the school has lost because of its reputation. And the same you can expect for the specialized high schools. These schools don't exist in a vacuum either. The colleges are watching. And when they find out that you have all these students who are not even passing their state exams, and those exams to serious educators are seriously subpar, you are not gonna see the same rate of mission. And we already have mentioned a lot of students and families fleeing New York City, actually. And we see that a lot in the communities of Bayside, for example, where the non-specialized high schools have basically been ruined. And also, I see it in my own family, because two of my uncles decided not to come to New York City after all, and decided to go to Orlando, where they believe their students will be having a better education. So please, look at all aspects of these proposals and look at the details in the plan. The proposed plan actually leaves a huge number of seats to just a random lottery. That includes all the students from private schools and Catholic schools, parochial schools, other schools, all the students who do not have the factors that go into their formula go into a random lottery. It doesn't really make any sense, and please, if you want to consider getting rid of the test, then at least find a better alternative first. So, I, 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 strong, I, strong, I, I appreciate, uh, you know, a, a lot of uh, the passion behind the testimony, and just to note, for you know, I'm a proud product of CUNY as well. Uh, there was a time when CUNY used to be free, but they stopped making it free once they began to admitting uh, to admit all students, particularly students uh, students of color. So, quite frankly, I would argue that it was economic barriers that has led to issues within our city university not making sure that the process was more fair for people. Um, and to note, I want to note for the record that I came out against what the mayor proposed last year because it was not the product of an inclusive process. The council today actually did not put forward a fix. It, it's putting forward a process to engage all communities, all stakeholders. And the, that's what the speaker actually noted in his opening remarks, that we're, we are putting forward a, we want an inclusive process to, to, to solve some of the most serious challenges our school system is, is, is facing. And uh, we, we, we have to figure this out, but we don't have all the answers here today. Um, but we need everyone here to be at the table. And certainly I have, I have certainly told, I've told the chancellor to be mindful of his language, but, but I, I respectfully ask the public to be also mindful of certain language as well, because I, I, I share this as both a student, I am a proud product from pre-K all the way to grad school of uh, public schools. I went to public schools all across my life. I'm proud of that. I have become a better person, a better public servant, as a result of my diverse settings in many of, 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 of our systems. Um, so increasing diversity does not weaken institutions. However, the issue before us is how do we make sure that every community, every person, every child has access to opportunities? And, and I, again, agree with you that a, a significant number of the students that are attending specialized schools don't come from economic privileged backgrounds, 100% accurate. Uh, one of the issues that I, I raised was that some of the schools themselves, the schools in partnerships with their partnerships, they have access to sometimes more resources than other schools. And that was said to me by Stuy alumni. I am good friends with alumni from Stuy who are great uh, not just students, but now they're educators and they're doing great in, in their fields, and that's wonderful. Um, and But we never put each other down. <laughs> we never said, you know, I don't say to Stuyvesant, you're better than me or this. I think all of us are great in, in, in different respects. And 
maybe some students don't want to be noble science, which is great too. Uh, some students want, uh, one of the students I worked with in New Utrecht High School, I used to teach in New Utrecht, his name is Anthony Ramos. If you don't know who that is, he was one of the big stars in Hamilton. And he was a baseball player at New Utrecht, joined the theater program, thankfully we had one, and now Anthony is, is an is a international star. And so the goal is to figure out how to work together with all of our communities to make sure that, that uh, all of our schools, that all of our children have access to great programs and opportunities for a very good future. And again, I thank all of you for, for, for your advocacy and, and for being here tonight. And uh, do, you have to, we have, do you have to quote? Yeah, I just wanted to mention one thing. Go ahead, please. Uh, while it is so, we appreciate this opportunity so much to be actually part of the process, but we also have to note that the chancellor basically did say earlier today that even if he had introduced process, it wouldn't have changed his proposal. So well, it was really a donor. Well, um, I, and as I noted before, if you heard my, my exchange, their own diversity advisory group was not even consulted about their proposal. So that there are a lot of folks left out and you cannot have a conversation about exclusion while excluding people. So that's problematic more ways than one. So again, with that, I do wanna thank everyone for their patience and for their endurance for the very long day. There's more work to do but we, we should do it in an inclusive and fair and just way. With that, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you. And I just want to, and I know the hearing is adjourned. I want to publicly thank the outstanding city council staff uh, and my staff as well. Thank you, guys. There have been a number of hearings in recent days, long, very serious hearings. We have the best staff everywhere. I truly appreciate everyone's time and work on this effort.